Chapter Thirty One, Part One, of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty One. Mr. Pinch is discharged of a duty which he never owed to anybody, and Mr. Pecksniff discharges a duty which he owes to society. Part One. The closing words of the last chapter lead naturally to the commencement of this, its successor, for it has to do with the church. With the church, so often mentioned heretofore, in which Tom Pinch played the organ for nothing. One sultry afternoon, about a week after Miss Charity's departure for London, Mr. Pecksniff, being out walking by himself, took it into his head to stray into the churchyard. As he was lingering among the tombstones, endeavouring to extract an available sentiment or two from the epitaphs, for he never lost an opportunity of making up a few moral crackers to be let off as occasion served, Tom Pinch began to practice. Tom could run down to the church and do so whenever he had time to spare, for it was a simple little organ, provided with wind by the action of the musician's feet, and he was independent even of a bellows-blower. Though if Tom had wanted one at any time, there was not a man or boy in all the village in the way to the turnpike, Tolman included, but would have blown away for him till he was black in the face. Mr. Pecksniff had no objection to music, not the least— he was tolerant of everything. He often said so. He considered it a vagabond kind of trifling, in general, just suited to Tom's capacity. But in regard to Tom's performance upon this same organ, he was remarkably lenient, singularly amiable. For when Tom played it on Sundays, Mr. Pecksniff, in his unbounded sympathy, felt as if he played it himself, and were a benefactor to the congregation. So whenever it was impossible to devise any other means of taking the value of Tom's wages out of him, Mr. Pecksniff gave him leave to cultivate this instrument, for which mark of his consideration Tom was very grateful. The afternoon was remarkably warm, and Mr. Pecksniff had been strolling a long way. He had not what may be called a fine ear for music, but he knew when it had a tranquilizing influence on his soul, and that was the case now for it sounded to him like a melodious snore. He approached the church, and looking through the diamond lattice of a window near the porch, saw Tom, with the curtains in the loft drawn back, playing away with great expression and tenderness. The church had an inviting air of coolness. The old oak roof supported by cross-beams, the hoary walls, the marble tablets, and the cracked stone pavement were refreshing to look at. There were leaves of ivy tapping gently at the opposite windows, and the sun poured in through only one, leaving the body of the church in tempting shade. But the most tempting spot of all was one red-curtained and soft-cushioned pew, wherein the official dignitaries of the place, of whom Mr. Pecksniff was the head and chief, enshrined themselves on Sundays. Mr. Pecksniff's seat was in the corner, a remarkably comfortable corner, where his very large prayer-book was at that minute making the most of its quarto self upon the desk. He determined to go in and rest. He entered very softly, in part because it was a church, in part because his tread was always soft, in part because Tom played a solemn tune, in part because he thought he would surprise him when he stopped. Unbolting the door of the high pew of state, he glided in and shut it after him. Then, sitting in his usual place and stretching out his legs upon the hassocks, he composed himself to listen to the music. It is an unaccountable circumstance that he should have felt drowsy there, where the force of association might surely have been enough to keep him wide awake. But he did. He had not been in the snug little corner five minutes before he began to nod. He had not recovered himself one minute before he began to nod again. In the very act of opening his eyes indolently, he nodded again. In the very act of shutting them, he nodded again. So he fell out of one nod into another, until at last he ceased to nod at all, and was as fast as the church itself. He had a consciousness of the organ long after he fell asleep, though as to its being an organ he had no more idea of that than he had of its being a bull. 
After a while he began to have at intervals the same dreamy impressions of voices, and awakening to an indolent curiosity upon the subject, opened his eyes. He was so indolent that after glancing at the hassocks and the pew, he was already halfway off to sleep again when it occurred to him that there really were voices in the church, low voices, talking earnestly hard by while the echoes seemed to mutter responses. He roused himself and listened. Before he had listened half a dozen seconds, he became as broad awake as ever he had been in all his life. With eyes and ears and mouth wide open, he moved himself a very little with the utmost caution, and gathering the curtain in his hand, peeped out. Tom Pinch and Mary. Of course. He had recognized their voices and already knew the topic they discussed. Looking like the small end of a guillotined man, with his chin on a level with the top of the pew, so that he might duck down immediately in case of either of them turning round, he listened. Listened with such concentrated eagerness that his very hair and shirt-collar stood bristling up to help him. "'No!' cried Tom. "'No letters have ever reached me except that one from New York. But don't be uneasy on that account.' "'for it's very likely they have gone away to some far-off place "'where the posts are neither regular nor frequent. "'He said in that very letter that it might be so, "'even in that city to which they thought of travelling. "'Eden, you know.' "'It is a great weight upon my mind,' said Mary. "'Oh, but you mustn't let it be,' said Tom. "'There's a true saying that nothing travels so fast as ill news, "'and if the slightest harm had happened to Martin, "'you may be sure you would have heard of it long ago.' "'I have often wished to say this to you,' Tom continued, with an embarrassment that became him very well. "'But you have never given me an opportunity.' "'I have sometimes been almost afraid,' said Mary, "'that you might suppose I hesitated to confide in you, Mr. Pinch.' "'No,' Tom stammered. "'I—I I am not aware that I ever supposed that. "'I am sure that if I have, I have checked the thought directly as an injustice to you.' "'I feel the delicacy of your situation in having to confide in me at all,' said Tom. "'But I would risk my life to save you from one day's uneasiness. "'Indeed I would.' "'Poor Tom. "'I have dreaded sometimes,' Tom continued, "'that I might have displeased you by—by by having the boldness to try and anticipate your wishes now and then. "'At other times I have fancied that your kindness prompted you to keep aloof from me.' "'Indeed?' "'It was very foolish, very presumptuous, and ridiculous to think so,' Tom pursued. "'But I feared you might suppose it possible that I—I I should admire you too much for my own peace, "'and so denied yourself the slight assistance you would otherwise have accepted from me.' "'If such an idea has ever presented itself to you,' faltered Tom, "'pray dismiss it. I am easily made happy, and I shall live contented here long after you and Martin have forgotten me.' I am a poor, shy, awkward creature, not at all a man of the world, and you should think no more of me, bless you, than if I were an old friar. If friars bear such hearts as thine, Tom, let friars multiply, though they have no such rule in all their stern arithmetic. Dear Mr. Pinch, said Mary, giving him her hand, I cannot tell you how your kindness moves me. I have never wronged you by the lightest doubt, and have never for an instant ceased to feel that you were all— much more than all that Martin found you. Without the silent care and friendship I have experienced from you, my life here would have been unhappy. But you have been a good angel to me, filling me with gratitude of heart, hope, and courage. I am as little like an angel, I am afraid, replied Tom, shaking his head, as any stone cherubim among the gravestones. And I don't think there are many real angels of that pattern. But I should like to know, if you will tell me, "'Why you have been so very silent about Martin?' "'Because I have been afraid,' said Mary, "'of injuring you.' "'Of injuring me?' cried Tom. "'Of doing you an injury with your employer.' "'The gentleman in question dived. "'With Pecksniff?' rejoined Tom, with cheerful confidence. "'Oh, dear, he'd never think of us. "'He's the best of men. "'The more at ease you were, the happier he would be. "'Oh, dear, you needn't be afraid of Pecksniff. "'He is not a spy.' Many a man in Mr. Pecksniff's place, if he could have dived through the floor of the Pew of State and come out at Calcutta, or any inhabited region on the other side of the earth, would have done it instantly. Mr. Pecksniff sat down upon a hassock, and, listening more attentively than ever, smiled. Mary seemed to have expressed some dissent in the meanwhile, 
for Tom went on to say, with honest energy, "'Well, I don't know how it is, but it always happens, whenever I express myself in this way to anybody almost, that I find they won't do justice to Pecksniff. It is one of the most extraordinary circumstances that ever came within my knowledge, but it is so. There's John Westlock, who used to be a pupil here, one of the best-hearted young men in the world, in all other matters. I really believe John would have Pecksniff flogged at the cart's tail if he could.' And John is not a solitary case, for every pupil we have had in my time has gone away with the same inveterate hatred of him. There was Mark Tapley, too, quite in another station of life, said Tom. The mockery he used to make of Peck Sniff when he was at the Dragon was shocking. Martin, too. Martin was worse than any of them. But I forgot. He prepared you to dislike Peck Sniff, of course. So you came with a prejudice, you know, Miss Graham, and are not a fair witness." Tom triumphed very much in this discovery, and rubbed his hands with great satisfaction. "'Mr. Pinch,' said Mary, "'you mistake him.' "'No, no,' cried Tom, "'you mistake him. But,' he added, with a rapid change in his tone, "'what is the matter? Miss Graham, what is the matter?' Mr. Pecksniff brought up to the top of the pew by slow degrees his hair, his forehead, his eyebrow, his eye. She was sitting on a bench beside the door, with her hands before her face, and Tom was bending over her. "'What is the matter?' cried Tom. "'Have I said anything to hurt you? Has any one said anything to hurt you? Don't cry, pray, tell me what it is. I cannot bear to see you so distressed. Mercy on us! I never was so surprised and grieved in all my life.' Mr. Pecksniff kept his eye in the same place. He could have moved it now for nothing short of a gimlet or a red-hot wire." "'I wouldn't have told you, Mr. Pinch,' said Mary, "'if I could have helped it. "'But your delusion is so absorbing, "'and it is so necessary that we should be upon our guard, "'that you should not be compromised, "'and to that end that you should know by whom I am beset, "'that no alternative is left me. "'I came here purposely to tell you, "'but I think I should have wanted courage "'if you had not chanced to lead me so directly "'to the object of my coming.' "'Tom gazed at her steadfastly and seemed to say, "'What else?' "'but he said not a word. "'That person whom you think the best of men,' said Mary, "'looking up and speaking with a quivering lip and flashing eye. "'Lord, bless me!' muttered Tom, staggering back. "'Wait a moment. "'That person whom I think the best of men? "'You mean Pecksniff, of course. "'Yes, I see you mean Pecksniff. "'Good gracious me, don't speak without authority. "'What has he done? "'If he is not the best of men, what is he?' the worst, the falsest, craftiest, meanest, cruelest, most sordid, most shameless, said the trembling girl, trembling with her indignation. Tom sat down on a seat and clasped his hands. What is he? said Mary, who, receiving me in his house as his guest, his unwilling guest, knowing my history and how defenceless and alone I am, presumes before his daughters to affront me so, that if I had a brother but a child who saw it, he would instinctively have helped me. "'He is a scoundrel!' exclaimed Tom. "'Whoever he may be, he is a scoundrel!' Mr. Pecksniff dived again. "'What is he?' said Mary, "'who, when my only friend, a dear and kind one, too, "'was in full health of mind, humbled himself before him, "'but was spurned away, for he knew him then like a dog. "'Who, in his forgiving spirit, now that that friend is sunk into a failing state, "'can crawl about him again and use the influence he basely gains "'for every base and wicked purpose, and not for one, not one, that's true or good. "'I say he is a scoundrel,' answered Tom." "'But what is he? Oh, Mr. Pinch, what is he? "'Who, thinking he could compass these designs the better if I were his wife, "'assails me with the coward's argument that if I marry him, "'Martin, on whom I have brought so much misfortune, "'shall be restored to something of his former hopes, "'and if I do not, shall be plunged in deeper ruin. "'What is he who makes my very constancy to one I love with all my heart "'a torture to myself and wrong to him?' "'who makes me do what I will, the instrument to hurt a head I would heap blessings on. "'What is he, who, winding all these cruel snares about me, "'explains their purpose to me with a smooth tongue and a smiling face "'in the broad light of day, dragging me on the while in his embrace, "'and holding to his lips a hand,' pursued the agitated girl, extending it, "'which I would have struck off, if with it I could lose the shame and degradation of his touch?' 
"'I say!' cried Tom, in great excitement. "'He is a scoundrel and a villain. I don't care who he is. I say he is a double-dyed and most intolerable villain.' Covering her face with her hands again, as if the passion which had sustained her through these disclosures lost itself in an overwhelming sense of shame and grief, she abandoned herself to tears. Any sight of distress was sure to move the tenderness of Tom, but this especially. Tears and sobs from her were arrows in his heart. He tried to comfort her, sat down beside her, expended all his store of homely eloquence, and spoke in words of praise and hope of Martin. I, though he loved her from his soul with such a self-denying love as woman seldom wins, he spoke from first to last of Martin. Not the wealth of the rich Indies would have tempted Tom to shirk one mention of her lover's name. When she was more composed, she impressed upon Tom that this man she had described was Pecksniff in his real colours, and word by word and phrase by phrase, as well as she remembered it, related what had passed between them in the wood which was no doubt a source of high gratification to that gentleman himself, who, in his desire to see, and his dread of being seen, was constantly diving down into the state pew, and coming up again like the intelligent householder in Punch's show, who avoids being knocked on the head with a cudgel. When she had concluded her account, and had besought Tom to be very distant and unconscious in his manner towards her after this explanation, and had thanked him very much, they parted on the alarm of footsteps in the burial-ground, and Tom was left alone in the church again. And now the full agitation and misery of the disclosure came rushing upon Tom indeed. The star of his whole life from boyhood had become, in a moment, putrid vapour. It was not that Pecksniff, Tom's Pecksniff, had ceased to exist, but that he never had existed. In his death Tom would have had the comfort of remembering what he used to be, but in this discovery he had the anguish of recollecting what he never was. For as Tom's blindness in this matter had been total and not partial, so was his restored sight. His Pecksniff could never have worked the wickedness of which he had just now heard, but any other Pecksniff could, and the Pecksniff who could do that could do anything, and no doubt had been doing anything and everything except the right thing all through his career. From the lofty height on which poor Tom had placed his idol, it was tumbled down headlong, and not all the king's horses nor all the king's men could have set Mr. Pecksniff up again. Legions of titans couldn't have got him out of the mud and serve him right. But it was not he who suffered. It was Tom. His compass was broken, his chart destroyed, his chronometer had stopped, his masts were gone by the board, his anchor was adrift, ten thousand leagues away. Mr. Pecksniff watched him with a lively interest, for he divined the purpose of Tom's ruminations, and was curious to see how he conducted himself. For some time Tom wandered up and down the aisle like a man demented, stopping occasionally to lean against a pew and think it over. Then he stood staring at a blank old monument, bordered tastefully with skulls and crossbones, as if it were the finest work of art he had ever seen, although at other times he held it in unspeakable contempt. Then he sat down, then walked to and fro again, then went wandering up into the organ-loft and touched the keys. But their minstrelsy was changed, their music gone, and sounding one long melancholy chord, Tom drooped his head upon his hands and gave it up as hopeless. "'I wouldn't have cared,' said Tom Pinch, rising from his stool and looking down into the church as if he had been the clergyman. "'I wouldn't have cared for anything he might have done to me, for I have tried his patience often and have lived upon his sufferance and have never been the help to him that others could have been. "'I wouldn't have minded, Pecksniff,' Tom continued, little thinking who heard him, "'if you had done me any wrong. I could have found plenty of excuses for that, and though you might have hurt me, could have still gone on respecting you.' "'But why did you ever fall so low as this in my esteem? "'Oh, Pecksniff, Pecksniff, there is nothing I would not have given "'to have had you deserve my old opinion of you. Nothing.' "'Mr. Pecksniff sat upon the hassock, pulling up his shirt-collar, "'while Tom, touched to the quick, delivered this apostrophe. "'After a pause he heard Tom coming down the stairs, "'jingling the church keys, and bringing his eye to the top of the pew again, "'saw him go slowly out and lock the door.' Mr. Pecksniff durst not issue from his place of concealment. 
for through the windows of the church he saw Tom passing on among the graves, and sometimes stopping at a stone, and leaning there as if he were a mourner who had lost a friend. Even when he had left the churchyard, Mr. Pecksniff still remained shut up, not being at all secure, but that in his restless state of mind Tom might come wandering back. At length he issued forth, and walked with a pleasant countenance into the vestry, where he knew there was a window near the ground by which he could release himself by merely stepping out. He was in a curious frame of mind, Mr. Pecksniff, being in no hurry to go, but rather inclining to a dilatory trifling with the time which prompted him to open the vestry cupboard and look at himself in the parson's little glass that hung within the door. Seeing that his hair was rumpled, he took the liberty of borrowing the canonical brush and arranging it. He also took the liberty of opening another cupboard, but he shut it up again quickly, being rather startled by the sight of a black and a white surplus dangling against the wall, which had very much the appearance of two curates who had committed suicide by hanging themselves. Remembering that he had seen in the first cupboard a port wine bottle and some biscuits, he peeped into it again, and helped himself with much deliberation, cogitating all the time, though, in a very deep and weighty manner, as if his thoughts were otherwise employed. He soon made up his mind, if it had ever been in doubt, and putting back the bottle and biscuits, opened the casement. He got out into the churchyard without any difficulty, shut the window after him, and walked straight home. "'Is Mr. Pinch indoors?' asked Mr. Pecksniff of his serving-maid. "'Just come in, sir.' "'Just come in, eh?' repeated Mr. Pecksniff cheerfully. "'And gone upstairs, I suppose?' "'Yes, sir, gone upstairs. Shall I call him, sir?' "'No,' said Mr. Pecksniff. "'No, you needn't call him, Jane. Thank you, Jane. How are your relations, Jane?' "'Pretty well. I thank you, sir.' "'I am glad to hear it. Let them know I asked about them, Jane. Is Mr. Chuzzlewit in the way, Jane?' "'Yes, sir. He's in the parlour reading.' "'He's in the parlour reading, is he, Jane?' said Mr. Pecksniff. "'Very well. Then I think I'll go and see him, Jane.' Never had Mr. Pecksniff been beheld in a more pleasant humour. End of chapter 31, part 1「31, Part 2 of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter 31, Part 2 but when he walked into the parlour where the old man was engaged, as Jane had said, with pen and ink and paper on a table close at hand, for Mr. Pecksniff was always very particular to have him well supplied with writing materials, he became less cheerful. He was not angry, he was not vindictive, he was not cross, he was not moody, but he was grieved. He was sorely grieved. As he sat down by the old man's side, two tears— not tears like those with which recording angels blot their entries out, but drops so precious that they use them for their ink, stole down his meritorious cheeks. "'What is the matter?' asked old Martin. "'Pecksniff, what ails you, man?' "'I am sorry to interrupt you, my dear sir, and I am still more sorry for the cause. My good, my worthy friend, I am deceived.' "'You are deceived?' "'Ah!' Uh, cried Mr. Pecksniff in an agony, deceived in the tenderest point, cruelly deceived in that quarter, sir, in which I placed the most unbounded confidence, deceived, Mr. Chuzzlewit, by Thomas Pinch. Oh, bad, 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 said Martin, laying down his book. Very bad. I hope not. Are you certain? Certain, my good sir. My eyes and ears are witnesses. I wouldn't have believed it otherwise. I wouldn't have believed it, Mr. Chuzzlewit, if a fiery serpent had proclaimed it from the top of Salisbury Cathedral. I would have said, cried Mr. Pecksniff, that the serpent lied. Such was my faith in Thomas Pinch, that I would have cast the falsehood back into the serpent's teeth, and would have taken Thomas to my heart. But I am not a serpent, sir, myself, I grieve to say, and no excuse or hope is left me. Martin was greatly disturbed to see him so much agitated, and to hear such unexpected news. 
He begged him to compose himself, and asked upon what subject Mr. Pinch's treachery had been developed. "'That is almost the worst of all, sir,' Mr. Pecksniff answered, "'on a subject nearly concerning you. "'Oh, is it not enough?' said Mr. Pecksniff, looking upward. "'But these blows must fall on me, but must they also hit my friends?' "'You alarm me,' cried the old man, changing colour. "'I am not so strong as I was. You terrify me, Pecksniff.' "'Cheer up, my noble sir,' said Mr. Pecksniff, taking courage. "'And we will do what is required of us. "'You shall know all, sir, and shall be righted. "'But first, excuse me, sir, excuse me. "'I have a duty to discharge which I owe to society.' "'He rang the bell, and Jane appeared. "'Send Mr. Pinch here, if you please, Jane.' "'Tom came, constrained and altered in his manner, "'downcast and dejected, visibly confused, "'not liking to look Pecksniff in the face.' The honest man bestowed a glance on Mr. Chuzzlewit, as who should say, "'You see?' and addressed himself to Tom in these terms. "'Mr. Pinch, I have left the vestry window unfastened. Will you do me the favour to go and secure it? Then bring the keys of the sacred edifice to me.' "'The vestry window, sir?' cried Tom. "'You understand me, Mr. Pinch, I think,' returned his patron. "'Yes, Mr. Pinch, the vestry window. "'I grieve to say that sleeping in the church after a fatiguing ramble, "'I overheard just now some fragments,' he emphasized that word, "'of a dialogue between two parties, "'and one of them locking the church when he went out, "'I was obliged to leave it myself by the vestry window. "'Do me the favour to secure that vestry window, Mr. Pinch, "'and then come back to me.' "'No physiognomist that ever dwelt on earth "'could have construed Tom's face when he heard these words.' Wonder was in it, and a mild look of reproach, but certainly no fear or guilt, although a host of strong emotions struggled to display themselves. He bowed, and without saying one word, good or bad, withdrew. "'Pecksniff!' cried Martin, in a tremble. "'What does all this mean? You are not going to do anything in haste you may regret?' "'No, my good sir,' said Mr. Pecksniff firmly. "'No. But I have a duty to discharge which I owe to society, and it shall be discharged, my friend, at any cost. Oh, late remembered, much forgotten, mouthing, braggart duty, always owed and seldom paid in any other coin than punishment and wrath, when will mankind begin to know thee? When will men acknowledge thee in thy neglected cradle and thy stunted youth, and not begin their recognition in thy sinful manhood and thy desolate old age? O oh, ermined judge, whose duty to society is now to doom the ragged criminal to punishment and death, hadst thou never, man, a duty to discharge in barring up the hundred open gates that wooed him to the felon's dock, and throwing but ajar the portals to a decent life? O oh, prelate, prelate, whose duty to society it is, to mourn in melancholy phrase the sad degeneracy of these bad times in which thy lot of honours has been cast. Did nothing go before thy elevation to the lofty seat, from which thou dealest out thy homilies to other terriers for dead men's shoes, whose duty to society has not begun? O oh, magistrate, so rare a country gentleman and brave a squire, had you no duty to society before the ricks were blazing and the mob were mad? Or did it spring up, armed and booted from the earth, a corps of yeomanry full grown? Mr. Pecksniff's duty to society could not be paid till Tom came back. The interval which preceded the return of that young man he occupied in a close conference with his friend, so that when Tom did arrive he found the two quite ready to receive him. Mary was in her own room above, whither Mr. Pecksniff, always considerate, had besought old Martin to entreat her to remain some half-hour longer, that her feelings might be spared." When Tom came back, he found old Martin sitting by the window, and Mr. Pecksniff in an imposing attitude at the table. On one side of him was his pocket-handkerchief, and on the other a little heap, a very little heap, of gold and silver and odd pence. Tom saw at a glance that it was his own salary for the current quarter. "'Have you fastened the vestry window, Mr. Pinch?' said Pecksniff. "'Yes, sir.' "'Thank you. Put down the keys, if you please, Mr. Pinch.' Tom placed them on the table. He held the bunch by the key of the organ loft, though it was one of the smallest, and looked hard at it as he laid it down. It had been an old, old friend of Tom's, a kind companion to him many and many a day. "'Mr. Pinch,' said Pecksniff, shaking his head. "'Oh, Mr. Pinch, I wonder you can look me in the face.' 
Tom did it, though, and notwithstanding that he has been described as stooping generally, he stood as upright then as man could stand. "'Mr. Pinch,' said Pecksniff, taking up his handkerchief, as if he felt that he should want it soon, "'I will not dwell upon the past. I will spare you, and I will spare myself that pain, at least.' Tom's was not a very bright eye, but it was a very expressive one when he looked at Mr. Pecksniff and said, "'Thank you, sir. I am very glad you will not refer to the past.' "'The present is enough,' said Mr. Pecksniff, dropping a penny. "'And the sooner that is passed, the better, Mr. Pinch. "'I will not dismiss you without a word of explanation. "'Even such a course would be quite justifiable under the circumstances, "'but it might wear an appearance of hurry, and I will not do it. "'For I am,' said Mr. Pecksniff, knocking down another penny, "'perfectly self-possessed. "'Therefore I will say to you what I have already said to Mr. Chuzzlewit.' Tom glanced at the old gentleman, who nodded now and then as approving of Mr. Pecksniff's sentences and sentiments, but interposed between them in no other way. "'From fragments of a conversation which I overheard in the church just now, Mr. Pinch,' said Pecksniff, "'between yourself and Miss Graham, I say fragments because I was slumbering at a considerable distance from you when I was roused by your voices, and from what I saw I ascertained—I would have given a great deal not to have ascertained, Mr. Pinch— that you, forgetful of all ties of duty and of honour, sir, regardless of the sacred laws of hospitality to which you were pledged as an inmate of this house, have presumed to address Miss Graham with unreturned professions of attachment and proposals of love. Tom looked at him steadily. "'Do you deny it, sir?' asked Mr. Pecksniff, dropping one pound, two, and fourpence, and making a great business of picking it up again. "'No, sir,' replied Tom, "'I do not.' "'You do not,' said Mr. Pecksniff, glancing at the old gentleman. "'Oblige me by counting this money, Mr. Pinch, and putting your name to this receipt. "'You do not?' "'No, Tom did not. He scorned to deny it. "'He saw that Mr. Pecksniff, having overheard his own disgrace, "'cared not a jot for sinking lower yet in his contempt. "'He saw that he had devised this fiction as the readiest means of getting rid of him at once, "'but that it must end in that anyway.' He saw that Mr. Pecksniff reckoned on his not denying it, because his doing so and explaining would incense the old man more than ever against Martin and against Mary, while Pecksniff himself would only have been mistaken in his fragments. Deny it? No. You find the amount correct, do you, Mr. Pinch? said Pecksniff. Quite correct, sir, answered Tom. A person is waiting in the kitchen, said Mr. Pecksniff, to carry your luggage wherever you please. We part, Mr. Pinch, at once, and are strangers from this time. Something without a name, compassion, sorrow, old tenderness, mistaken gratitude, habit, none of these, and yet all of them, smote upon Tom's gentle heart at parting. There was no such soul as Pecksniff's in that carcass, and yet, though his speaking out had not involved the compromise of one he loved, he couldn't have denounced the very shape and figure of the man, not even then. "'I will not say,' cried Mr. Pecksniff, shedding tears, "'what a blow this is. I will not say how much it tries me, how it works upon my nature, how it grates upon my feelings. I do not care for that. I can endure as well as another man. But what I have to hope, and what you have to hope, Mr. Pinch, otherwise a great responsibility rests upon you, is that this deception may not alter my ideas of humanity, that it may not impair my freshness, or contract, if I may use the expression, my pinions. I hope it will not. I don't think it will. It may be a comfort to you, if not now, at some future time, to know that I shall endeavour not to think the worse of my fellow creatures in general for what has passed between us. Farewell. Tom had meant to spare him one little punctuation with a lancet, which he had it in his power to administer, but he changed his mind on hearing this, and said, "'I think you left something in the church, sir.' "'Thank you, Mr. Pinch,' said Pecksniff. "'I am not aware that I did.' "'This is your double eyeglass, I believe,' said Tom. "'Oh!' cried Pecksniff, with some degree of confusion. "'I am obliged to you. Put it down, if you please.' "'I found it,' said Tom slowly, "'when I went to bolt the vestry window in the pew. "'So he had. "'Mr. Pecksniff had taken it off when he was bobbing up and down,' lest it should strike against the panelling, and had forgotten it. Going back to the church, with his mind full of having been watched, and wondering very much from what part, Tom's attention was caught by the door of the state pew standing open. 
Looking into it, he found the glass, and thus he knew, and by returning it gave Mr. Pecksniff the information that he knew where the listener had been, and that instead of overhearing fragments of the conversation, he must have rejoiced in every word of it. "'I am glad he's gone,' said Martin, drawing a long breath when Tom had left the room. "'It is a relief,' assented Mr. Pecksniff. "'It is a great relief. "'But having discharged, I hope with tolerable firmness, "'the duty which I owed to society, "'I will now, my dear sir, if you will give me leave, "'retire to shed a few tears in the back garden "'as an humble individual.' "'Tom went upstairs, cleared his shelf of books, "'packed them up with his music and an old fiddle in his trunk, "'got out his clothes, "'they were not so many that they made his head ache, put them on the top of his books, and went into the workroom for his case of instruments. There was a ragged stool there, with the horsehair all sticking out of the top like a wig, a very beast of a stool in itself, on which he had taken up his daily seat, year after year, during the whole period of his service. They had grown older and shabbier in company. Pupils had served their time, seasons had come and gone, Tom and the worn-out stool had held together through it all, that part of the room was traditionally called Tom's Corner. It had been assigned to him at first because of its being situated in a strong draught and a great way from the fire, and he had occupied it ever since. There were portraits of him on the walls, with all his weak points monstrously portrayed. Diabolical sentiments foreign to his character were represented as issuing from his mouth in fat balloons. Every pupil had added something, even unto fancy portraits of his father with one eye and of his mother with a disproportionate nose, and especially of his sister, who, always being presented as extremely beautiful, made full amends to Tom for any other jokes. Under less uncommon circumstances it would have cut Tom to the heart to leave these things and think that he saw them for the last time, but it didn't now. There was no peck sniff. There never had been a peck sniff and all his other griefs were swallowed up in that. So when he returned into the bedroom, and having fastened his box and a carpet-bag, put on his walking gaiters and his great coat, and his hat, and taken his stick in his hand, looked round it for the last time. Early on summer mornings, and by the light of private candle-ends on winter nights, he had read himself half-blind in this same room. He had tried in this same room to learn the fiddle under the bedclothes, but yielding to objections from the other pupils, had reluctantly abandoned the design. At any other time he would have parted from it with a pang, thinking of all he had learned there, of the many hours he had passed there, for the love of his very dreams. But there was no Pecksniff, there never had been a Pecksniff, and the unreality of Pecksniff extended itself to the chamber, in which, sitting on one particular bed, the thing supposed to be that great abstraction had often preached morality with such effect that Tom had felt a moisture in his eyes while hanging breathless on the words. The man engaged to bear his box, Tom knew him well, a dragon man, came stamping up the stairs and made a roughish bow to Tom, to whom in common times he would have nodded with a grin, as though he were aware of what had happened and wished him to perceive it made no difference to him. It was clumsily done. He was a mere waterer of horses. But Tom liked the man for it, and felt it more than going away. Tom would have helped him with the box, but he made no more of it, though it was a heavy one, than an elephant would have made of a castle, just swinging it on his back and bowling downstairs, as if, being naturally a heavy sort of fellow, he could carry a box infinitely better than he could go alone. Tom took the carpet-bag and went downstairs along with him. At the outer door stood Jane, crying with all her might, and on the steps was Mrs. Lupin, sobbing bitterly, and putting out her hand for Tom to shake. "'You're coming to the dragon, Mr. Pinch.' "'No,' said Tom, "'no. I shall walk to Salisbury to-night. I couldn't stay here. For goodness' sake, don't make me so unhappy, Mrs. Lupin.' "'But you'll come to the dragon, Mr. Pinch, if it's only for to-night. To see me, you know, not as a traveller. "'God bless my soul,' said Tom, wiping his eyes. "'The kindness of people is enough to break one's heart. "'I mean to go to Salisbury to-night, my dear good creature. "'If you'll take care of my box for me till I write for it, "'I shall consider it the greatest kindness you can do me.' "'I wish,' cried Mrs. Lupin, "'there were twenty boxes, Mr. Pinch, that I might have them all.' "'Thank ye,' said Tom. "'It's like you. "'Good-bye. "'Good-bye.' 
There were several people, young and old, standing about the door, some of whom cried with Mrs. Lupin, while others tried to keep up a stout heart, as Tom did, and others were absorbed in admiration of Mr. Pecksniff, a man who could build a church, as one may say, by squinting at a sheet of paper, and others were divided between that feeling and sympathy with Tom. Mr. Pecksniff had appeared on the top of the steps simultaneously with his old pupil, and while Tom was talking with Mrs. Lupin kept his hand stretched out, as though he said, "'Go forth!' When Tom went forth, and had turned the corner, Mr. Pecksniff shook his head, shut his eyes, and heaving a deep sigh, shut the door, on which the best of Tom's supporters said he must have done some dreadful deed, or such a man as Mr. Pecksniff never could have felt like that. If it had been a common quarrel, they observed, he would have said something, but when he didn't, Mr. Pinch must have shocked him dreadfully. Tom was out of hearing of their shrewd opinions, and plodded on as steadily as he could go, until he came within sight of the turnpike, where the Tolman's family had cried out, "'Mr. Pinch!' that frosty morning, when he went to meet young Martin. He had got through the village, and this toll-bar was his last trial. But when the infant toll-takers came screeching out, he had half a mind to run for it, and make a bolt across the country. "'Why, dearie, Mr. Pinch! Oh, dearie, sir!' cried the Tolman's wife. "'What an unlikely time for you to be a-going this way with a bag!' "'I am going to Salisbury,' said Tom. "'Why, goodness, where's the gig, then?' cried the Tolman's wife, looking down the road, as if she thought Tom might have been upset without observing it. "'I haven't got it,' said Tom. "'I—' He couldn't evade it. He felt she would have him in the next question, if he got over this one. "'I have left Mr. Pecksniff.' The tollman, a crusty customer, always smoking solitary pipes in a Windsor chair inside, sat artfully between two little windows that looked up and down the road, so that when he saw anything coming up he might hug himself on having toll to take, and when he saw it going down might hug himself on having taken it. The tollman was out in an instant. "'Left Mr. Pecksniff!' cried the tollman. "'Yes,' said Tom, "'left him.' The tollman looked at his wife, uncertain whether to ask her if she had anything to suggest, or to order her to mind the children. Astonishment making him surly, he preferred the latter, and sent her into the toll-house with a flea in her ear. "'You left Mr. Pecksniff!' cried the tollman, folding his arms and spreading his legs. "'I should as soon have thought of his head leaving him.' "'Aye,' said Tom, "'so should I. Yesterday. Good night.' If a heavy drove of oxen hadn't come by immediately, the tollman would have gone down to the village straight to inquire into it. As things turned out, he smoked another pipe and took his wife into his confidence. But their united sagacity could make nothing of it, and they went to bed, metaphorically, in the dark. But several times that night, when a wagon or other vehicle came through, and the driver asked the toll-keeper, "'What news?' He looked at the man by the light of his lantern to assure himself that he had an interest in the subject— and then said, wrapping his watch-coat round his legs, "'You've heard of Mr. Pecksniff down yonder?' "'Ah, surely. "'And of his young man, Mr. Pinch, perhaps?' "'Ah. "'They parted.' After every one of these disclosures, the tollman plunged into his house again, and was seen no more, while the other side went on in great amazement. But this was long after Tom was abed, and Tom was now with his face towards Salisbury, doing his best to get there. The evening was beautiful at first, but it became cloudy and dull at sunset, and the rain fell heavily soon afterwards. For ten long miles he plodded on, wet through, until at last the lights appeared, and he came into the welcome precincts of the city. He went to the inn where he had waited for Martin, and briefly answering their inquiries after Mr. Pecksniff, ordered a bed. He had no heart for tea or supper, meat or drink of any kind, but sat by himself before an empty table in the public room, while the bed was getting ready, revolving in his mind all that had happened that eventful day, and wondering what he could or should do for the future. It was a great relief when the chambermaid came in, and said the bed was ready. It was a low four-poster, shelving downward in the centre like a trough, and the room was crowded with impracticable tables and exploded chests of drawers, full of damp linen, a graphic representation in oil of a remarkably fat ox hung over the fireplace, and the portrait of some former landlord, who might have been the ox's brother, he was so like him, stared roundly in at the foot of the bed. 
A variety of queer smells were partially quenched in the prevailing scent of very old lavender, and the window had not been opened for such a long space of time that it pleaded immemorial usage and wouldn't come open now. These were trifles in themselves, but they added to the strangeness of the place, and did not induce Tom to forget his new position. Pecksniff had gone out of the world, had never been in it, and it was as much as Tom could do to say his prayers without him, but he felt happier afterwards, and went to sleep, and dreamed about him as he never was. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Two Treats of Todgers Again, and of Another Blighted Plant Besides the Plants upon the Leads. Early on the day next after that on which she bade adieu to the halls of her youth and the scenes of her childhood, Miss Pecksniff, arriving safely at the coach office in London, was there received and conducted to her peaceful home beneath the shadow of the monument by Mrs. Todgers. M. Todgers looked a little worn by cares of gravy and other such solicitudes arising out of her establishment, but displayed her usual earnestness and warmth of manner. "'And how, my sweet Miss Pecksniff,' said she, "'how is your princely pa?' Miss Pecksniff signified, in confidence, that he contemplated the introduction of a princely ma, and repeated the sentiment that she wasn't blind and wasn't quite a fool and wouldn't bear it. Mrs. Todgers was more shocked by the intelligence than anyone could have expected. She was quite bitter.' She said there was no truth in man, and that the warmer he expressed himself, as a general principle, the falser and more treacherous he was. She foresaw with astonishing clearness that the object of Mr. Pecksniff's attachment was designing, worthless, and wicked, and receiving from charity the fullest confirmation of these views, protested with tears in her eyes that she loved Miss Pecksniff like a sister, and felt her injuries as if they were her own. "'Your real darling sister, I have not seen her more than once since her marriage,' said Mrs. Todgers. "'And then I thought her looking poorly. "'My sweet Miss Pecksniff, I always thought that you was to be the lady.' "'Oh, dear, no!' cried Cherry, shaking her head. "'Oh, no, Mrs. Todgers, thank you, no, not for any consideration he could offer.' "'I dare say you are right,' said Mrs. Todgers, with a sigh. "'I feared it all along.' "'But the misery we have had from that match here among ourselves in this house, my dear Miss Pecksniff, nobody would believe.' "'Lor, Mrs. Todgers!' "'Awful, awful!' repeated Mrs. Todgers, with strong emphasis. "'You recollect our youngest gentleman, my dear?' "'Of course I do,' said Cherry. "'You might have observed,' said Mrs. Todgers, "'how he used to watch your sister, and that a kind of stony dumbness came over him whenever she was in company?' "'I am sure I never saw anything of the sort,' said Cherry, in a peevish manner. "'What nonsense, Mrs. Todgers!' "'My dear,' returned that lady, in a hollow voice, "'I have seen him again and again, sitting over his pie at dinner, "'with his spoon, a perfect fixture in his mouth, looking at your sister. "'I have seen him standing in a corner of our drawing-room, gazing at her, "'in such a lonely, melancholy state, that he was more like a pump than a man, "'and might have drawed tears.' "'I never saw it,' cried Cherry. "'That's all I can say.' "'But when the marriage took place,' said Mrs. Todgers, proceeding with her subject, "'when it was in the paper and was read out here at breakfast, "'I thought he had taken leave of his senses. I did indeed. "'The violence of that young man, my dear Miss Pecksniff, "'the frightful opinions he expressed upon the subject of self-destruction, "'the extraordinary actions he performed with his tea, "'the clenching way in which he bit his bread and butter,' The manner in which he taunted Mr. Jenkins all combined to form a picture never to be forgotten. "'It's a pity he didn't destroy himself, I think,' observed Miss Pecksniff. "'Himself,' said Mrs. Todgers. "'They took another turn at night. 
He was for destroying other people then. There was a little chaffing going on. I hope you don't consider that a low expression, Miss Pecksniff. It is always in our gentlemen's mouths, a little chaffing going on, my dear, among them, all in good nature, when suddenly he rose up, foaming with his fury, and but for being held by three would have had Mr. Jenkins's life with a boot-jack. Miss Pecksniff's face expressed supreme indifference. "'And now,' said Mrs. Todgers, "'now he is the meekest of men. "'You can almost bring the tears into his eyes by looking at him. "'He sits with me the whole day long on Sundays, "'talking in such a dismal way that I find it next to impossible "'to keep my spirits up equal to the accommodation of the boarders. "'His only comfort is in female society. "'He takes me half price to the play, "'to an extent which I sometimes fear is beyond his means.' and I see the tears are standing in his eyes during the whole performance, particularly if it is anything of a comic nature. "'The turn I experienced only yesterday,' said Mrs. Todgers, putting her hand to her side, "'when the housemaid threw his bedside carpet out of the window of his room while I was sitting here, no one can imagine. I thought it was him, and that he had done it at last.' The contempt with which Miss Charity received this pathetic account of the state to which the youngest gentleman in company was reduced did not say much for her power of sympathizing with that unfortunate character. She treated it with great levity, and went on to inform herself, then and afterwards, whether any other changes had occurred in the commercial boarding-house. Mr. Bailey was gone, and had been succeeded, such as the decay of human greatness, by an old woman whose name was reported to be Tamaru, which seemed an impossibility. Indeed, it appeared in the fullness of time that the jocular boarders had appropriated the word from an English ballad, in which it is supposed to express the bold and fiery nature of a certain hackney coachman, and that it was bestowed upon Mr. Bailey's successor by reason of her having nothing fiery about her, except an occasional attack of that fire, which is called St. Anthony's. This ancient female had been engaged, in fulfilment of a vow, registered by Mrs. Todgers, that no more boys should darken the commercial doors, and she was chiefly remarkable for a total absence of all comprehension upon every subject whatever. She was a perfect tomb for messages and small parcels, and when dispatched to the post-office with letters, had been frequently seen endeavouring to insinuate them into casual chinks and private doors, under the delusion that any door with a hole in it would answer the purpose. She was a very little old woman, and always wore a very coarse apron with a bib before and a loop behind, together with bandages on her wrists, which appeared to be afflicted with an everlasting sprain. She was, on all occasions, chary of opening the street door, and ardent to shut it again, and she waited at table in a bonnet. This was the only great change over and above the change which had fallen on the youngest gentleman. As for him, he more than corroborated the account of Mrs. Todgers, possessing greater sensibility than even she had given him credit for. He entertained some terrible notions of destiny, among other matters, and talked much about people's missions, upon which he seemed to have some private information not generally attainable, as he knew it had been poor Mary's mission to crush him in the bud. He was very frail and tearful, for being aware that a shepherd's mission was to pipe to his flocks, and that a boatswain's mission was to pipe all hands, and that one man's mission was to be a paid piper, and another man's mission was to pay the piper, so he had got it into his head that his own peculiar mission was to pipe his eye, which he did perpetually. He often informed Mrs. Todgers that the sun had set upon him, that the billows had rolled over him, that the car of Juggernaut had crushed him, and also that the deadly upas tree of Java had blighted him. His name was Model. Towards this most unhappy model, Miss Pecksniff conducted herself at first with distant haughtiness, being in no humour to be entertained with dirges in honour of her married sister. The poor young gentleman was additionally crushed by this, and remonstrated with Mrs. Todgers on the subject. "'Even she turns from me, Mrs. Todgers,' said Model. "'Then why don't you try and be a little bit more cheerful, sir?' retorted Mrs. Todgers. "'Cheerful, Mrs. Todgers? Cheerful?' cried the youngest gentleman. "'When she reminds me of days forever fled, Mrs. Todgers?' "'Then you had better avoid her for a short time, if she does.' 
said Mrs. Todgers, and come to know her again by degrees. That's my advice. But I can't avoid her, replied Model. I haven't strength of mind to do it. Oh, Mrs. Todgers, if you knew what a comfort her nose is to me. Her nose, sir? Mrs. Todgers cried. Her profile in general, said the youngest gentleman, but particularly her nose. It's so like— Here he yielded to a burst of grief. It's so like hers who is another's, Mrs. Todgers. The observant matron did not fail to report this conversation to Charity, who laughed at the time, but treated Mr. Model that very evening with increased consideration, and presented her side face to him as much as possible. Mr. Model was not less sentimental than usual, was rather more so, if anything, but he sat and stared at her with glistening eyes and seemed grateful. "'Well, sir,' said the lady of the boarding-house next day, "'you held up your head last night. You're coming round, I think.' "'Only because she's so like her who is another's, Mrs. Todgers,' rejoined the youth. "'When she talks and when she smiles, I think I'm looking on her brow again, Mrs. Todgers.' This was likewise carried to Charity, who talked and smiled next evening in her most engaging manner, and rallying Mr. Model on the lowness of his spirits, challenged him to play a rubber at cribbage. Mr. Model, taking up the gauntlet, they played several rubbers for sixpences, and Charity won them all. This may have been partially attributable to the gallantry of the youngest gentleman, but it was certainly referable to the state of his feelings also, for his eyes being frequently dimmed by tears, he thought that aces were tens and knaves queens, which at times occasioned some confusion in his play. On the seventh night of cribbage, when Mrs. Todgers, sitting by, proposed that instead of gambling they should play for love, Mr. Model was seen to change colour. On the fourteenth night he kissed Miss Pecksniff's snuffers in the passage when she went upstairs to bed, meaning to have kissed her hand but missing it. In short, Mr. Model began to be impressed with the idea that Miss Pecksniff's mission was to comfort him, and Miss Pecksniff began to speculate on the probability of its being her mission to become ultimately Mrs. Model. He was a young gentleman, Miss Pecksniff was not a very young lady, with rising prospects, and almost enough to live on. Really, it looked very well. Besides, besides, he had been regarded as devoted to Mary— Mary had joked about him, and had once spoken of it to her sister as a conquest. He was better looking, better shaped, better spoken, better tempered, better mannered than Jonas. He was easy to manage, could be made to consult the humours of his betrothed, and could be shown off like a lamb when Jonas was a bear. There was the rub. In the meantime the cribbage went on, and Mrs. Todgers went off, for the youngest gentleman, dropping her society, began to take Miss Pecksniff to the play. He also began, as Mrs. Todgers said, to slip home in his dinner-times, and to get away from the office at unholy seasons, and twice, as he informed Mrs. Todgers himself, he received anonymous letters and closing cards from furniture warehouses, clearly the act of that ungentlemanly ruffian Jenkins, only he hadn't evidence enough to call him out upon, all of which, so Mrs. Todgers told Miss Pecksniff, "'spoke as plain English as the shining sun. "'My dear Miss Pecksniff, you may depend upon it,' said Mrs. Todgers, "'that he is burning to propose. "'My goodness me, why don't he then?' cried Cherry. "'Men are so much more timid than we think of, my dear,' returned Mrs. Todgers. "'They balk themselves continually. "'I saw the words on Todgers's lips for months and months and months before he said them. Miss Pecksniff submitted that Todgers might not have been a fair specimen. "'Oh, yes, he was. Oh, bless you. Yes, my dear. I was very particular in those days, I assure you,' said Mrs. Todgers, bridling. "'No, no. You give Mr. Model a little encouragement, Miss Pecksniff, if you wish him to speak, and he'll speak fast enough, depend upon it.' "'I am sure I don't know what encouragement he would have, Mrs. Todgers,' returned Charity. "'He walks with me and plays cards with me, and he comes and sits alone with me.' "'Quite right,' said Mrs. Todgers. "'That's indispensable, my dear.' "'And he sits very close to me.' "'Also quite correct,' said Mrs. Todgers. "'And he looks at me.' "'To be sure he does,' said Mrs. Todgers. 
and he has his arm upon the back of the chair or sofa or whatever it is behind me, you know. I should think so, said Mrs. Todgers. And then he begins to cry. Mrs. Todgers admitted that he might do better than that and might undoubtedly profit by the recollection of the great Lord Nelson's signal at the Battle of Trafalgar. Still, she said, he would come round, or not to mince the matter, would be brought round, if Miss Pecksniff took up a decided position, and plainly showed him that it must be done. Determining to regulate her conduct by this opinion, the young lady received Mr. Model on the earliest subsequent occasion with an air of constraint— and gradually leading him to inquire, in a dejected manner, why she was so changed, confessed to him that she felt it necessary, for their mutual peace and happiness, to take a decided step. They had been much together lately, she observed, much together, and had tasted the sweets of a genuine reciprocity of sentiment. She could never forget him, nor could she ever cease to think of him with feelings of the liveliest friendship. But people had begun to talk— the thing had been observed, and it was necessary that they should be nothing more to each other than any gentleman and lady in society usually are. She was glad she had had the resolution to say thus much before her feelings had been tried too far. They had been greatly tried, she would admit, but though she was weak and silly, she would soon get the better of it, she hoped. Model, who had by this time become in the last degree maudlin, and wept abundantly, inferred from the foregoing avowal that it was his mission to communicate to others the blight which had fallen on himself, and that, being a kind of unintentional vampire, he had had Miss Pecksniff assigned to him by the fates as victim number one. Miss Pecksniff, controverting this opinion as sinful, Model was goaded on to ask whether she could be contented with a blighted heart, and it appearing on further examination that she could be, plighted his dismal troth, which was accepted and returned. He bore his good fortune with the utmost moderation. Instead of being triumphant, he shed more tears than he had ever been known to shed before, and sobbing said, "'Oh, what a day this has been! I can't go back to the office this afternoon. Oh, what a trying day this has been! Good gracious!' End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three, Part One of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Three Further Proceedings in Eden and a Proceeding Out of It. Martin makes a discovery of some importance. Part One. From Mr. Model to Eden is an easy and natural transition. Mr. Model, living in the atmosphere of Miss Pecksniff's love, dwelt, if he had but known it, in a terrestrial paradise. The thriving city of Eden was also a terrestrial paradise, upon the showing of its proprietors. The beautiful Miss Pecksniff might have been poetically described as a something too good for man in his fallen and degraded state. That was exactly the character of the thriving city of Eden, as poetically heightened by Zephaniah Scatter, General Choke, and other worthies. Part and parcel of the talons of that great American eagle, which is always airing itself sky-high in purest ether, and never, no, never, never tumbles down with draggled wings into the mud. When Mark Tapley, leaving Martin in the architectural and surveying offices, had effectually strengthened and encouraged his own spirits by the contemplation of their joint misfortunes, he proceeded with new cheerfulness in search of help, congratulating himself as he went along on the enviable position to which he had at last attained. "'I used to think sometimes,' said Mr. Tapley, "'as a desolate island would suit me.' "'but I should only have had myself to provide for there, "'and being naturally a easy man to manage, "'there wouldn't have been much credit in that. "'Now here I've got my partner to take care on, "'and he's something like the sort of man for the purpose. 
I want a man as is always a sliding off his legs when he ought to be on him. I want a man as is so low down in the school of life that he's always a making figures of one in his copy book and can't get no further. I want a man as is his own great coat and cloak, and is always a wrapping himself up in himself. And I have got him, too, said Mr. Tapley, after a moment's silence. What a happiness! He paused to look round, uncertain to which of the log houses he should repair. I don't know which to take, he observed. That's the truth. They're equally prepossessing outside, and equally commodious, no doubt, within. Being fitted up with every convenience that an alligator in a state of nature could possibly require. Let me see. The citizen has turned out last night lives under water, in the right-hand dog kennel at the corner. I don't want to trouble him if I can help it, poor man, for he is a melancholy object, a regular settler in every respect. There's a house with a winder, but I am afraid of their being proud. I don't know whether a door ain't too aristocratic, but here goes for the first one. He went up to the nearest cabin and knocked with his hand. Being desired to enter, he complied. Neighbor, said Mark. "'for I am a neighbor, though you don't know me. "'I've come a-begging. "'Hello! Hello! Am I a-bed and dreaming?' "'He made this exclamation on hearing his own name pronounced, "'and finding himself clasped about the skirts by two little boys, "'whose faces he had often washed, "'and whose suppers he had often cooked, "'on board of that noble and fast-sailing line of packet-ship, the Screw. "'My eyes is wrong,' said Mark. "'I don't believe em. "'That ain't my fellow-passenger yonder, "'a nursing her little girl, who, I am sorry to see, is so delicate. "'And that ain't her husband has come to New York to fetch her. "'Nor these,' he added, looking down upon the boys, "'ain't them two young shavers as was so familiar to me, "'though they are uncommon like em, that I must confess.' "'The woman shed tears, and very joy to see him. "'The man shook both his hands and would not let them go. "'The two boys hugged his legs.' The sick child in the mother's arms stretched out her burning little fingers and muttered in her hoarse dry throat his well-remembered name. It was the same family, sure enough, altered by the salubrious air of Eden, but the same. "'This is a new sort of a morning call,' said Mark, drawing a long breath. "'It strikes one all of a heap. Wait a little bit. I'm a-coming round fast.' "'That'll do.' "'These gentlemen ain't my friends. "'Are they on the visiting list of the house?' "'The inquiry referred to certain gaunt pigs "'who had walked in after him "'and were much interested in the heels of the family. "'As they did not belong to the mansion, "'they were expelled by the two little boys. "'I ain't superstitious about toads,' said Mark, "'looking round the room. "'But if you could prevail upon the two or three I see in company "'to step out at the same time, my young friends,' I think they'd find the open air refreshing. Not that I at all object to em. A very handsome animal is a toad, said Mr. Tapley, sitting down upon a stool. Very spotted, very like a particular style of old gentleman about the throat. Very bright-eyed, very cool and very slippy. But one sees em to the best advantage out of doors, perhaps. While pretending with such talk as this to be perfectly at his ease, and to be the most indifferent and careless of men, Mark Tapley had an eye on all around him. The wan and meagre aspect of the family, the changed looks of the poor mother, the fevered child she held in her lap, the air of great despondency and little hope on everything were plain to him, and made a deep impression on his mind. He saw it all as clearly and as quickly as with his bodily eyes he saw the rough shelves supported by pegs driven between the logs of which the house was made the flower cask in the corner, serving also for a table, the blankets, spades, and other articles against the walls, the damp that blotched the ground, or the crop of vegetable rottenness in every crevice of the hut. "'How is it that you have come here?' asked the man, when their first expressions of surprise were over. "'Why, we come by the steamer last night,' replied Mark. "'Our intention is to make our fortunes with punctuality and dispatch, and to retire upon our property as soon as ever it's realized.' "'But how are you all? You're looking noble.' "'We are but sickly now,' said the poor woman, bending over her child. "'But we shall do better when we are seasoned to the place.' "'There are some here,' thought Mark, "'whose seasoning will last for ever. "'But he said cheerfully, "'Do better, to be sure you will. "'We shall all do better. "'What we've got to do is to keep up our spirits, "'and be neighborly. 
"'We shall come all right in the end. Never fear. "'That reminds me, by the by, that my partner's all wrong just at present, "'and that I looked in to beg for him. "'I wish you'd come and give me your opinion of him, master.' That must have been a very unreasonable request on the part of Mark Tapley, with which, in their gratitude for his kind offices on board the ship, they would not have complied instantly. The man rose to accompany him without a moment's delay. Before they went, Mark took the sick child in his arms and tried to comfort the mother, but the hand of death was on it then, he saw. They found Martin in the house, lying wrapped up in his blanket on the ground. He was, to all appearance, very ill indeed, and shook and shivered horribly, not as people do from cold, but in a frightful kind of spasm or convulsion that racked his whole body. Mark's friend pronounced his disease an aggravated kind of fever, accompanied with a gue, which was very common in those parts, and which he predicted would be worse to-morrow, and for many more to-morrows. He had had it himself off and on, he said, for a couple of years or so, but he was thankful that, while so many he had known had died about him, he had escaped with life. And with not too much of that, thought Mark, surveying his emaciated form, Eden forever. They had some medicine in their chest, and this man of sad experience showed Mark how and when to administer it, and how he could best alleviate the sufferings of Martin. His attentions did not stop there, for he was backwards and forwards constantly, and rendered Mark good service in all his brisk attempts to make their situation more endurable. Hope or comfort for the future he could not bestow. The season was a sickly one, the settlement a grave. His child died that night, and Mark, keeping the secret from Martin, helped to bury it beneath a tree next day. With all his various duties of attendance upon Martin, who became the more exacting in his claims the worse he grew, Mark worked out of doors early and late, and with the assistance of his friend and others labored to do something with their land. Not that he had the least strength of heart or hope or steady purpose in so doing, beyond the habitual cheerfulness of his disposition, and his amazing power of self-sustainment, for within himself he looked on their condition as beyond all hope, and in his own words, came out strong in consequence. "'As to coming out as strong as I could wish, sir,' he confided to Martin, in a leisure moment, that is to say, one evening, while he was washing the linen of the establishment after a hard day's work, that I give up. It's a piece of good fortune as never is to happen to me, I see. Would you wish for circumstances stronger than these? Martin retorted with a groan from underneath his blanket. Well, I only see how easy they might have been stronger, sir, said Mark. If it wasn't for the envy of that uncommon fortin of mine, which is always after me and tripping me up, the night we landed here, I thought things did look pretty jolly. I won't deny it. I thought they did look pretty jolly. How do they look now? groaned Martin. Ah, said Mark. Ah, to be sure, that's the question. How do they look now? On the very first morning of my going out, what do I do? Stumble on a family I know, who are constantly assisting of us in all sorts of ways from that time to this. That won't do, you know. That ain't what I'd a right to expect. If I had stumbled on a serpent and got bit, or stumbled on a first-rate patriot and got bowie-knifed, or stumbled on a lot of sympathizers with inverted shirt-collars and got made a lion of, I might have distinguished myself and earned some credit. As it is, the great object of my voyage is knocked on the head, so it would be wherever I went. How do you feel tonight, sir? Worse than ever, said poor Martin. That's something, returned Mark, but not enough. "'Nothing but being very bad myself and jolly to the last will ever do me justice.' "'In heaven's name don't talk of that,' said Martin, with a thrill of terror. "'What should I do, Mark, if you were taken ill?' Mr. Tapley's spirits appeared to be stimulated by this remark, although it was not a very flattering one. He proceeded with his washing in a brighter mood, and observed that his glass was arising. "'There's one good thing in this place, sir,' said Mr. Tapley, scrubbing away at the linen, as disposes me to be jolly, and that is that it's a regular little United States in itself. There's two or three American settlers left, and they coolly comes over one, even here, sir, as if it was the wholesomest and loveliest spot in the world. But they're like the cock that went and hid himself to save his life, and was found out by the noise he made. 
They can't help crowing. They was born to do it, and do it they must, whatever comes of it. Glancing from his work out at the door as he said these words, Mark's eyes encountered a lean person in a blue frock and a straw hat, with a short black pipe in his mouth and a great hickory stick studded all over with knots in his hand, who, smoking and chewing as he came along and spitting frequently, recorded his progress by a train of decomposed tobacco on the ground. "'Here's one on em cried Mark. "'Hannibal Chollop.' "'Don't let him in,' said Martin feebly. "'He won't want any letting in,' replied Mark. "'He'll come in, sir,' which turned out to be quite true, for he did. His face was almost as hard and knobby as his stick, and so were his hands. His head was like an old black hearth-broom. He sat down on the chest with his hat on, and crossing his legs and looking up at Mark, said, without removing his pipe, "'Well, Mr. Coe, and how do you get along, sir?' It may be necessary to observe that Mr. Tapley had gravely introduced himself to all strangers by that name. "'Pretty well, sir, pretty well,' said Mark. "'If this ain't Mr. Chuzzlewit, ain't it?' exclaimed the visitor. "'How do you get along, sir?' Martin shook his head and drew the blanket over it involuntarily, for he felt that Hannibal was going to spit, and his eye, as the song says, was upon him. "'You need not regard me, sir,' observed Mr. Chollop complacently. "'I am fever-proof, and likewise a gear.' "'Mine was a more selfish motive,' said Martin, looking out again. "'I was afraid you were going to—' "'I can calculate my distance, sir,' returned Mr. Chollop, to an inch. "'With the proof of which happy faculty he immediately favoured him. "'I require, sir,' said Hannibal, two foot clear in a circular direction, and can engage myself to keep within it. I have gone ten foot in a circular direction, but that was for a wager. I hope you won it, sir, said Mark. Well, sir, I realized the stakes, said Chollop. Yes, sir. He was silent for a time, during which he was actively engaged in the formation of a magic circle round the chest on which he sat. When it was completed, he began to talk again. "'How do you like our country, sir?' he inquired, looking at Martin. "'Not at all,' was the invalid's reply. Chollop continued to smoke without the least appearance of emotion, until he felt disposed to speak again. That time at length arriving, he took his pipe from his mouth and said, "'I am not surprised to hear you say so. It requires an elevation and a preparation of the intellect. The mind of man must be prepared for freedom, Mr. Coe.' He addressed himself to Mark, because he saw that Martin, who wished him to go, being already half mad with feverish irritation, which the droning voice of this new horror rendered almost insupportable, had closed his eyes and turned on his uneasy bed. "'A little bodily preparation wouldn't be amiss either, would it, sir?' said Mark, in the case of a blessed old swamp like this. "'Do you consider this a swamp, sir?' inquired Chollop gravely. "'Why, yes, sir,' returned Mark. "'I haven't a doubt about it myself.' "'The sentiment is quite European,' said the Major, "'and does not surprise me. "'What would your English millions say to such a swamp in England, sir?' "'They'd say it was an uncommon nasty one, I should think,' said Mark, "'and that they would rather be inoculated for fever in some other way.' "'European,' remarked Chollop, with sardonic pity, "'quite European.' And there he sat, silent and cool, as if the house were his, smoking away like a factory chimney. Mr. Chollop was, of course, one of the most remarkable men in the country, but he really was a notorious person besides. He was usually described by his friends in the South and West as a splendid sample of our native raw material, sir, and was much esteemed for his devotion to rational liberty— for the better propagation whereof he usually carried a brace of revolving pistols in his coat pocket with seven barrels apiece. He also carried, amongst other trinkets, a sword stick, which he called his tickler, and a great knife, which, for he was a man of a pleasant turn of humour, he called ripper, in allusion to its usefulness as a means of ventilating the stomach of any adversary in a close contest. He had used these weapons with distinguished effect in several instances, all duly chronicled in the newspapers, and was greatly beloved for the gallant manner in which he had jobbed out the eye of one gentleman as he was in the act of knocking at his own street door. 
Mr. Chollop was a man of a roving disposition, and, in any less advanced community, might have been mistaken for a violent vagabond. But his fine qualities, being perfectly understood and appreciated in those regions where his lot was cast, and where he had many kindred spirits to consort with, he may be regarded as having been born under a fortunate star, which is not always the case with a man so much before the age in which he lives. Preferring, with a view to the gratification of his tickling and ripping fancies, to dwell upon the outskirts of society, and in the more remote towns and cities, he was in the habit of emigrating from place to place, and establishing in each some business, usually a newspaper, which he presently sold, for the most part closing the bargain by challenging, stabbing, pistoling, or gouging the new editor, before he had quite taken possession of the property. He had come to Eden on a speculation of this kind, but had abandoned it, and was about to leave. He always introduced himself to strangers as a worshipper of freedom, was the consistent advocate of lynch law and slavery, and invariably recommended, both in print and speech, the tarring and feathering of any unpopular person who differed from himself. He called this planting the standard of civilization in the wilder gardens of my country. End of chapter 33, part 1Chapter 33, Part 2 of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter 33, Part 2 there is little doubt that Chollop would have planted this standard in Eden at Mark's expense in return for his plainness of speech, for the genuine freedom is dumb save when she vaunts herself. But for the utter desolation and decay prevailing in the settlement and his own approaching departure from it, as it was, he contented himself with showing Mark one of the revolving pistols and asking him what he thought of that weapon. "'It ain't long since I shot a man down with that, sir, in the state of Illinois,' observed Chollop. "'Did you indeed?' said Mark, without the smallest agitation. "'Very free of you, and very independent.' "'I shot him down, sir,' pursued Chollop, "'for asserting in the Spartan portico, a tri-weekly journal, "'that the ancient Athenians went ahead of the present loco foco ticket.' "'And what's that?' asked Mark." "'European not to know,' said Chollop, smoking placidly. "'European quite.' After a short devotion to the interests of the magic circle, he resumed the conversation by observing, "'You won't half feel yourself at home in Eden now.' "'No,' said Mark, "'I don't.' "'You miss the imposts of your country. You miss the house dues,' observed Chollop. "'And the houses, rather,' said Mark. "'No window dues here, sir,' observed Chollop. "'And no windows to put em on,' said Mark. "'No stakes, no dungeons, no blocks, no racks, "'no scaffolds, no thumbscrews, no pikes, no pillories,' said Chollop. "'Nothing but rewalwers and bowie-knives,' returned Mark. "'And what are they? Not worth mentioning.' "'The man who had met them on the night of their arrival "'came crawling up at this juncture and looked in at the door. "'Well, sir,' said Chollop, "'how do you get along?' He had considerable difficulty in getting along at all, and said as much in reply. "'Mr. Coe and me, sir,' observed Chollop, "'are disputating a piece. He ought to be slicked up pretty smart to disputate between the old world and the new, I do expect.' "'Well,' returned the miserable shadow, "'so he had.' "'I was merely observing, sir,' said Mark, addressing this new visitor, "'that I looked upon the city in which we have the honour to live as being swampy.' "'What's your sentiments?' "'I opinionate it's moist, perhaps, at certain times,' returned the man. "'But not as moist as England, sir,' cried Chollop, with a fierce expression in his face. "'Oh, not as moist as England, let alone its institutions,' said the man. 
I should hope there ain't a swamp in all America as don't whip that small island into mush and molasses, observed Chollop decisively. You bought slick, straight, and right away of scatter, sir, to Mark? He answered in the affirmative. Mr. Chollop winked at the other citizen. Scatter is a smart man, sir. He is a rising man. He is a man as will come upwards, right side up, sir. Mr. Chollop winked again at the other citizen. He should have his right side very high up if I had my way, said Mark. As high up as the top of a good tall gallows, perhaps. Mr. Chollop was so delighted at the smartness of his excellent countryman having been too much for the Britisher, and at the Britisher's resenting it, that he could contain himself no longer, and broke forth in a shout of delight. But the strangest exposition of this ruling passion was in the other, the pestilent-stricken, broken, miserable shadow of a man who derived so much entertainment from the circumstance that he seemed to forget his own ruin in thinking of it, and laughed outright when he said that scatter was a smart man, and had drawed a lot of British capital that way as sure as sun-up. After a full enjoyment of this joke, Mr. Hannibal Chollop sat smoking and improving the circle, without making any attempts either to converse or to take leave, apparently laboring under the not uncommon delusion that for a free and enlightened citizen of the United States to convert another man's house into a spittoon for two or three hours together was a delicate attention, full of interest and politeness, of which nobody could ever tire. At last he rose. "'I am a-going easy,' he observed. Mark entreated him to take particular care of himself. "'Afore I go,' he said sternly, "'I have got a leetle word to say to you. "'You are darnation cute, you are.' Mark thanked him for the compliment. "'But you are much too cute to last. "'I can't conceive of any spotted painter in the bush "'as ever was so riddled through and through as you will be, I bet.' "'What for?' asked Mark. "'We must be cracked up, sir,' retorted Chollop in a tone of menace. "'You are not now in a despotic land. "'We are a model to the earth and must be just cracked up, I tell you.' "'What?' "'I speak too free, do I?' cried Mark. "'I have drawed upon a man and fired upon a man for less,' said Chollop, frowning. "'I have knowed strong men obliged to make themselves uncommon scase for less. "'I have knowed men lynched for less, and beaten into pumpkin sars for less, by an enlightened people. "'We are the intellect and virtue of the earth, the cream of human nature, and the flower of moral force. "'Our backs is easy riz. We must be cracked up, or they rises, and we snarls, we shows our teeth, I tell you, fierce. You'd better crack us up, you had. After the delivery of this caution, Mr. Chollop departed, with Ripper, Tickler, and the revolvers, all ready for action on the shortest notice. "'Come out from under the blanket, sir,' said Mark. "'He's gone.' "'What's this?' he added softly, kneeling down to look into his partner's face, and taking his hot hand. "'What's come of all that chattering and swaggering? "'He's wandering in his mind to-night and don't know me.' "'Martin, indeed, was dangerously ill, very near his death. "'He lay in that state many days, "'during which time Mark's poor friends, regardless of themselves, attended him. "'Mark, fatigued in mind and body, "'working all the day and sitting up at night, "'worn with hard living in the unaccustomed toil of his new life, "'surrounded by dismal and discouraging circumstances of every kind, "'never complained or yielded in the least degree. "'If ever he had thought Martin selfish or inconsiderate, "'or had deemed him energetic only by fits and starts, "'and then too passive for their desperate fortunes, "'he now forgot it all. "'He remembered nothing but the better qualities of his fellow-wanderer, "'and was devoted to him heart and hand.' Many weeks elapsed before Martin was strong enough to move about with the help of a stick in Mark's arm, and even then his recovery, for want of wholesome air and proper nourishment, was very slow. He was yet in a feeble and weak condition, when the misfortune he had so much dreaded fell upon them. Mark was taken ill. Mark fought against it, but the malady fought harder, and his efforts were in vain. "'Floored for the present, sir,' he said one morning, sinking back upon his bed. "'But jolly!' "'Floored indeed, and by a heavy blow, as any one but Martin might have known beforehand. "'If Mark's friends had been kind to Martin, and they had been very, 
they were twenty times kinder to Mark, and now it was Martin's turn to work, and sit beside the bed and watch, and listen through the long, long nights to every sound in the gloomy wilderness, and hear poor Mr. Tapley in his wandering fancy, playing at skittles in the dragon, making love remonstrances to Mrs. Lupin, getting his sea-legs on board the screw, travelling with old Tom Pinch on English roads, and burning stumps of trees in Eden, all at once. But whenever Martin gave him drink or medicine, or tended him in any way, or came into the house returning from some drudgery without, the patient Mr. Tapley brightened up and cried, "'I'm jolly, sir! I'm jolly!' Now, when Martin began to think of this, and to look at Mark as he lay there, never reproaching him by so much as an expression of regret, never murmuring, always striving to be manful and staunch, he began to think, how was it that this man, who had had so few advantages, was so much better than he who had had so many? And attendance upon a sick bed, but especially the sick bed of one whom we have been accustomed to see in full activity and vigour, being a great breeder of reflection, he began to ask himself in what they differed. He was assisted in coming to a conclusion on this head by the frequent presence of Mark's friend, their fellow passenger across the ocean, which suggested to him that, in regard to having aided her, for example, they had differed very much. Somehow he coupled Tom Pinch with this train of reflection, and thinking that Tom would be very likely to have struck up the same sort of acquaintance under similar circumstances, began to think in what respects two people so extremely different were like each other and were unlike him. At first sight there was nothing very distressing in these meditations, but they did undoubtedly distress him for all that. Martin's nature was a frank and generous one, but he had been bred up in his grandfather's house, and it will usually be found that the meaner domestic vices propagate themselves to be their own antagonists. Selfishness does this especially. So do suspicion, cunning, stealth, and covetous propensities. Martin had unconsciously reasoned as a child, My guardian takes so much thought of himself, that unless I do the like by myself, I shall be forgotten. So he had grown selfish. But he had never known it. If any one had taxed him with the vice, he would have indignantly repelled the accusation, and conceived himself unworthily aspersed. He never would have known it, but that being newly risen from a bed of dangerous sickness, to watch by such another couch, he felt how nearly self had dropped into the grave, and what a poor, dependent, miserable thing it was. It was natural for him to reflect, he had months to do it in, upon his own escape and Mark's extremity. This led him to consider which of them could be the better spared, and why. Then the curtain slowly rose a very little way, and self, self, self was shown below. He asked himself, besides, when dreading Mark's decease, as all men do and must at such a time, whether he had done his duty by him, and had deserved and made a good response to his fidelity and zeal. No! Short as their companionship had been, he felt in many, many instances that there was blame against himself, and still inquiring why, the curtain slowly rose a little more, and self, 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 dilated on the scene. It was long before he fixed the knowledge of himself so firmly in his mind that he could thoroughly discern the truth. But in the hideous solitude of that most hideous place, with hope so far removed, ambition quenched, and death beside him rattling at the very door, reflection came as in a plague-beleaguered town, and so he felt and knew the failing of his life, and saw distinctly what an ugly spot it was. Eden was a hard school to learn so hard a lesson in, but there were teachers in the swamp and thicket and the pestilential air who had a searching method of their own. He made a solemn resolution that when his strength returned he would not dispute the point or resist the conviction, but would look upon it as an established fact that selfishness was in his breast and must be rooted out. He was so doubtful, and with justice, of his own character, that he determined not to say one word of vain regret or good resolve to Mark, but steadily to keep his purpose before his own eyes solely, and there was not a jot of pride in this, nothing but humility and steadfastness, the best armor he could wear. 
So low had Eden brought him down, so high had Eden raised him up. After a long and lingering illness, in certain forlorn stages of which, when too far gone to speak, he had feebly written, Jolly, on a slate, Mark showed some symptoms of returning health. They came and went and flickered for a time, but he began to mend at last decidedly, and after that continued to improve from day to day. As soon as he was well enough to talk without fatigue, Martin consulted him upon a project he had in his mind, and which a few months back he would have carried into execution without troubling anybody's head but his own. "'Ours is a desperate case,' said Martin. "'Plainly. The place is deserted. Its failure must have become known. And selling what we have bought to any one for anything is hopeless, even if it were honest. We left home on a mad enterprise and have failed. The only hope left us, the only one end for which we have now to try, is to quit this settlement for ever and get back to England. Anyhow, by any means. Only to get back there, Mark.' "'That's all, sir.' returned Mr. Tapley, with a significant stress upon the words. Only that. Now, upon this side of the water, said Martin, we have but one friend who can help us, and that is Mr. Bevan. I thought of him when you was ill, said Mark. But for the time that would be lost, I would even write to my grandfather, Martin went on to say, and implore him for money to free us from this trap into which we were so cruelly decoyed. "'Shall I try Mr. Bevan first? "'He is a very pleasant sort of a gentleman,' said Mark. "'I think so. "'The few goods we brought here, and in which we spent our money, "'would produce something if sold,' resumed Martin, "'and whatever they realize shall be paid him instantly. "'But they can't be sold here.' "'There's nobody but corpses to buy him," said Mr. Tapley, "'shaking his head with a rueful air. "'And pigs?' "'Shall I tell him so?' and only ask him for money enough to enable us by the cheapest means to reach New York, or any port from which we may hope to get a passage home by serving in any capacity, explaining to him at the same time how I am connected, and that I will endeavour to repay him, even through my grandfather, immediately on our arrival in England? Why, to be sure, said Mark, he can only say no, and he may say yes, if you don't mind trying him, sir. Mind! exclaimed Martin. I am to blame for coming here, and I would do anything to get away. I grieve to think of the past. If I had taken your opinion sooner, Mark, we never should have been here, I am certain. Mr. Tapley was very much surprised at this admission, but protested with great vehemence that they would have been there all the same, and that he had set his heart upon coming to Eden from the first word he had ever heard of it. Martin then read him a letter to Mr. Bevan, which he had already prepared. It was frankly and ingenuously written, and described their situation without the least concealment, plainly stated the miseries they had undergone, and preferred their request in modest but straightforward terms. Mark highly commended it, and they determined to dispatch it by the next steamboat going the right way that might call to take in wood at Eden, where there was plenty of wood to spare. Not knowing how to address Mr. Bevan at his own place of abode, Martin superscribed it to the care of the memorable Mr. Norris of New York, and wrote upon the cover an entreaty that it might be forwarded without delay. More than a week elapsed before a boat appeared, but at length they were awakened very early one morning by the high-pressure snorting of the Esau Lodge, named after one of the most remarkable men in the country, who had been very eminent somewhere. Hurrying down to the landing-place, they got it safe on board, and, waiting anxiously to see the boat depart, stopped up the gangway, an instance of neglect which caused the captain of the Esau Lodge to wish he might be sifted fine as flour and whittled small as chips, that if they didn't come off that there fixing right to mark two, he'd spill em in the drink, whereby the captain metaphorically said he'd throw them in the river." They were not likely to receive an answer for eight or ten weeks at the earliest. In the meantime, they devoted such strength as they had to the attempted improvement of their land, to clearing some of it and preparing it for useful purposes. Monstrously defective as their farming was, still it was better than their neighbors, for Mark had some practical knowledge of such matters, 
and Martin learned of him, whereas the other settlers who remained upon the putrid swamp, a mere handful, and those withered by disease, appeared to have wandered there with the idea that husbandry was the natural gift of all mankind. They helped each other, after their own manner in these struggles, and in all others, but they worked as hopelessly and sadly as a gang of convicts in a penal settlement. Often at night, when Mark and Martin were alone, and lying down to sleep, they spoke of home, familiar places, houses, roads, and people whom they knew, sometimes in the lively hope of seeing them again, and sometimes with a sorrowful tranquillity, as if that hope were dead. It was a source of great amazement to Mark Tapley to find, pervading all these conversations, a singular alteration in Martin. "'I don't know what to make of him,' he thought one night. "'He ain't what I supposed. "'He don't think of himself half as much. "'I'll try him again. "'Asleep, sir?' "'No, Mark.' "'Thinking of home, sir?' "'Yes, Mark.' "'So was I, sir. "'I was wondering how Mr. Pinch and Mr. Pecksniff gets on now. "'Poor Tom,' said Martin thoughtfully. "'Weak-minded man, sir,' observed Mr. Tapley. "'Plays the organ for nothing, sir. "'Takes no care of himself.' "'I wish he took a little more, indeed,' said Martin. "'Though I don't know why I should. "'We shouldn't like him half as well, perhaps.' "'He gets put upon, sir,' hinted Mark. "'Yes,' said Martin, after a short silence. "'I know that, Mark.' "'He spoke so regretfully that his partner abandoned the theme "'and was silent for a short time until he had thought of another.' "'Ah, sir,' said Mark, with a sigh, "'dear me, you've ventured a good deal for a young lady's love.' "'I tell you what, I'm not so sure of that, Mark,' was the reply, "'so hastily and energetically spoken "'that Martin sat up in his bed to give it. "'I begin to be far from clear upon it. "'You may depend upon it, she is very unhappy. "'She has sacrificed her peace of mind. "'She has endangered her interests very much.' She can't run away from those who are jealous of her and opposed to her, as I have done. She has to endure, Mark, to endure without the possibility of action, poor girl. I begin to think that she has more to bear than ever I had. Upon my soul, I do. Mr. Tapley opened his eyes wide in the dark, but did not interrupt. And I'll tell you a secret, Mark, said Martin, since we are upon this subject. That ring— "'Which ring, sir?' Mark inquired, opening his eyes still wider. "'That ring she gave me when we parted, Mark. "'She bought it. "'Bought it knowing I was poor and proud. "'Heaven help me! "'Proud! "'And wanted money.' "'Who says so, sir?' asked Mark. "'I say so. "'I know it. "'I thought of it, my good fellow, hundreds of times while you were lying ill. "'And like a beast, I took it from her hand and wore it on my own.' and never dreamed of this, even at the moment when I parted with it, when some faint glimmering of the truth might surely have possessed me. "'But it's late,' said Martin, checking himself, "'and you are weak and tired, I know. You only talk to cheer me up. Good night. God bless you, Mark.' "'God bless you, sir. But I'm regularly defrauded,' thought Mr. Tapley, turning round with a happy face. "'It's a swindle. I never entered for this sort of service.' There will be no credit in being jolly with him. The time wore on, and other steamboats coming from the point on which their hopes were fixed arrived to take in wood, but still no answer to the letter. Rain, heat, foul slime, and noxious vapor, with all the ills and filthy things they bred, prevailed. The earth, the air, the vegetation, and the water that they drank all teemed with deadly properties. Their fellow passenger had lost two children long before, and buried now her last. Such things are much too common to be widely known or cared for. Smart citizens grow rich, and friendless victims smart and die, and are forgotten. That is all. At last a boat came panting up the ugly river, and stopped at Eden. Mark was waiting at the wood hut when it came, and had a letter handed to him from on board. He bore it off to Martin. They looked at one another, trembling. "'It feels heavy,' faltered Martin, and opening it, a little roll of dollar notes fell out upon the ground. What either of them said, or did, or felt, at first, neither of them knew. 
All Mark could ever tell was that he was at the river's bank again, out of breath, before the boat had gone, inquiring when it would retrace its track and put in there. The answer was, in ten or twelve days, notwithstanding which they began to get their goods together and to tie them up that very night. When this stage of excitement was passed, each of them believed, they found this out in talking of it afterwards, that he would surely die before the boat returned. They lived, however, and it came, after the lapse of three long, crawling weeks. At sunrise, on an autumn day, they stood upon her deck. "'Courage! We shall meet again!' cried Martin, waving his hand to two thin figures on the bank. "'In the old world!' "'Or in the next one,' added Mark below his breath, "'to see them standing side by side, so quiet, is a most the worst of all.' They looked at one another as the vessel moved away, and then looked backward at the spot from which it hurried fast. The log-house, with the open door and drooping trees about it, the stagnant morning mist and red sun dimly seen beyond, the vapour rising up from land and river, the quick stream making the loathsome banks it washed more flat and dull. How often they returned in dreams! How often it was happiness to wake and find them shadows that had vanished! End of chapter 33Chapter thirty four of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty four In which the travellers move homeward and encounter some distinguished characters upon the way. Among the passengers on board the steamboat, there was a faint gentleman sitting on a low camp-stool, with his legs on a high barrel of flour, as if he were looking at the prospect with his ankles, who attracted their attention speedily. He had straight black hair, parted up the middle of his head, and hanging down upon his coat, a little fringe of hair upon his chin, wore no neckcloth, a white hat, a suit of black, long in the sleeves and short in the legs, soiled brown stockings and laced shoes. His complexion, naturally muddy, was rendered muddier by too strict an economy of soap and water. And the same observation will apply to the washable part of his attire, which he might have changed with comfort to himself and gratification to his friends. He was about five and thirty, was crushed and jammed up in a heap under the shade of a large green cotton umbrella, and ruminated over his tobacco plug like a cow. He was not singular, to be sure, in these respects, for every gentleman on board appeared to have had a difference with his laundress, and to have left off washing himself in early youth. Every gentleman, too, was perfectly stopped up with tight plugging, and was dislocated in the greater part of his joints. But about this gentleman there was a peculiar air of sagacity and wisdom, which convinced Martin that he was no common character, and this turned out to be the case." "'How do you do, sir?' said a voice in Martin's ear. "'How do you do, sir?' said Martin. It was a tall, thin gentleman who spoke to him, with a carpet cap on, and a long, loose coat of green baize, ornamented about the pockets with black velvet. "'You air from Europe, sir?' "'I am,' said Martin. "'You air fortunate, sir.' Martin thought so, too, but he soon discovered that the gentleman and he attached different meanings to this remark. "'You air fortunate, sir, in having an opportunity of beholding our Elijah Pogram, sir.' "'Your Elijah Pogram,' said Martin, thinking it was all one word in a building of some sort. "'Yes, sir.' Martin tried to look as if he understood him, but he couldn't make it out. "'Yes, sir,' repeated the gentleman. "'Our Elijah Pogram, sir, is at this minute identically settin' by the engine biler. The gentleman under the umbrella put his right forefinger to his eyebrow, as if he were revolving schemes of state. "'That is Elijah Pogram, is it?' said Martin. "'Yes, sir,' replied the other. "'That is Elijah Pogram.' "'Dear me,' said Martin, "'I am astonished.' 
but he had not the least idea who this Elijah Pogram was, having never heard the name in all his life. "'If the biler of this vessel was to bust, sir,' said his new acquaintance, "'and to bust now, this would be a festival day in the calendar of despotism. "'Pretty nigh equal in, sir, in its effects upon the human race, "'our fourth of glorious July. "'Yes, sir, that is the Honourable Elijah Pogram, "'member of Congress, one of the masterminds of our country, sir. "'There is a brow, sir, there.' "'Quite remarkable,' said Martin. "'Yes, sir.' Our own immortal Chiggle, sir, is said to have observed, when he made the celebrated pogram statter in marble, which rose so much contest and prejudice in Europe, that the brow was more than mortal. This was before the pogram defiance, and was, therefore, a prediction, cruel, smart. "'What is the pogram defiance?' asked Martin, thinking perhaps it was the sign of a public house. "'An oration, sir,' returned his friend." "'Oh, to be sure,' cried Martin, "'what am I thinking of? "'It defied it defied the world, sir,' said the other gravely, "'defied the world in general, "'to compete with our country upon any hook, "'and developed our internal resources "'for making war upon the universal earth. "'You would like to know Elijah Pogram, sir?' "'If you please,' said Martin. "'Mr. Pogram,' said the stranger, "'Mr. Pogram having overheard every word of the dialogue, "'This is a gentleman from Europe, sir, from England, sir, "'but generous enemies may meet upon the neutral style of private life, I think.' "'The languid Mr. Pogram shook hands with Martin, "'like a clockwork figure that was just running down, "'but he made amends by chewing like one that was just wound up. "'Mr. Pogram,' said the introducer, "'is a public servant, sir. "'When Congress is recessed, he makes himself acquainted with those free United States of which he is the gifted son. It occurred to Martin that if the Honorable Elijah Pogram had stayed at home and sent his shoes upon a tour, they would have answered the same purpose, for they were the only part of him in a situation to see anything. In course of time, however, Mr. Pogram rose, and having ejected certain plugging consequences which would have impeded his articulation, took up a position where there was something to lean against, and began to talk to Martin, shading himself with a green umbrella all the time. As he began with the words, "'How do you like?' Martin took him up and said, "'The country, I presume?' "'Yes, sir,' said Elijah Pogram. A knot of passengers gathered round to hear what followed, and Martin heard his friend say, as he whispered to another friend and rubbed his hands, "'Pogram will smash him into sky-blue fits, I know.' "'Why,' said Martin, after a moment's hesitation, "'I have learned by experience that you take an unfair advantage of a stranger when you ask that question. "'You don't mean it to be answered except in one way. "'Now I don't choose to answer it in that way, for I cannot honestly answer it in that way, "'and therefore I would rather not answer it at all.' "'But Mr. Pogram was going to make a great speech in the next session about foreign relations, "'and was going to write strong articles on the subject.' And as he greatly favoured the free and independent custom, a very harmless and agreeable one, of procuring information of any sort in any kind of confidence, and afterwards perverting it publicly in any manner that happened to suit him, he had determined to get at Martin's opinion somehow or other. For if he could have got nothing out of him, he would have had to invent it for him, and that would have been laborious. He made a mental note of his answer, and went in again. "'You are from Eden, sir.' "'How did you like Eden?' "'Martin said what he thought of that part of the country in pretty strong terms. "'It is strange,' said Pogram, looking round upon the group, "'this hatred of our country and her institutions. "'This national antipathy is deeply rooted in the British mind.' "'Good heavens, sir!' cried Martin. "'Is the Eden Land Corporation, with Mr. Scatter at its head, "'and all the misery it has worked at its door, an institution of America?' "'a part of any form of government that ever was known or heard of?' "'I consider the cause of this to be,' said Pogram, "'looking round again and taking himself up where Martin had interrupted him, "'partly jealousy and prejudice, "'and partly the natural unfitness of the British people "'to appreciate the exalted institutions of our native land. "'I expect, sir,' turning to Martin again, "'that a gentleman named Chollop happened in upon you "'during your location in the town of Eden.' "'Yes,' answered Martin. 
"'But my friend can answer this better than I can, for I was very ill at the time. "'Mark, the gentleman is speaking of Mr. Chollop.' "'Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I see him,' observed Mark. "'A splendid example of our native raw material, sir?' said Pogram, interrogatively. "'Indeed, sir,' cried Mark. The Honourable Elijah Pogram glanced at his friends as though he would have said, "'Observe this. See what follows.' and they rendered tribute to the pogrom genius by a gentle murmur. "'Our fellow-countryman is a model of a man, quite fresh from nature's mould,' said Pogram, with enthusiasm. "'He is a true-born child of this free hemisphere, verdant as the mountains of our country, bright and flowing as our mineral licks, unspiled by withering conventionalities, as air our broad and boundless perirers. Rough he may be, so air our bars. Wild he may be, so air our bufflers. But he is a child of nature and a child of freedom, and his boastful answer to the despot and the tyrant is that his bright home is in the set and sun. Part of this referred to Chollop, and part to a western postmaster who, being a public defaulter not very long before, a character not at all uncommon in America, had been removed from office, and on whose behalf Mr. Pogram, he voted for Pogram, had thundered the last sentence from his seat in Congress at the head of an unpopular president. It told brilliantly, for the bystanders were delighted, and one of them said to Martin that he guessed he had now seen something of the eloquential aspect of our country, and was chawed up pretty small. Mr. Pogram waited until his hearers were calm again before he said to Mark, "'You do not seem to coincide, sir.' "'Why,' said Mark, "'I didn't like him much, and that's the truth, sir. "'I thought he was a bully, "'and I didn't admire his carrying them murderous little persuaders "'and being so ready to use them. "'It's singular,' said Pogram, "'lifting his umbrella high enough to look all round from under it. "'It's strange. "'You observe the settled opposition to our institutions "'which pervades the British mind.' "'What an extraordinary people you are!' cried Martin. "'Are Mr. Chollop and the class he represents an institution here? "'Are pistols with revolving barrels, sword-sticks, bowie-knives, and such things, "'institutions on which you pride yourselves? "'Are bloody duels, brutal combats, savage assaults, "'shooting down and stabbing in the streets, your institutions? "'Why, I shall hear next that dishonor and fraud are among the institutions of the Great Republic.' The moment the words passed his lips, the Honourable Elijah Pogram looked round again. "'This morbid hatred of our institutions,' he observed, "'is quite a study for the psychological observer. "'He's alluding to repudiation now.' "'Oh, you may make anything an institution if you like,' said Martin, laughing, "'and I confess you had me there, for you certainly have made that one.' "'but the greater part of these things are one institution with us, "'and we call it by the generic name of Old Bailey.' "'The bell being rung for dinner at this moment, "'everybody ran away into the cabin, "'whither the Honourable Elijah Pogram fled with such precipitation "'that he forgot his umbrella was up, "'and fixed it so tightly in the cabin door "'that it could neither be let down nor got out. "'For a minute or so this accident created a perfect rebellion "'among the hungry passengers behind.' who, seeing the dishes, and hearing the knives and forks at work, well knew what would happen unless they got there instantly, and were nearly mad, while several virtuous citizens at the table were in deadly peril of choking themselves in their unnatural efforts to get rid of all the meat before these others came. They carried the umbrella by storm, however, and rushed in at the breach. The Honourable Elijah Pogram and Martin found themselves, after a severe struggle, side by side, as they might have come together in the pit of a London theatre, and for four whole minutes afterwards Pogram was snapping up great blocks of everything he could get hold of, like a raven. When he had taken this unusually protracted dinner, he began to talk to Martin, and begged him not to have the least delicacy in speaking with perfect freedom to him, for he was a calm philosopher, which Martin was extremely glad to hear, for he had begun to speculate on Elijah being a disciple of that other school of Republican philosophy, whose noble sentiments are carved with knives upon a pupil's body, and written not with pen and ink, but tar and feathers. 
"'What do you think of my countrymen who are present, sir?' inquired Elijah Pogram. "'Oh, very pleasant,' said Martin. "'They were a very pleasant party. "'No man had spoken a word. "'Every one had been intent, as usual, on his own private gorging, "'and the greater part of the company were decidedly dirty feeders. "'The Honourable Elijah Pogram looked at Martin as if he thought, "'You don't mean that, I know,' and he was soon confirmed in this opinion. Sitting opposite to them was a gentleman in a high state of tobacco, who wore quite a little beard, composed of the overflowing of that weed, as they had dried about his mouth and chin, so common an ornament that it would scarcely have attracted Martin's observation, but that this good citizen, burning to assert his equality against all comers, sucked his knife for some moments, and made a cut with it at the butter, just as Martin was in the act of taking some. There was a juiciness about the deed that might have sickened a scavenger. When Elijah Pogram, to whom this was an everyday incident, saw that Martin put the plate away and took no butter, he was quite delighted, and said, "'Well, the morbid hatred of you British to the institutions of our country is astonishing!' "'Upon my life!' cried Martin, in his turn. "'This is the most wonderful community that ever existed.' A man deliberately makes a hog of himself, and that's an institution. "'We have no time to acquire forms, sir,' said Elijah Pogram. "'Acquire!' cried Martin. "'But it's not a question of acquiring anything. "'It's a question of losing the natural politeness of a savage, "'and that instinctive good breeding which admonishes one man not to offend and disgust another. "'Don't you think that man over the way, for instance, naturally knows better?' but considers it a very fine and independent thing to be a brute in small matters. "'He is a native of our country, and is naturally bright and spry, of course,' said Mr. Pogram. "'Now observe what this comes to, Mr. Pogram,' pursued Martin. "'The mass of your countrymen begin by stubbornly neglecting little social observances which have nothing to do with gentility, custom, usage, government, or country, but are acts of common, decent, natural human politeness.' You abet them in this by resenting all attacks upon their social offences as if they were a beautiful national feature. From disregarding small obligations, they come in regular course to disregard great ones, and so refuse to pay their debts. What they may do, or what they may refuse to do next, I don't know, but any man may see, if he will, that it will be something following in natural succession, and a part of one great growth which is rotten at the root. The mind of Mr. Pogram was too philosophical to see this, so they went on deck again, where, resuming his former post, he chewed until he was in a lethargic state amounting to insensibility. After a weary voyage of several days, they came again to that same wharf where Mark had been so nearly left behind on the night of starting for Eden. Captain Kedgick, the landlord, was standing there, and was greatly surprised to see them coming from the boat. "'Why, what the tarnal cried the captain. "'Well, I do admire it this, I do. "'We can stay at your house until tomorrow, Captain, I suppose,' said Martin. "'I reckon you can stay there for a twelve-month, if you like,' retorted Kedgett coolly. "'But our people won't best like your coming back.' "'Won't like it, Captain Kedgett said Martin. "'They did expect you was a-going to settle,' Kedgett answered, as he shook his head. "'They've been took in, you can't deny.' "'What do you mean?' cried Martin. "'You didn't ought to have received him,' said the captain. "'No, you didn't.' "'My good friend,' returned Martin, "'did I want to receive them? "'Was it any act of mine? "'Didn't you tell me they would rile up "'and that I should be flayed like a wild cat "'and threaten all kinds of vengeance "'if I didn't receive them?' "'I don't know about that,' returned the captain. "'But when our people's frills is out, "'they're starched up pretty stiff, I tell you.' With that, he fell into the rear to walk with Mark, while Martin and Elijah Pogram went on to the National. "'We've come back alive, you see,' said Mark. "'It ain't the thing I did expect,' the captain grumbled. "'A man ain't got no right to be a public man unless he meets the public views. Our fashionable people wouldn't have attended his levy if they had known it.' Nothing mollified the captain, who persisted in taking it very ill that they had not both died in Eden." The boarders at the National felt strongly on the subject, too, but it happened by good fortune that they had not much time to think about this grievance, 
for it was suddenly determined to pounce upon the Honourable Elijah Pogram and give him a levy forthwith. As the general evening meal of the house was over before the arrival of the boat, Martin, Mark, and Pogram were taking tea and fixings at the public table by themselves when the deputation entered to announce this honour, consisting of six gentlemen boarders and a very shrill boy. "'Sir,' said the spokesman, "'Mr. Pogram!' cried the shrill boy. The spokesman, thus reminded of the shrill boy's presence, introduced him. "'Dr. Ginnery Dunkel, sir, a gentleman of great poetical elements. He has recently joined us here, sir, and is an acquisition to us, sir, I do assure you. Yes, sir, Mr. Jod, sir, Mr. Izzard, sir, Mr. Julius Bibb, sir. "'Julius Washington Merriweather Bibb,' said the gentleman himself, to himself. "'I beg your pardon, sir, excuse me. "'Mr. Julius Washington Merriweather Bibb, sir. "'A gentleman in the lumber line, sir, and much esteemed. "'Colonel Groper, sir, Professor Piper, sir. "'My own name, sir, is Oscar Buffum.' "'Each man took one slide forward as he was named, "'butted at the Honourable Elijah Pogram with his head, "'shook hands, and slid back again.' The introductions being completed, the spokesman resumed. "'Sir! Mr. Pogram!' cried the shrill boy. "'Perhaps,' said the spokesman, with a hopeless look, "'you will be so good, Dr. Ginnery Dunkel, "'as to charge yourself with the execution of our little office, sir.' As there was nothing the shrill boy desired more, he immediately stepped forward. On the whole, it was considered to have been the severest mental exercise ever heard in the National Hotel. Tears stood in the shrill boy's eyes several times, and the whole company observed that their heads ached with the effort, as well they might. When it at last became necessary to release Elijah Pogram from the corner, and the committee saw him safely back again to the next room, they were fervent in their admiration. "'Which,' said Mr. Buffum, "'must have vent, or it will bust.' "'To you, Mr. Pogram, I am grateful. "'Towards you, sir, I am inspired with lofty veneration and with deep emotion. "'The sentiment to which I would propose to give expression, sir, is this. "'May you ever be as firm, sir, as your marble statter. "'May it ever be as great a terror to its enemies as you.' "'There is some reason to suppose that it was rather terrible to its friends.' being a statue of the elevated or goblin school, in which the Honourable Elijah Pogram was represented as in a very high wind, with his hair all standing on end, and his nostrils blown wide open. But Mr. Pogram thanked his friend and countryman for the aspiration to which he had given utterance, and the committee, after another solemn shaking of hands, retired to bed, except the doctor, who immediately repaired to the newspaper office, and there wrote a short poem suggested by the events of the evening, beginning with fourteen stars, and headed, A Fragment, suggested by witnessing the Honourable Elijah Pogram engaged in a philosophical disputation with three of Columbia's fairest daughters, by Dr. Ginnery Dunkel of Troy. If Pogram was as glad to get to bed as Martin was, he must have been well rewarded for his labours. They started off again next day, Martin and Mark previously disposing of their goods to the storekeepers of whom they had purchased them for anything they would bring, and were fellow travellers to within a short distance of New York. When Pogram was about to leave them, he grew thoughtful, and after pondering for some time, took Martin aside. "'We are going to part, sir,' said Pogram. "'Pray don't distress yourself,' said Martin. "'We must bear it.' "'It ain't that, sir,' returned Pogram, not at all. "'But I should wish you to accept a copy of my oration.' "'Thank you,' said Martin. "'You are very good. I shall be most happy.' "'It ain't quite that, sir, neither,' resumed Pogram. "'Are you bold enough to introduce a copy into your country?' "'Certainly,' said Martin. "'Why not?' "'Its sentiments are strong, sir,' hinted Pogram darkly. "'That makes no difference,' said Martin. "'I'll take a dozen, if you like.' "'No, sir,' retorted Pogram, "'not a dozen. That is more than I require. "'If you are content to run the hazard, sir, "'here is one for your Lord Chancellor,' producing it, "'and one for your Principal Secretary of State. "'I should wish them to see it, sir, "'as expressing what my opinions are, "'that they may not plead ignorance at a future time, 
"'But don't get into danger, sir, on my account.' "'There is not the least danger, I assure you,' said Martin. So he put the pamphlets in his pocket, and they parted. Mr. Bevan had written in his letter that at a certain time, which fell out happily just then, he would be at a certain hotel in the city, anxiously expecting to see them. To this place they repaired without a moment's delay. They had the satisfaction of finding him within, and of being received by their good friend with his own warmth and heartiness. "'I am truly sorry and ashamed,' said Martin, "'to have begged of you. "'But look at us. "'See what we are, and judge to what we are reduced.' "'So far from claiming to have done you any service,' returned the other, "'I reproach myself with having been, unwittingly, "'the original cause of your misfortunes. "'I no more supposed you would go to Eden "'on such representations as you received, "'or indeed that you would do anything but be dispossessed "'by the readiest means of your idea "'that fortunes were so easily made here, "'than I thought of going to Eden myself.' "'The fact is, I closed with the thing in a mad and sanguine manner,' said Martin, "'and the less said about it, the better for me. "'Mark here hadn't a voice in the matter.' "'Well, but he hadn't a voice in any other matter, had he?' "'returned Mr. Bevan, laughing with an air that showed his understanding of Mark and Martin, too. "'Not a very powerful one, I am afraid,' said Martin, with a blush. "'But live and learn, Mr. Bevan. Nearly die and learn. We learn the quicker.' "'Now,' said their friend, "'about your plans. "'You mean to return home at once?' "'Oh, I think so,' returned Martin hastily, "'for he turned pale at the thought of any other suggestion. "'That is your opinion, too, I hope. "'Unquestionably, for I don't know why you ever came here, "'though it's not such an unusual case, I am sorry to say, "'that we need go any farther into that. "'You don't know that the ship in which you came over "'with our friend General Fladdock is in port, of course.' "'Indeed,' said Martin, "'yes, and is advertised to sail to-morrow. "'This was tempting news, but tantalizing, too, "'for Martin knew that his getting any employment "'on board a ship of that class was hopeless. "'The money in his pocket would not pay one-fourth "'of the sum he had already borrowed, "'and if it had been enough for their passage money, "'he could hardly have resolved to spend it. "'He explained this to Mr. Bevan "'and stated what their project was.' "'Why, that's as wild as Eden every bit,' returned his friend. "'You must take your passage like a Christian, "'at least as like a Christian as a four-cabin passenger can, "'and owe me a few more dollars than you intend. "'If Mark will go down to the ship and see what passengers there are, "'and finds that you can go in her without being actually suffocated, "'my advice is go. "'You and I will look about us in the meantime. "'We won't call at the Norrises unless you like, "'and we will all three dine together in the afternoon.' Martin had nothing to express but gratitude, and so it was arranged. But he went out of the room after Mark, and advised him to take their passage in the screw, though they lay upon the bare deck, which Mr. Tapley, who needed no entreaty on the subject, readily promised to do. When he and Martin met again, and were alone, he was in high spirits, and evidently had something to communicate, in which he gloried very much. "'I've done Mr. Bevan, sir,' said Mark." "'Done, Mr. Bevan,' repeated Martin. "'The cook of the screw went and got married yesterday, sir,' said Mr. Tapley. Martin looked at him for farther explanation. "'And when I got on board, and the word was passed that it was me,' said Mark, "'the mate, he comes and asks me whether I'd engaged to take this said cook's place upon the passage home. "'For you're used to it,' he says. "'You were always a-cooking for everybody on your passage out, and so I was,' said Mark." "'although I never cooked before. I'll take my oath.' "'What did you say?' demanded Martin. "'Say?' cried Mark. "'That I'd take anything I could get. "'If that's so,' says the mate, "'why bring a glass of rum, which they brought according. "'And my wages, sir,' said Mark, in high glee, "'pays your passage, and I put the rolling pin in your berth to take it. "'It's the easy one up in the corner. "'And there we are. Rule Britannia, and Britain strike home.' "'There never was such a good fellow as you are,' cried Martin, seizing him by the hand. "'But what do you mean by doing Mr. Bevan, Mark?' "'Why, don't you see?' said Mark. "'We don't tell him, you know. "'We take his money, but we don't spend it, and we don't keep it. "'What we do is write him a little note explaining this engagement, "'and roll it up and leave it at the bar to be given to him after we are gone, don't you see?' "'Martin's delight in this idea was not inferior to Mark's. 
It was all done as he proposed. They passed a cheerful evening, slept at the hotel, left the letter as arranged, and went off to the ship betimes next morning, with such light hearts as the weight of their past miseries engendered. "'Good-bye! A hundred thousand times good-bye!' said Martin to their friend. "'How shall I remember all your kindness? How shall I ever thank you?' "'If you ever become a rich man, or a powerful one,' returned his friend, "'you shall try to make your government more careful of its subjects when they roam abroad to live. "'Tell it what you know of emigration in your own case, "'and impress upon it how much suffering may be prevented with a little pains. "'Cheerily, lads, cheerily! "'Anchor weighed, ship in full sail, her sturdy bowsprit pointing true to England, "'America a cloud upon the sea behind them.' "'Why, Cook, what are you thinking of so steadily?' said Martin. "'Why, I was a-thinking, sir,' returned Mark, "'that if I was a painter, and was called upon to paint the American eagle, how should I do it?' "'Paint it as like an eagle as you could, I suppose.' "'No,' said Mark, "'that wouldn't do for me, sir. "'I should want to draw it like a bat, for its short-sightedness, "'like a bantam for its bragging.' like a magpie for its honesty, like a peacock for its vanity, like an ostrich for its putting its head in the mud and thinking nobody sees it, and like a phoenix for its power of springing from the ashes of its faults and vices and soaring up anew into the sky, said Martin. Well, Mark, let us hope so. End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit》by Charles Dickens《Chapter Thirty Five Arriving in England, Martin Witnesses a Ceremony from which he derives the cheering information that he has not been forgotten in his absence. It was midday and high water in the English port for which the screw was bound, when, borne in gallantly upon the fullness of the tide, she let go her anchor in the river. Bright as the scene was, fresh and full of motion, airy, free, and sparkling, it was nothing to the life and exultation in the breasts of the two travellers, at sight of the old churches, roofs, and darkened chimney-stacks of home. The distant roar that swelled up hoarsely from the busy streets was music in their ears. The lines of people gazing from the wharves were friends held dear. The canopy of smoke that overhung the town was brighter and more beautiful to them than if the richest silks of Persia had been waving in the air and though the water going on its glistening track turned ever and again aside to dance and sparkle round great ships and heave them up, and leaped from off the blades of oars, a shower of diving diamonds, and wantoned with the idle boats and swiftly passed in many a sportive chase through obdurate old iron rings set deep into the stonework of the quays, not even it was half so buoyant and so restless as their fluttering hearts, when yearning to set foot once more on native ground. A year had passed since those same spires and roofs had faded from their eyes. It seemed to them a dozen years. Some trifling changes here and there they called to mind, and wondered that they were so few and slight. In health and fortune, prospect and resource, they came back poorer men than they had gone away. But it was home, and though home is a name, a word, it is a strong one, "'stronger than magician ever spoke or spirit answered to in strongest conjuration. "'Being set ashore with very little money in their pockets "'and no definite plan of operation in their heads, "'they sought out a cheap tavern where they regaled upon a smoking steak "'and certain flowing mugs of beer, "'as only men just landed from the sea can revel in the generous dainties of the earth. "'When they had feasted, as two grateful-tempered giants might have done, they stirred the fire, drew back the glowing curtain from the window, and making each a sofa for himself, by union of the great unwieldy chairs, gazed blissfully into the street. Even the street was made a fairy street, by being half hidden in an atmosphere of steak and strong stout stand-up English beer. 
for on the window-glass hung such a mist that Mr. Tapley was obliged to rise and wipe it with his handkerchief before the passengers appeared like common mortals. And even then a spiral little cloud went curling up from their two glasses of hot grog, which nearly hid them from each other. It was one of those unaccountable little rooms which are never seen anywhere but in a tavern, and are supposed to have got into taverns by reason of the facilities afforded to the architect for getting drunk while engaged in their construction. It had more corners in it than the brain of an obstinate man, was full of mad closets into which nothing could be put that was not specially invented and made for that purpose, had mysterious shelvings and bulkheads, and indications of staircases in the ceiling, and was elaborately provided with a bell that rung in the room itself, about two feet from the handle, and had no connection whatever with any other part of the establishment. It was a little below the pavement, and abutted close upon it, so that passengers grated against the window-panes with their buttons, and scraped it with their baskets, and fearful boys, suddenly coming between a thoughtful guest and the light, derided him, or put out their tongues as if he were a physician, or made white knobs on the ends of their noses by flattening the same against the glass, and vanished awfully like spectres. Martin and Mark sat looking at the people as they passed, debating every now and then what their first step should be. "'We want to see Miss Mary, of course,' said Mark. "'Of course,' said Martin. "'But I don't know where she is. Not having had the heart to write in our distress, you yourself thought silence most advisable, and consequently, never having heard from her since we left New York the first time, I don't know where she is, my good fellow.' "'My opinion is, sir,' returned Mark, "'that what we've got to do is to travel straight to the Dragon. "'There's no need for you to go there where you're known unless you like. "'You may stop ten miles short of it. "'I'll go on. "'Mrs. Lupin will tell me all the news. "'Mr. Pinch will give me every information that we want, "'and right glad Mr. Pinch will be to do it. "'My proposal is to set off walking this afternoon, "'to stop when we are tired, to get a lift when we can, "'to walk when we can't, to do it at once and do it cheap.' "'Unless we do it cheap, we shall have some difficulty in doing it at all,' said Martin, pulling out the bank and telling it over in his hand. "'The greater reason for losing no time, sir,' replied Mark. "'Whereas, when you've seen the young lady and know what state of mind the old gentleman's in and all about it, then you'll know what to do next.' "'No doubt,' said Martin. "'You are quite right.' They were raising their glasses to their lips when their hands stopped midway, and their gaze was arrested by a figure which slowly, very slowly and reflectively, passed the window at that moment. Mr. Pecksniff, placid, calm but proud, honestly proud, dressed with peculiar care, smiling with even more than usual blandness, pondering on the beauties of his art with a mild abstraction from all sordid thoughts, and gently travelling across the disk as if he were a figure in a magic lantern. As Mr. Pecksniff passed, a person coming in the opposite direction stopped to look after him with great interest and respect, almost with veneration. And the landlord, bouncing out of the house as if he had seen him too, joined this person and spoke to him and shook his head gravely, and looked after Mr. Pecksniff likewise. Martin and Mark sat staring at each other as if they could not believe it. But there stood the landlord and the other man still. In spite of the indignation with which this glimpse of Mr. Pecksniff had inspired him, Martin could not help laughing heartily. Neither could Mark. "'We must inquire into this,' said Martin. "'Ask the landlord in, Mark.' Mr. Tapley retired for that purpose, and immediately returned with their large-headed host in safe convoy. "'Pray, landlord,' said Martin, "'who is that gentleman who passed just now and whom you were looking after?' The landlord poked the fire as if, in his desire to make the most of his answer, he had become indifferent even to the price of coals, and putting his hands in his pockets, said, after inflating himself to give still further effect to his reply, "'That, gentlemen, is the great Mr. Pecksniff, the celebrated architect, gentlemen.' He looked from one to the other while he said it, as if he were ready to assist the first man who might be overcome by the intelligence." "'The great Mr. Pecksniff, the celebrated architect, gentlemen,' said the landlord, "'has come down here to help lay the first stone of a new and splendid public building.' "'Is it to be built from his designs?' asked Martin. 
"'The great Mr. Pecksniff, the celebrated architect gentleman,' returned the landlord, who seemed to have an unspeakable delight in the repetition of these words, "'carried off the first premium and will erect the building.' "'Who lays the stone?' asked Martin. "'Our member has come down express,' returned the landlord. "'No scrubs would do for no such a purpose. "'Nothing less would satisfy our directors than our member in the House of Commons, "'who has returned upon the gentlemanly interest.' "'Which interest is that?' asked Martin. "'What? Don't you know?' returned the landlord. "'It was quite clear the landlord didn't. "'They always told him at election time that it was the gentlemanly side, "'and he immediately put on his top boots and voted for it. "'When does the ceremony take place?' asked Martin. "'This day,' replied the landlord. "'Then pulling out his watch, he added impressively, "'Almost this minute.' Martin hastily inquired whether there was any possibility of getting in to witness it, and finding that there would be no objection to the admittance of any decent person, unless indeed the ground were full, hurried off with Mark as hard as they could go. They were fortunate enough to squeeze themselves into a famous corner on the ground, where they could see all that passed without much dread of being beheld by Mr. Pecksniff in return. They were not a minute too soon, for as they were in the act of congratulating each other, a great noise was heard at some distance, and everybody looked towards the gate. Several ladies prepared their pocket-handkerchiefs for waving, and a stray teacher belonging to the charity school, being much cheered by mistake, was immensely groaned at when detected. "'Perhaps he has Tom Pinch with him,' Martin whispered Mr. Tapley. "'It would be rather too much of a treat for him, wouldn't it, sir?' whispered Mr. Tapley in return." There was no time to discuss the probabilities either way, for the charity school, in clean linen, came filing in two and two, so much to the self-approval of all the people present who didn't subscribe to it, that many of them shed tears. A band of music followed, led by a conscientious drummer who never left off. Then came a great many gentlemen with wands in their hands and bows on their breasts, whose share in the proceedings did not appear to be distinctly laid down, and who trod upon each other and blocked up the entry for a considerable period. These were followed by the mayor and corporation, all clustering round the member for the gentlemanly interest, who had the great Mr. Pecksniff, the celebrated architect, on his right hand, and conversed with him familiarly as they came along. Then the ladies waved their handkerchiefs and the gentlemen their hats, and the charity children shrieked, and the member for the gentlemanly interest bowed. Silence being restored, the member for the gentlemanly interest rubbed his hands and wagged his head, and looked about him pleasantly, and there was nothing this member did at which some lady or other did not burst into an ecstatic waving of her pocket-handkerchief. When he looked up at the stone, they said, "'How graceful!' When he peeped into the hole, they said, "'How condescending!' When he chatted with the mayor, they said, "'How easy!' When he folded his arms, they cried with one accord, "'How statesmanlike!' Mr. Pecksniff was observed, too, closely. When he talked to the mayor, they said, "'Oh, really, what a courtly man he was!' When he laid his hand upon the mason's shoulder, giving him directions, how pleasant his demeanour to the working classes! Just the sort of man who made their toil a pleasure to them, poor dear souls! But now a silver trowel was brought, and when the member for the gentlemanly interest, tucking up his coat-sleeve, did a little sleight of hand with the mortar. The air was rent, so loud was the applause. The workmanlike manner in which he did it was amazing. No one could conceive where such a gentlemanly creature could have picked the knowledge up. When he had made a kind of dirt pie under the direction of the mason, they brought a little vase containing coins, the which the member for the gentlemanly interest jingled, as if he were going to conjure. Whereat they said, How droll! How cheerful! What a flow of spirits! This put into its place, an ancient scholar read the inscription, which was in Latin, not in English, that would never do. It gave great satisfaction, especially every time there was a good long substantive in the third declension, ablative case, with an adjective to match, at which periods the assembly became very tender, and were much affected. And now the stone was lowered down into its place, amidst the shouting of the concourse. When it was firmly fixed— the member for the gentlemanly interest struck upon it thrice with the handle of the trowel, as if inquiring, with a touch of humour, whether anybody was at home. 
Mr. Pecksniff then unrolled his plans, prodigious plans they were, and people gathered round to look at and admire them. Martin, who had been fretting himself, quite unnecessarily, as Mark thought, during the whole of these proceedings, could no longer restrain his impatience, but stepping forward among several others, looked straight over the shoulder of the unconscious Mr. Pecksniff at the designs and plans he had unrolled. He returned to Mark, boiling with rage. "'Why, what's the matter, sir?' cried Mark. "'Matter? This is my building!' "'Your building, sir,' said Mark. "'My grammar school! I invented it! I did it all! He has only put four windows in the villain and spoilt it!' Mark could hardly believe it at first, but being assured that it was really so, actually held him to prevent his interference foolishly until his temporary heat was passed. In the meantime, the member addressed the company on the gratifying deed which he had just performed. He said that since he had sat in Parliament to represent the gentlemanly interest of that town, and he might add the lady interest, he hoped, besides pocket-handkerchiefs, it had been his pleasant duty to come among them and to raise his voice on their behalf in another place, pocket-handkerchiefs and laughter, often. But he had never come among them, and had never raised his voice with half such pure, such deep, such unalloyed delight as now. The present occasion, he said, will ever be memorable to me, not only for the reasons I have assigned, but because it has afforded me an opportunity of becoming personally known to a gentleman. Here he pointed the trowel at Mr. Pecksniff, who was greeted with vociferous cheering, and laid his hand upon his heart. To a gentleman who, I am happy to believe, will reap both distinction and profit from this field, whose fame had previously penetrated to me, as to whose ears has it not, but whose intellectual countenance I never had the distinguished honour to behold until this day, and whose intellectual conversation I had never before the improving pleasure to enjoy. Everybody seemed very glad of this, and applauded more than ever. "'But I hope my honourable friend,' said the gentlemanly member, "'of course,' he added, "'if he will allow me to call him so, "'and of course Mr. Pecksniff bowed, "'will give me many opportunities of cultivating the knowledge of him, "'and that I may have the extraordinary gratification of reflecting, "'in after-time, that I laid on this day two first stones, "'both belonging to structures which shall last my life.' "'Great cheering again!' All this time Martin was cursing Mr. Pecksniff uphill and down dale. "'My friends,' said Mr. Pecksniff in reply, "'my duty is to build, not speak, to act, not talk, to deal with marble, stone, and brick, not language. I am very much affected. God bless you.' This address, pumped out apparently from Mr. Pecksniff's very heart, brought the enthusiasm to its highest pitch. The pocket-handkerchiefs were waved again. The charity children were admonished to grow up Pecksniffs, every boy among them. The corporation, gentlemen with wands, member for the gentlemanly interest, all cheered for Mr. Pecksniff. Three cheers for Mr. Pecksniff! Three more for Mr. Pecksniff! Three more for Mr. Pecksniff, gentlemen, if you please! One more gentleman for Mr. Pecksniff, and let it be a good one to finish with! In short, Mr. Pecksniff was supposed to have done a great work, and was very kindly, courteously, and generously rewarded. When the procession moved away, and Martin and Mark were left almost alone upon the ground, his merits and a desire to acknowledge them formed a common topic. He was only second to the gentlemanly member. "'Compare the fellow's situation to-day with ours,' said Martin bitterly. "'Lord bless you, sir,' cried Mark. "'What's the use? "'Some architects are clever at making foundations, "'and some architects are clever at building on them when they're made. "'But it'll all come right in the end, sir. "'It'll all come right.' "'And in the meantime?' began Martin. "'In the meantime, as you say, sir, "'we have a deal to do and far to go, "'so sharp's the word and jolly.' "'You are the best master in the world, Mark,' said Martin. "'And I will not be a bad scholar if I can help it. "'I am resolved.' So come, best foot foremost, old fellow. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36, Part 1 of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens Chapter 36 Tom Pinch Departs to Seek His Fortune What He Finds at Starting Part 1 Oh, what a different town Salisbury was in Tom Pinch's eyes, to be sure, when the substantial peck sniff of his heart melted away into an idle dream. He possessed the same faith in the wonderful shops, the same intensified appreciation of the mystery and wickedness of the place, made the same exalted estimate of its wealth, population, and resources, and yet it was not the old city nor anything like it. He walked into the market while they were getting breakfast ready for him at the inn, and though it was the same market as of old, crowded by the same buyers and sellers, brisk with the same business, noisy with the same confusion of tongues and cluttering of fowls and coops, fair with the same display of rolls of butter, newly made, set forth in linen cloths of dazzling whiteness, green with the same fresh snow of dewy vegetables, dainty with the same array in Higgler's baskets of small shaving glasses, laces, braces, trouser straps, and hardware, savory with the same unstinted show of delicate pig's feet, and pies made precious by the pork that once had walked upon them, still it was strangely changed to Tom. For in the centre of the market-place he missed a statue he had set up there, as in all other places of his personal resort, and it looked cold and bare without that ornament. The change lay no deeper than this, for Tom was far from being sage enough to know that having been disappointed in one man, it would have been a strictly rational and eminently wise proceeding to have revenged himself upon mankind in general by mistrusting them one and all. Indeed, this piece of justice, though it is upheld by the authority of divers profound poets and honourable men, bears a nearer resemblance to the justice of that good vizier in the Thousand and One Nights, who issues orders for the destruction of all the porters in Baghdad, because one of that unfortunate fraternity is supposed to have misconducted himself, than to any logical, not to say Christian, system of conduct known to the world in later times. Tom had so long been used to steep the pecksniff of his fancy in his tea, and spread him out upon his toast, and take him as a relish with his beer, that he made but a poor breakfast on the first morning after his expulsion. Nor did he much improve his appetite for dinner by seriously considering his own affairs, and taking counsel thereon with his friend, the organist's assistant. The organist's assistant gave it as his decided opinion that whatever Tom did he must go to London, for there was no place like it, which may be true in the main, though hardly perhaps in itself a sufficient reason for Tom's going there. But Tom had thought of London before, and had coupled with it thoughts of his sister, and of his old friend John Westlock, whose advice he naturally felt disposed to seek in this important crisis of his fortunes. To London, therefore, he resolved to go, and he went away to the coach office at once to secure his place. The coach, being already full, he was obliged to postpone his departure until the next night. But even this circumstance had its bright side as well as its dark one, for though it threatened to reduce his poor purse with unexpected country charges, it afforded him an opportunity of writing to Mrs. Lupin and appointing his box to be brought to the old finger-post at the old time, which would enable him to take that treasure with him to the metropolis and save the expense of its carriage. So, said Tom, comforting himself, it's very nearly as broad as it's long. And it cannot be denied that when he had made up his mind to even this extent, he felt an unaccustomed sense of freedom, a vague and indistinct impression of holiday-making, which was very luxurious. He had his moments of depression and anxiety, and they were, with good reason, pretty numerous. But still, it was wonderfully pleasant to reflect that he was his own master and could plan and scheme for himself. It was startling thrilling, vast, difficult to understand. It was a stupendous truth, teeming with responsibility and self-distrust. But in spite of all his cares, it gave a curious relish to the viands at the inn, and interposed a dreamy haze between him and his prospects, in which they sometimes showed to magical advantage. In this unsettled state of mind, Tom went once more to bed in the low four-poster, 
to the same immovable surprise of the effigies of the former landlord and the fat ox, and in this condition passed the whole of the succeeding day. When the coach came round at last, with London blazoned in letters of gold upon the boot, it gave Tom such a turn that he was half disposed to run away. But he didn't do it, for he took his seat upon the box instead, and looking down upon the four greys, felt as if he were another grey himself, or at all events a part of the turnout, and was quite confused by the novelty and splendour of his situation. And really it might have confused a less modest man than Tom to find himself sitting next that coachman, for of all the swells that ever flourished a whip professionally he might have been elected emperor. He didn't handle his gloves like another man, but put them on, even when he was standing on the pavement quite detached from the coach, as if the four greys were, somehow or other, at the ends of the fingers. It was the same with his hat. He did things with his hat which nothing but an unlimited knowledge of horses and the wildest freedom of the road could ever have made him perfect in. Valuable little parcels were brought to him with particular instructions, and he pitched them into this hat and stuck it on again as if the laws of gravity did not admit of such an event as its being knocked off or blown off, and nothing like an accident could befall it. The guard, too. Seventy breezy miles a day were written in his very whiskers. His manners were a canter, his conversation a round trot. He was a fast coach upon a downhill turnpike road. He was all pace. A wagon couldn't have moved slowly with that guard and his key bugle on the top of it. These were all foreshadowings of London, Tom thought, as he sat upon the box and looked about him. Such a coachman and such a guard never could have existed between Salisbury and any other place. The coach was none of your steady-going yokel coaches, but a swaggering, rakish, dissipated London coach, up all night and lying by all day, and leading a devil of a life. It cared no more for Salisbury than if it had been a hamlet. It rattled noisily through the best streets, defied the cathedral, took the worst corners sharpest, went cutting in everywhere, making everything get out of its way, and spun along the open country road, blowing a lively defiance out of its key bugle as its last glad parting legacy. It was a charming evening, mild and bright, and even with the weight upon his mind which arose out of the immensity and uncertainty of London, Tom could not resist the captivating sense of rapid motion through the pleasant air. The four greys skimmed along as if they liked it quite as well as Tom did. The bugle was in as high spirits as the greys. The coachman chimed in sometimes with his voice. The wheels hummed cheerfully in unison. The brass work on the harness was an orchestra of little bells. And thus, as they went clinking, jingling, rattling smoothly on, the whole concern from the buckles of the leader's coupling reins to the handle of the hind boot was one great instrument of music. Yoho past hedges, gates and trees, past cottages and barns, and people going home from work. Yoho past donkey chaises, drawn aside into the ditch, and empty carts with rampant horses, whipped up at a bound upon the little water-course, and held by struggling carters close to the five-barred gate, until the coach had passed the narrow turning in the road. Yoho by churches dropped down by themselves in quiet nooks, with rustic burial-grounds about them, where the graves are green, and daisies sleep, for it is evening, on the bosoms of the dead. Yoho past streams in which the cattle cool their feet, and where the rushes grow, past paddock fences, farms, and rick-yards, past last year's stacks, cut slice by slice away, and showing in the waning light like ruined gables, old and brown. Yoho down the pebbly dip, and through the merry water-splash, and up at a canter to the level road again. Yo-ho! Yo-ho! Was the box there when they came up to the old finger-post? The box! Was Mrs. Lupin herself? Had she turned out magnificently, as a hostess should, in her own chaise-cart? And was she sitting in a mahogany chair, driving her own horse Dragon, who ought to have been called Dumpling, and looking lovely? Did the stage-coach pull up beside her, shaving her very wheel? And even while the guard helped her man up with the trunk, did he send the glad echoes of his bugle careering down the chimneys of the distant peck-sniff, as if the coach expressed its exultation in the rescue of Tom Pinch? 
"'This is kind indeed,' said Tom, bending down to shake hands with her. "'I didn't mean to give you this trouble.' "'Trouble, Mr. Pinch,' cried the hostess of the dragon. "'Well, it's a pleasure to you, I know,' said Tom, squeezing her hand heartily. "'Is there any news?' The hostess shook her head. "'Say you saw me,' said Tom, "'and that I was very bold and cheerful, and not a bit downhearted, "'and that I entreated her to be the same, "'for all is certain to come right at last. "'Good-bye.' "'You'll write when you get settled, Mr. Pinch?' said Mrs. Lupin. "'When I get settled?' cried Tom, with an involuntary opening of his eyes. "'Oh, yes, I'll write when I get settled. "'Perhaps I had better write before, because I may find that it takes a little time to settle myself, "'not having too much money and having only one friend. "'I shall give your love to the friend, by the way. "'You were always great with Mr. Westlock, you know. "'Good-bye.' "'Good-bye,' said Mrs. Lupin, hastily producing a basket with a long bottle sticking out of it. "'Take this. Good-bye.' "'Do you want me to carry it to London for you?' cried Tom. She was already turning the chaise cart round. "'No, no,' said Mrs. Lupin. "'It's only a little something for refreshment on the road. "'Sit fast, Jack. Drive on, sir. All right. Good-bye.' She was a quarter of a mile off before Tom collected himself, and then he was waving his hand lustily, and so was she. "'And that's the last of the old finger-post,' thought Tom, straining his eyes, "'where I have so often stood to see this very coach go by, "'and where I have parted with so many companions. "'I used to compare this coach to some great monster "'that appeared at certain times to bear my friends away into the world, "'and now it's bearing me away to seek my fortune. "'Heaven knows where and how.' It made Tom melancholy to picture himself walking up the lane and back to Pecksniff's as of old, and being melancholy he looked downwards at the basket on his knee, which he had for the moment forgotten. "'She is the kindest and most considerate creature in the world,' thought Tom. "'Now I know that she particularly told that man of hers not to look at me, on purpose to prevent my throwing him a shilling. I had it ready for him all the time, and he never once looked towards me.' "'whereas that man naturally, for I know him very well, "'would have done nothing but grin and stare. "'Upon my word, the kindness of people perfectly melts me.' "'Here he caught the coachman's eye. "'The coachman winked. "'Remarkable fine woman for her time of life,' said the coachman. "'I quite agree with you,' returned Tom. "'So she is.' "'Finer than many a young un, I mean to say,' observed the coachman, eh? "'Than many a young one,' Tom assented.' "'I don't care for em myself when they're too young,' remarked the coachman. This was a matter of taste, which Tom did not feel himself called upon to discuss. "'You'll seldom find em possessing correct opinions about refreshment, for instance, when they're too young, you know,' said the coachman. "'A woman must have arrived at maturity before her mind's equal to coming provided with a basket like that.' "'Perhaps you would like to know what it contains,' said Tom, smiling." As the coachman only laughed, and as Tom was curious himself, he unpacked it and put the articles one by one upon the footboard. A cold roast fowl, a packet of ham in slices, a crusty loaf, a piece of cheese, a paper of biscuits, half a dozen apples, a knife, some butter, a screw of salt, and a bottle of old sherry. There was a letter besides which Tom put in his pocket. The coachman was so earnest in his approval of Mrs. Lupin's provident habits, and congratulated Tom so warmly on his good fortune, that Tom felt it necessary, for the lady's sake, to explain that the basket was a strictly platonic basket, and had merely been presented to him in the way of friendship. When he had made the statement with perfect gravity, for he felt it incumbent on him to disabuse the mind of this lax rover of any incorrect impressions on the subject, he signified that he would be happy to share the gifts with him, and proposed that they should attack the basket in a spirit of good fellowship at any time in the course of the night which the coachman's experience and knowledge of the road might suggest as being best adapted to the purpose. From this time they chatted so pleasantly together that although Tom knew infinitely more of unicorns than horses, the coachman informed his friend the guard at the end of the next stage that— Rum as the box-seat looked, he was as good a one to go, in pint of conversation, as ever he'd wished to sit by. Yo-ho, among the gathering shades, making of no account the deep reflections of the trees, but scampering on through light and darkness, 
all the same as if the light of London fifty miles away were quite enough to travel by and some to spare. Yo-ho, beside the village green, where cricket players linger yet, and every little indentation made in the fresh grass by bat or wicket, ball or player's foot, sheds out its perfume on the night. Away with four fresh horses from the bald-faced stag, where topers congregate about the door admiring, and the last team, with traces hanging loose, go roaming off towards the pond, until observed and shouted after by a dozen throats, while volunteering boys pursue them. Now, with a clattering of hoofs, and striking out of fiery sparks, across the old stone bridge, and down again into the shadowy road, and through the open gate, and far away, away into the wold. Yo-ho! Yo-ho behind there! Stop that bugle for a moment. Come creeping over to the front, along the coach roof guard, and make one at this basket. Not that we slacken in our pace the while, not we. We rather put the bits of blood upon their metal, for the greater glory of the snack. Ah, it is long since this bottle of old wine was brought into contact with the mellow breath of night, you may depend, and rare good stuff it is to wet a bugler's whistle with. Only try it. Don't be afraid of turning up your finger, Bill. Another pull. Now take your breath and try the bugle, Bill. There's music. There's a tone. Over the hills and far away, indeed. Yo-ho! The skittish mare is all alive to-night. Yo-ho! Yo-ho! See the bright moon, high up before we know it, making the earth reflect the objects on its breast like water. Hedges, trees, low cottages, church steeples, blighted stumps, and flourishing young slips have all grown vain upon the sudden, and mean to contemplate their own fair images till morning. The poplars yonder rustle that their quivering leaves may see themselves upon the ground. Not so the oak. Trembling does not become him and he watches himself in his stout old burly steadfastness, without the motion of a twig. The moss-grown gate, ill-poised upon its creaking hinges, crippled and decayed, swings to and fro before its glass, like some fantastic dowager, while our own ghostly likeness travels on. Yo-ho! Yo-ho! Through ditch and break, upon the ploughed land and the smooth, along the steep hillside and steeper wall, as if it were a phantom hunter." Clouds, too, and a mist upon the hollow, not a dull fog that hides it, but a light, airy, gauze-like mist, which, in our eyes of modest admiration, gives a new charm to the beauties it has spread before. As real gauze has done ere now, and would again so please you, though we were the Pope. Yo-ho! Why, now we travel like the moon herself, hiding this minute in a grove of trees, next minute in a patch of vapour. Emerging now upon our broad, clear course, withdrawing now, but always dashing on, our journey is a counterpart of hers. Yo-ho! A match against the moon. The beauty of the night is hardly felt when day comes rushing up. Yo-ho! Two stages, and the country roads are almost changed to a continuous street. Yo-ho! Past market gardens, rows of houses, villas, crescents, terraces, and squares— past wagons, coaches, carts, past early workmen, late stragglers, drunken men and sober carriers of loads, past brick and mortar in its every shape, and in among the rattling pavements where a jaunty seat upon a coach is not so easy to preserve. Yo-ho, down countless turnings and through countless mazy ways, until an old inn-yard is gained, and Tom Pinch, getting down quite stunned and giddy, is in London." Five minutes before the time, too, said the driver, as he received his fee of Tom. Upon my word, said Tom, I should not have minded very much if we had been five hours after it, for at this early hour I don't know where to go or what to do with myself. Don't they expect you, then? inquired the driver. Who? said Tom. Why, them, returned the driver. His mind was so clearly running on the assumption of Tom's having come to town to see an extensive circle of anxious relations and friends, that it would have been pretty hard work to undeceive him. Tom did not try. He cheerfully evaded the subject, and going into the inn fell fast asleep before a fire in one of the public rooms opening from the yard. When he awoke, the people in the house were all astir. So he washed and dressed himself, to his great refreshment after the journey, and, it being by that time eight o'clock, 
went forth at once to see his old friend John. John Westlock lived in Furnival's Inn, High Holborn, which was within a quarter of an hour's walk of Tom's starting point, but seemed a long way off by reason of his going two or three miles out of the straight road to make a short cut. When at last he arrived outside John's door, two stories up, he stood faltering with his hand upon the knocker, and trembled from head to foot, for he was rendered very nervous by the thought of having to relate what had fallen out between himself and Pecksniff, and he had a misgiving that John would exult fearfully in the disclosure. "'But it must be made,' thought Tom, sooner or later, and I had better get it over. "'Rat-tat!' "'I'm afraid that's not a London knock,' thought Tom. "'It didn't sound bold. Perhaps that's the reason why nobody answers the door.' "'It is quite certain that nobody came, and that Tom stood looking at the knocker, "'wondering whereabouts in the neighbourhood a certain gentleman resided, "'who was roaring out to somebody, "'Come in!' with all his might.' "'Bless my soul,' thought Tom at last. "'Perhaps he lives here and is calling to me. "'I never thought of that. "'Can I open the door from the outside, I wonder? "'Yes, to be sure I can. "'To be sure he could, by turning the handle. "'And to be sure, when he did turn it, "'the same voice came rushing out, crying, "'Why don't you come in? "'Come in, do you hear? "'What are you standing there for?' "'Quite violently.' Tom stepped from the little passage into the room from which these sounds proceeded, and had barely caught a glimpse of a gentleman in a dressing-gown and slippers, with his boots beside him ready to put on, sitting at his breakfast with a newspaper in his hand, when the said gentleman, at the imminent hazard of oversetting his tea-table, made a plunge at Tom and hugged him. "'Why, Tom, my boy!' cried the gentleman. "'Tom!' "'How glad I am to see you, Mr. Westlock,' said Tom Pinch, shaking both his hands, and trembling more than ever. "'How kind you are!' "'Mr. Westlock,' repeated John, "'what do you mean by that, Pinch? "'You have not forgotten my Christian name, I suppose?' "'No, John, no, I have not forgotten,' said Thomas Pinch. "'Good gracious me, how kind you are!' "'I never saw such a fellow in all my life,' cried John. "'What do you mean by saying that over and over again?' "'What did you expect me to be, I wonder? "'Here, sit down, Tom, and be a reasonable creature. "'How are you, my boy? I am delighted to see you.' "'And I am delighted to see you,' said Tom. "'It's mutual, of course,' returned Tom. "'It always was, I hope. "'If I had known you had been coming, Tom, "'I would have had something for breakfast. "'I would rather have such a surprise "'than the best breakfast in the world myself. "'But yours is another case, "'and I have no doubt you are as hungry as a hunter.' "'You must make out as well as you can, Tom, and we'll recompense ourselves at dinner-time. "'You take sugar, I know. I recollect the sugar at Pecksniff's. "'Ha, ha, ha! How is Pecksniff? When did you come to town? "'Do begin at something or other, Tom. There are only scraps here, but they are not at all bad. "'Boar's head potted. Try it, Tom. Make a beginning, whatever you do. "'What an old blade you are! I am delighted to see you.' While he delivered himself of these words, in a state of great commotion, John was constantly running backwards and forwards, to and from the closet, bringing out all sorts of things in pots, scooping extraordinary quantities of tea out of the caddy, dropping French rolls into his boots, pouring hot water over the butter, and making a variety of similar mistakes, without disconcerting himself in the least. "'There,' said John, sitting down for the fiftieth time, and instantly starting up again, to make some other addition to the breakfast. "'Now we are as well off as we are likely to be till dinner. And now let us have the news, Tom. Imprimis. How's Pecksniff?' "'I don't know how he is,' was Tom's grave answer. John Westlock put the teapot down and looked at him in astonishment. "'I don't know how he is,' said Thomas Pinch. "'and saving that I wish him no ill, I don't care. "'I have left him, John. I have left him for ever. "'Voluntarily? "'Why, no, for he dismissed me. "'But I had first found out that I was mistaken in him, "'and I could not have remained with him under any circumstances. "'I grieve to say that you were right in your estimate of his character. "'It may be a ridiculous weakness, John, "'but it has been very painful and bitter to me to find this out, "'I do assure you.' Tom had no need to direct that appealing look towards his friend, in mild and gentle deprecation of his answering with a laugh. John Westlock would have as soon thought of striking him down upon the floor. "'It was all a dream of mine,' said Tom, "'and it is over.' 
I'll tell you how it happened at some other time. Bear with my folly, John. I do not just now like to think or speak about it. I swear to you, Tom, returned his friend with great earnestness of manner, after remaining silent for a few moments, that when I see, as I do now, how deeply you feel this, I don't know whether to be glad or sorry that you have made the discovery at last. I reproach myself with the thought that I ever jested on the subject. I ought to have known better. My dear friend, said Tom, extending his hand, it is very generous and gallant in you to receive me and my disclosure in this spirit. It makes me blush to think that I should have felt a moment's uneasiness as I came along. You can't think what a weight is lifted off my mind, said Tom, taking up his knife and fork again, and looking very cheerful. I shall punish the boar's head dreadfully. The host, thus reminded of his duties, instantly betook himself to piling up all kinds of irreconcilable and contradictory viands in Tom's plate, and a very capital breakfast Tom made, and very much the better for it, Tom felt. "'That's all right,' said John, after contemplating his visitor's proceedings with infinite satisfaction. "'Now, about our plans. You are going to stay with me, of course. Where's your box?' "'It's at the inn,' said Tom. "'I didn't intend—' "'Never mind what you didn't intend,' John Westlock interposed. "'What you did intend is more to the purpose. "'You intended in coming here to ask my advice, did you not, Tom?' "'Certainly.' "'And to take it when I gave it to you?' "'Yes,' rejoined Tom, smiling. "'If it were good advice, which, being yours, I have no doubt it will be.' "'Very well. "'Then don't be an obstinate old humbug in the outset, Tom, "'or I shall shut up shop and dispense none of that invaluable commodity.' "'You are on a visit to me. I wish I had an organ for you, Tom. "'So do the gentlemen downstairs and the gentlemen overhead, I have no doubt,' was Tom's reply. "'Let me see. In the first place you will wish to see your sister this morning,' pursued his friend, "'and of course you will like to go there alone. I'll walk part of the way with you and see about a little business of my own, and meet you here again in the afternoon.' "'Put that in your pocket, Tom. It's only the key of the door. "'If you come home first, you'll want it.' "'Really,' said Tom, "'quartering oneself upon a friend in this way. "'Why, there are two keys,' interposed John Westlock. "'I can't open the door with them both at once, can I? "'What a ridiculous fellow you are, Tom. "'Nothing particular you'd like for dinner, is there?' "'Oh, dear, no,' said Tom. "'Very well, then you may as well leave it to me. "'Have a glass of cherry brandy, Tom?' "'Not a drop.' "'What remarkable chambers these are,' said Pinch. "'There's everything in them. "'Bless your soul, Tom, nothing but a few little bachelor contrivances, "'the sort of impromptu arrangements that might have suggested themselves "'to Philip Quarrel or Robinson Crusoe, that's all. "'What do you say, shall we walk?' "'By all means,' cried Tom, "'as soon as you like.'" End of chapter 36, part 1《Chapter Thirty Six, Part Two of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Six, Part Two. Accordingly, John Westlock took the French rolls out of his boots and put his boots on, and dressed himself, giving Tom the paper to read in the meanwhile. When he returned, equipped for walking, he found Tom in a brown study with the paper in his hand. "'Dreaming, Tom?' "'No,' said Mr. Pinch. "'No, I have been looking over the advertising sheet, thinking there might be something in it which would be likely to suit me.' "'But as I often think, the strange thing seems to be that nobody is suited. "'Here are all kinds of employers wanting all sorts of servants, "'and all sorts of servants wanting all kinds of employers, "'and they never seem to come together. "'Here is a gentleman in a public office, "'in a position of temporary difficulty, "'who wants to borrow five hundred pounds. "'And in the very next advertisement, "'here is another gentleman who has got exactly that sum to lend.' "'But he'll never lend it to him, John, you'll find. "'Here is a lady possessing a moderate independence "'who wants to board and lodge with a quiet, cheerful family. 
and here is a family describing themselves in those very words, a quiet, cheerful family, who want exactly such a lady to come and live with them. But she'll never go, John. Neither do any of these single gentlemen who want an airy bedroom with the occasional use of a parlor ever appear to come to terms with these other people who live in a rural situation remarkable for its bracing atmosphere within five minutes' walk of the Royal Exchange. Even those letters of the alphabet who are always running away from their friends and being entreated at the tops of columns to come back never do come back, if we may judge from the number of times they are asked to do it and don't. It really seems, said Tom, relinquishing the paper with a thoughtful sigh, as if people had the same gratification in printing their complaints as in making them known by word of mouth, as if they found it a comfort and consolation to proclaim, I want such and such a thing, and I can't get it, and I don't expect I ever shall. John Westlock laughed at the idea, and they went out together. So many years had passed since Tom was last in London, and he had known so little of it then, that his interest in all he saw was very great. He was particularly anxious, among other notorious localities, to have those streets pointed out to him which were appropriated to the slaughter of countrymen, and was quite disappointed to find, after half an hour's walking, that he hadn't had his pocket picked. But on John Westlock's inventing a pickpocket for his gratification, and pointing out a highly respectable stranger as one of that fraternity, he was much delighted. His friend accompanied him to within a short distance of Camberwell, and having put him beyond the possibility of mistaking the wealthy brass and copper founders, left him to make his visit. Arriving before the great bell handle, Tom gave it a gentle pull. The porter appeared. "'Pray, does Miss Pinch live here?' said Tom. "'Miss Pinch is governess here,' replied the porter. At the same time he looked at Tom from head to foot, as if he would have said, "'You are a nice man, you are. Where did you come from?' "'It's the same young lady,' said Tom. "'It's quite right. Is she at home?' "'I don't know, I'm sure,' rejoined the porter. "'Do you think you could have the goodness to ascertain?' said Tom. He had quite a delicacy in offering the suggestion, for the possibility of such a step did not appear to present itself to the porter's mind at all. The fact was that the porter, in answering the gate-bell, had, according to usage, rung the house-bell, for it is as well to do these things in the baronial style while you are about it, and that there the functions of his office had ceased. Being hired to open and shut the gate, and not to explain himself to strangers, he left this little incident to be developed by the footman with the tags, who, at this juncture, called out from the doorsteps, "'Hullo there! What are you up to? This way, young man!' "'Oh,' said Tom, hurrying towards him, "'I didn't observe that there was anybody else. Pray, is Miss Pinch at home?' "'She's in,' replied the footman, as much as to say to Tom, "'But if you think she has anything to do with the proprietorship of this place, you had better abandon that idea.' "'I wish to see her, if you please,' said Tom. The footman, being a lively young man, happened to have his attention caught at that moment by the flight of a pigeon, in which he took so warm an interest that his gaze was riveted on the bird until it was quite out of sight. He then invited Tom to come in, and showed him into a parlour. "'Henny Neem,' said the young man, pausing languidly at the door. It was a good thought, because, without providing the stranger, in case he should happen to be of a warm temper, with a sufficient excuse for knocking him down, it implied this young man's estimate of his quality, and relieved his breast of the oppressive burden of rating him in secret as a nameless and obscure individual. "'Say her brother, if you please,' said Tom. "'Mother?' drawled the footman. "'Brother,' repeated Tom, slightly raising his voice. "'And if you will say, in the first instance, a gentleman, and then say her brother, I shall be obliged to you, as she does not expect me or know I am in London, and I do not wish to startle her.' The young man's interest in Tom's observations had ceased long before this time, but he kindly waited until now, when shutting the door, he withdrew. "'Dear me,' said Tom, "'this is very disrespectful and uncivil behaviour. I hope these are new servants here, and that Ruth is very differently treated.' His cogitations were interrupted by the sound of voices in the adjoining room. They seemed to be engaged in high dispute, or an indignant reprimand of some offender, 
and gathering strength occasionally, broke out into a perfect whirlwind. It was in one of these gusts, as it appeared to Tom, that the footman announced him, for an abrupt and unnatural calm took place, and then a dead silence. He was standing before the window, wondering what domestic quarrel might have caused these sounds, and hoping Ruth had nothing to do with it, when the door opened, and his sister ran into his arms. "'Why, bless my soul!' said Tom, looking at her with great pride, when they had tenderly embraced each other. "'How altered you are, Ruth! I should scarcely have known you, my love, if I had seen you anywhere else, I declare. You are so improved,' said Tom, with inexpressible delight. "'You are so womanly, you are so positively, you know, you are so handsome. "'If you think so, Tom—' "'Oh, but everybody must think so, you know,' said Tom, gently smoothing down her hair. "'It's a matter of fact, not opinion. "'But what's the matter?' said Tom, looking at her more intently. "'How flushed you are! And you have been crying.' "'No, I have not, Tom.' "'Nonsense,' said her brother stoutly. "'That's a story. Don't tell me. I know better.' "'What is it, dear? "'I'm not with Mr. Pecksniff now. "'I am going to try and settle myself in London. "'And if you are not happy here, as I very much fear you are not, "'for I begin to think you have been deceiving me "'with the kindest and most affectionate intention, "'you shall not remain here.' "'Oh, Tom's blood was rising. Mind that. "'Perhaps the boar's head had something to do with it, "'but certainly the footman had. "'So had the sight of his pretty sister a great deal to do with it.' Tom could bear a good deal himself, but he was proud of her, and pride is a sensitive thing. He began to think, there are more Pecksniffs than one, perhaps, and by all the pins and needles that run up and down in angry veins, Tom was in a most unusual tingle all at once. "'We will talk about it, Tom,' said Ruth, giving him another kiss to pacify him. "'I am afraid I cannot stay here.' "'Cannot?' replied Tom. "'Why, then you shall not, my love.' "'Heyday, you are not an object of charity, upon my word.' Tom was stopped in these exclamations by the footman, who brought a message from his master, importing that he wished to speak with him before he went, and with Miss Pinch also. "'Show the way,' said Tom. "'I'll wait upon him at once.' Accordingly, they entered the adjoining room, from which the noise of altercation had proceeded, and there they found a middle-aged gentleman, with a pompous voice and manner, and a middle-aged lady, with what may be termed an excisable face, or one in which starch and vinegar were decidedly employed. There was likewise present that eldest pupil of Miss Pinch, whom Mrs. Todgers, on a previous occasion, had called a syrup, and who was now weeping and sobbing spitefully. "'My brother, sir,' said Ruth Pinch, timidly presenting Tom. "'Oh!' cried the gentleman, surveying Tom attentively. "'You really are Miss Pinch's brother, I presume. You will excuse my asking. I don't observe any resemblance.' "'Miss Pinch has a brother, I know,' observed the lady. "'Miss Pinch is always talking about her brother when she ought to be engaged upon my education,' sobbed the pupil. "'Sophia, hold your tongue,' observed the gentleman. "'Sit down, if you please,' addressing Tom.' Tom sat down, looking from one face to another in mute surprise. "'Remain here, if you please, Miss Pinch,' pursued the gentleman, looking slightly over his shoulder. Tom interrupted him here by rising to place a chair for his sister. Having done which, he sat down again. "'I am glad you chanced to have called to see your sister to-day, sir,' resumed the brass and copper founder, "'for although I do not approve, as a principal, of any young person engaged in my family in the capacity of a governess receiving visitors, it happens in this case to be well-timed. I am sorry to inform you that we are not at all satisfied with your sister.' "'We are very much dissatisfied with her,' observed the lady." "'I'd never say another lesson to Miss Pinch if I was to be beat to death for it,' sobbed the pupil. "'Sophia,' cried her father, "'hold your tongue.' "'Will you allow me to inquire what your ground of dissatisfaction is?' asked Tom. "'Yes,' said the gentleman, "'I will. "'I don't recognize it as a right, but I will. "'Your sister has not the slightest innate power of commanding respect. "'It has been a constant source of difference between us.' Although she has been in this family for some time, and although the young lady who is now present has almost, as it were, grown up under her tuition, that young lady has no respect for her. 
Miss Pinch has been perfectly unable to command my daughter's respect or to win my daughter's confidence. Now, said the gentleman, allowing the palm of his hand to fall gravely down upon the table, I maintain that there is something radically wrong in that. You, as her brother, may be disposed to deny it. I beg your pardon, sir, said Tom. I am not at all disposed to deny it. I am sure that there is something radically wrong, radically monstrous in that. "'Good heavens!' cried the gentleman, looking round the room with dignity. "'What do I find to be the case? "'What results obtrude themselves upon me as flowing from this weakness of character on the part of Miss Pinch? "'What are my feelings as a father when after my desire, repeatedly expressed to Miss Pinch, "'as I think she will not venture to deny, that my daughter should be choice in her expressions, "'genteel in her deportment, as becomes her station in life,' and politely distant to her inferiors in society, I find her, only this very morning, addressing Miss Pinch herself as a beggar. "'A beggarly thing,' observed the lady, in correction. "'Which is worse,' said the gentleman triumphantly, "'which is worse, a beggarly thing, a low, coarse, despicable expression.' "'Most despicable,' cried Tom. "'I am glad to find that there is a just appreciation of it here.' "'So just, sir,' said the gentleman, lowering his voice to be the more impressive, "'so just, that but for my knowing Miss Pinch to be an unprotected young person, an orphan and without friends, I would, as I assured Miss Pinch upon my veracity and personal character, a few minutes ago, I would have severed the connection between us at that moment and from that time.' "'Bless my soul, sir,' cried Tom, rising from his seat, for he was now unable to contain himself any longer." "'Don't allow such considerations as those to influence you, pray. "'They don't exist, sir. "'She is not unprotected. "'She is ready to depart this instant. "'Ruth, my dear, get your bonnet on.' "'Oh, a pretty family,' cried the lady. "'Oh, he's her brother. "'There's no doubt about that.' "'As little doubt, madam,' said Tom, "'as that the young lady yonder is the child of your teaching "'and not my sister's. "'Ruth, my dear, get your bonnet on.' "'When you say, young man,' interposed the brass and copper founder haughtily, "'with that impertinence which is natural to you, "'and which I therefore do not condescend to notice further, "'that the young lady, my eldest daughter, "'has been educated by any one but Miss Pinch, "'you, I needn't proceed. "'You comprehend me fully. "'I have no doubt you are used to it.' "'Sir,' cried Tom, after regarding him in silence for some little time, "'if you do not understand what I mean, I will tell you.' "'If you do understand what I mean, I beg you not to repeat that mode of expressing yourself in answer to it. "'My meaning is that no man can expect his children to respect what he degrades.' "'Ha, ha, ha!' laughed the gentleman. "'Can't! Can't! The common can't!' "'The common story, sir,' said Tom. "'The story of a common mind. "'Your governess cannot win the confidence and respect of your children, forsooth. "'Let her begin by winning yours, and see what happens then.' "'Miss Pinch is getting her bonnet on, I trust, my dear,' said the gentleman. "'I trust she is,' said Tom, forestalling the reply. "'I have no doubt she is. "'In the meantime, I address myself to you, sir. "'You made your statement to me, sir. "'You required to see me for that purpose, and I have a right to answer it. "'I am not loud or turbulent,' said Tom, which was quite true. "'Though I can scarcely say as much for you in your manner of addressing yourself to me, "'and I wish, on my sister's behalf, to state the simple truth.' "'You may state anything you like, young man,' returned the gentleman, affecting to yawn. "'My dear, Miss Pinch's money.' "'When you tell me,' resumed Tom, who was not the less indignant for keeping himself quiet, "'that my sister has no innate power of commanding the respect of your children, "'I must tell you it is not so, and that she has. "'She is as well-bred, as well-taught, as well-qualified by nature to command respect "'as any hirer of a governess you know.' "'But when you place her at a disadvantage in reference to every servant in your house, "'how can you suppose, if you have the gift of common sense, "'that she is not in a tenfold worse position in reference to your daughters?' "'Pretty well, upon my word,' exclaimed the gentleman. "'This is pretty well.' "'It is very ill, sir,' said Tom. "'It is very bad and mean and wrong and cruel. "'Respect. I believe young people are quick enough to observe and imitate.' "'And why or how should they respect whom no one else respects, and everybody slights? "'And very partial they must grow, oh, very partial, to their studies, "'when they see to what a pass proficiency in those same tasks has brought their governess. "'Respect. Put anything the most deserving of respect before your daughters "'in the light in which you place her, 
and you will bring it down as low, no matter what it is. "'You speak with extreme impertinence, young man,' observed the gentleman. "'I speak without passion, but with extreme indignation and contempt for such a course of treatment, and for all who practice it,' said Tom. "'Why, how can you, as an honest gentleman, profess displeasure or surprise at your daughter telling my sister she is something beggarly and humble, when you are forever telling her the same thing yourself, in fifty plain out-speaking ways, though not in words, and when your very porter and footman make the same delicate announcement to all comers? As to your suspicion and distrust of her, even of her word, if she is not above their reach, you have no right to employ her.' "'No right!' cried the brass and copper founder. "'Distinctly not,' Tom answered. "'If you imagine that the payment of an annual sum of money gives it to you, "'you immensely exaggerate its power and value. "'Your money is the least part of your bargain in such a case. "'You may be punctual in that to half a second on the clock, and yet be bankrupt. "'I have nothing more to say,' said Tom, much flushed and flustered now that it was over, "'except to crave permission to stand in your garden until my sister is ready.' "'Not waiting to obtain it, Tom walked out.' Before he had well begun to cool, his sister joined him. She was crying, and Tom could not bear that any one about the house should see her doing that. "'They will think you are sorry to go,' said Tom. "'You are not sorry to go?' "'No, Tom, no. I have been anxious to go for a very long time.' "'Very well, then. Don't cry,' said Tom. "'I am so sorry for you, dear,' sobbed Tom's sister. "'But you ought to be glad on my account,' said Tom. "'I shall be twice as happy with you for a companion.' "'Hold up your head. There. Now we go out as we ought, not blustering, you know, but firm and confident in ourselves.' The idea of Tom and his sister blustering under any circumstances was a splendid absurdity, but Tom was very far from feeling it to be so in his excitement, and passed out at the gate with such severe determination written in his face that the porter hardly knew him again. It was not until they had walked some short distance, and Tom found himself getting cooler and more collected, that he was quite restored to himself by an inquiry from his sister, who said, in her pleasant little voice, "'Where are we going, Tom?' "'Dear me,' said Tom, stopping, "'I don't know.' "'Don't you—don't you live anywhere, dear?' asked Tom's sister, looking wistfully in his face. "'No,' said Tom, "'not at present, not exactly.' "'I only arrived this morning. We must have some lodgings.' He didn't tell her that he had been going to stay with his friend John, and could on no account think of billeting two inmates upon him, of whom one was a young lady, for he knew that would make her uncomfortable, and would cause her to regard herself as being an inconvenience to him. Neither did he like to leave her anywhere while he called on John, and told him of this change in his arrangements for he was delicate of seeming to encroach upon the generous and hospitable nature of his friend. Therefore, he said again, "'We must have some lodgings, of course,' and said it as stoutly as if he had been a perfect directory and guide-book to all the lodgings in London. "'Where shall we go and look for him?' said Tom. "'What do you think?' Tom's sister was not much wiser on such a topic than he was, so she squeezed her little purse into his coat-pocket, and folding the little hand with which she did so on the other little hand with which she clasped his arm, said nothing. "'It ought to be a cheap neighbourhood,' said Tom, "'and not too far from London. Let me see. Should you think Islington a good place?' "'I should think it was an excellent place, Tom.' "'It used to be called Mary Islington once upon a time,' said Tom. "'Perhaps it's Mary now. If so, it's all the better, eh?' "'If it's not too dear,' said Tom's sister.' "'Of course, if it's not too dear,' assented Tom. "'Well, where is Islington? "'We can't do better than go there, I should think. "'Let's go.' "'Tom's sister would have gone anywhere with him, "'so they walked off arm in arm as comfortably as possible. "'Finding presently that Islington was not in that neighbourhood, "'Tom made inquiries respecting a public conveyance thither, "'which they soon obtained. "'As they rode along, they were very full of conversation indeed.' Tom relating what had happened to him, and Tom's sister relating what had happened to her, and both finding a great deal more to say than time to say it in, for they had only just begun to talk, in comparison with what they had to tell each other, when they reached their journey's end. "'Now,' said Tom, "'we must first look out for some very unpretending streets, and then look out for bills in the windows.' 
So they walked off again, quite as happily as if they had just stepped out of a snug little house of their own to look for lodgings on account of somebody else. Tom's simplicity was unabated, heaven knows. But now that he had somebody to rely upon him, he was stimulated to rely a little more upon himself, and was, in his own opinion, quite a desperate fellow. After roaming up and down for hours, looking at some scores of lodgings, they began to find it rather fatiguing, especially as they saw none which were at all adapted to their purpose. At length, however, in a singular little old-fashioned house up a blind street, they discovered two small bedrooms and a triangular parlour, which promised to suit them well enough. Their desiring to take possession immediately was a suspicious circumstance, but even this was surmounted by the payment of their first week's rent, and a reference to John Westlock, Esquire, Furnival's Inn, High Holborn. Ah, it was a goodly sight, when this important point was settled, to behold Tom and his sister trotting round to the bakers and the butchers and the grocers, with a kind of dreadful delight in the unaccustomed cares of housekeeping, taking secret counsel together as they gave their small orders, and distracted by the least suggestion on the part of the shopkeeper. When they got back to the triangular parlour, and Tom's sister, bustling to and fro, busy about a thousand pleasant nothings, stopped every now and then to give old Tom a kiss or smile upon him, Tom rubbed his hands as if all Islington were his. It was late in the afternoon now, though, and high time for Tom to keep his appointment. So, after agreeing with his sister that in consideration of not having dined, they would venture on the extravagance of chops for supper at nine, he walked out again to narrate these marvellous occurrences to John. "'I am quite a family man all at once,' thought Tom. "'If I can only get something to do, how comfortable Ruth and I may be. Ah, uh, that if. But it's of no use to despond. I can but do that when I have tried everything and failed.' and even then it won't serve me much. Upon my word, thought Tom, quickening his pace, I don't know what John will think has become of me. He'll begin to be afraid I have strayed into one of those streets where the countrymen are murdered, and that I have been made meat pies of, or some such horrible thing. End of chapter 36《Chapter Thirty Seven of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Seven Tom Pinch, going astray, finds that he is not the only person in that predicament. He retaliates upon a fallen foe. Tom's evil genius did not lead him into the dens of any of those preparers of cannibalic pastry who are represented in many standard country legends as doing a lively retail business in the metropolis. Nor did it mark him out as the prey of ring-droppers, pea-and-thimble-riggers, duffers, touters, or any of those bloodless sharpers who are, perhaps, a little better known to the police. He fell into conversation with no gentleman who took him into a public house, where there happened to be another gentleman who swore he had more money than any gentleman, and very soon proved he had more money than one gentleman by taking his away from him. Neither did he fall into any other of the numerous man-traps which are set up without notice in the public grounds of this city. But he lost his way. He very soon did that, and in trying to find it again he lost it more and more. Now Tom, in his guileless distrust of London, thought himself very knowing in coming to the determination that he would not ask to be directed to Furnival's Inn, if he could help it, unless indeed he should happen to find himself near the Mint or the Bank of England, in which case he would step in and ask a civil question or two, confiding in the perfect respectability of the concern. So on he went, looking up all the streets he came near, and going up half of them, and thus, by dint of not being true to Goswell Street, and filing off into Aldermanbury, and bewildering himself in Barbican, and being constant to the wrong point of the compass in London Wall, and then getting himself crosswise into Thames Street by an instinct that would have been marvellous 
if he had had the least desire or reason to go there, he found himself at last hard by the monument. The man in the monument was quite as mysterious a being to Tom as the man in the moon. It immediately occurred to him that the lonely creature who held himself aloof from all mankind in that pillar, like some old hermit, was the very man of whom to ask his way. Cold he might be, little sympathy he had, perhaps, with human passion, the column seemed too tall for that, but if truth didn't live in the base of the monument, notwithstanding Pope's couplet about the outside of it, where in London, thought Tom, was she likely to be found? Coming close below the pillar, it was a great encouragement to Tom to find that the man in the monument had simple tastes. That stony and artificial as his residence was, he still preserved some rustic recollections. That he liked plants, hung up bird cages, was not wholly cut off from fresh groundsel, and kept young trees in tubs. The man in the monument himself was sitting outside the door, his own door, the monument door. What a grand idea! And was actually yawning as if there were no monument to stop his mouth and give him a perpetual interest in his own existence. Tom was advancing towards this remarkable creature to inquire the way to Furnival's Inn when two people came to see the monument. They were a gentleman and a lady, and the gentleman said, How much a piece? The man in the monument replied, A tanner. It seemed a low expression compared with the monument. The gentleman put a shilling into his hand, and the man in the monument opened a dark little door. When the gentleman and lady had passed out of view, he shut it again and came slowly back to his chair. He sat down and laughed. "'They don't know what a many steps there is,' he said. "'It's worth twice the money to stop here. Oh, my eye!' The man in the monument was a cynic, a worldly man. Tom couldn't ask his way of him. He was prepared to put no confidence in anything he said. "'My gracious!' cried a well-known voice behind Mr. Pinch. "'Why, to be sure it is!' At the same time he was poked in the back by a parasol. Turning round to inquire into this salute, he beheld the eldest daughter of his late patron. "'Miss Pecksniff!' said Tom. "'Why, my goodness, Mr. Pinch!' cried Cherry. "'What are you doing here?' "'I have rather wandered from my way,' said Tom. "'I—I I hope you have run away,' said Charity.' It would be quite spirited and proper if you had, when my papa so far forgets himself. I have left him, returned Tom, but it was perfectly understood on both sides. It was not done clandestinely. Is he married? asked Cherry, with a spasmodic shake of her chin. No, not yet, said Tom, colouring. To tell you the truth, I don't think he is likely to be, if, if Miss Graham is the object of his passion. "'Mr. Pinch,' cried Charity, with sharp impatience, "'you're very easily deceived. "'You don't know the arts of which such a creature is capable. "'Oh, it's a wicked world.' "'You are not married,' Tom hinted, to divert the conversation. "'No,' said Cherry, tracing out one particular paving-stone in Monument Yard, "'with the end of her parasol. "'I—but really it's quite impossible to explain. "'Won't you walk in?' "'You live here, then?' said Tom. "'Yes,' returned Miss Pecksniff, pointing with her parasol to Todgers's. "'I reside with this lady, at present.' The great stress on the two last words suggested to Tom that he was expected to say something in reference to them. So he said, "'Only at present? Are you going home again soon?' "'No, Mr. Pinch,' returned Charity. "'No, thank you, no. A mother-in-law who is younger than—' I mean to say who is as nearly as possible about the same age as oneself, would not quite suit my spirit. Not quite, said Cherry, with a spiteful shiver. I thought from your saying at present, Tom observed. Really, upon my word, I had no idea you would press me so very closely on the subject, Mr. Pinch, said Charity, blushing, or I should not have been so foolish as to allude to— Oh, really, won't you walk in? Tom mentioned, to excuse himself, that he had an appointment in Furnival's Inn, and that coming from Islington he had taken a few wrong turnings and arrived at the monument instead. Miss Pecksniff simpered very much when he asked her if she knew the way to Furnival's Inn, 
and at length found courage to reply. "'A gentleman who is a friend of mine, or at least who is not exactly a friend so much as a sort of acquaintance—' "'Oh, upon my word, I hardly know what I say, Mr. Pinch. You mustn't suppose there is any engagement between us, or at least if there is, that it is at all a settled thing as yet. Is going to Furnival's Inn immediately, I believe, upon a little business, and I am sure he would be very glad to accompany you, so as to prevent your going wrong again.' "'You had better walk in. "'You will very likely find my sister Mary here,' she said with a curious toss of her head, and anything but an agreeable smile. "'Then I think I'll endeavour to find my way alone,' said Tom, "'for I fear she would not be very glad to see me. "'That unfortunate occurrence, in relation to which you and I had some amicable words together in private, "'is not likely to have impressed her with any friendly feeling towards me, "'though it really was not my fault.' "'She has never heard of that, you may depend,' said Cherry, gathering up the corners of her mouth and nodding at Tom. "'I am far from sure that she would bear you any mighty ill-will for it if she had.' "'You don't say so,' cried Tom, who was really concerned by this insinuation. "'I say nothing,' said Charity. "'If I had not already known what shocking things treachery and deceit are in themselves, Mr. Pinch, I might perhaps have learnt it from the success they meet with.' "'from the success they meet with.' "'Here she smiled as before. "'But I don't say anything. "'On the contrary, I should scorn it. "'You had better walk in.' "'There was something hidden here "'which piqued Tom's interest "'and troubled his tender heart. "'When, in a moment's irresolution, "'he looked at Charity, "'he could not but observe a struggle in her face "'between a sense of triumph and a sense of shame. "'Nor could he but remark "'how meeting even his eyes,' which she cared so little for, she turned away her own, for all this splenetic defiance in her manner. An uneasy thought entered Tom's head, a shadowy misgiving that the altered relations between himself and Pecksniff were somehow to involve an altered knowledge on his part of other people, and were to give him an insight into much of which he had had no previous suspicion. And yet he put no definite construction upon Charity's proceedings. He certainly had no idea that, as he had been the audience and spectator of her mortification, she grasped with eager delight at any opportunity of reproaching her sister with his presence in her far deeper misery. For he knew nothing of it, and only pictured that sister as the same giddy, careless, trivial creature she always had been, with the same slight estimation of himself which she had never been at the least pains to conceal. In short, he had merely a confused impression that Miss Pecksniff was not quite sisterly or kind, and, being curious to set it right, accompanied her as she desired. The house-door being opened, she went in before Tom, requesting him to follow her, and led the way to the parlour door. "'Oh, Mary,' she said, looking in, "'I am so glad you have not gone home. Who do you think I have met in the street and brought to see you? Mr. Pinch! There!' "'Now you are surprised, I am sure.' "'Not more surprised than Tom was when he looked upon her. "'Not so much, not half so much. "'Mr. Pinch has left Papa, my dear,' said Cherry, "'and his prospects are quite flourishing. "'I have promised that Augustus, who is going that way, "'shall escort him to the place he wants. "'Augustus, my child, where are you?' "'With these words Miss Pecksniff screamed her way out of the parlour, calling on Augustus' model to appear, and left Tom Pinch alone with her sister. If she had always been his kindest friend, if she had treated him through all his servitude with such consideration as was never yet received by struggling man, if she had lightened every moment of those many years, and had ever spared and never wounded him, his honest heart could not have swelled before her with a deeper pity or a purer freedom from all base remembrance than it did then. "'My gracious me! You are really the last person in the world I should have thought of seeing, I am sure.' Tom was sorry to hear her speaking in her old manner. He had not expected that. Yet he did not feel it a contradiction that he should be sorry to see her so unlike her old self, and sorry at the same time to hear her speaking in her old manner. The two things seemed quite natural.' "'I wonder you find any gratification in coming to see me. "'I can't think what put it in your head. "'I never had much in seeing you. "'There was no love lost between us, Mr. Pinch, at any time, I think.' 
Her bonnet lay beside her on the sofa, and she was very busy with the ribbons as she spoke. Much too busy to be conscious of the work her fingers did. "'We never quarrelled said Tom. Tom was right in that, for one person can no more quarrel without an adversary than one person can play at chess or fight a duel. "'I hoped you would be glad to shake hands with an old friend. Don't let us rake up bygones,' said Tom. "'If I ever offended you, forgive me.' She looked at him for a moment, dropped her bonnet from her hands, spread them before her altered face, and burst into tears. "'Oh, Mr. Pinch,' she said, "'although I never used you well, I did believe your nature was forgiving. I did not think you could be cruel.' She spoke as little like her old self now, for certain, as Tom could possibly have wished, but she seemed to be appealing to him reproachfully, and he did not understand her. "'I seldom showed it. "'Never.' I know that. But I had that belief in you that if I had been asked to name the person in the world least likely to retort upon me, I would have named you confidently. Would have named me, Tom repeated. Yes, she said with energy, and I have often thought so. After a moment's reflection, Tom sat himself upon a chair beside her. Do you believe, said Tom, oh, "'Can you think that what I said just now "'I said with any but the true and plain intention "'which my words professed? "'I mean it in the spirit and the letter. "'If I ever offended you, forgive me. "'I may have done so many times. "'You never injured or offended me. "'How then could I possibly retort "'if even I were stern and bad enough to wish to do it?' "'After a little while she thanked him "'through her tears and sobs, "'and told him she had never been at once "'so sorry and so comforted.' since she left home. Still she wept bitterly, and it was the greater pain to Tom to see her weeping, from her standing in a special need just then of sympathy and tenderness. "'Come, come,' said Tom. "'You used to be as cheerful as the day was long.' "'Ah, used,' she cried, in such a tone as rent Tom's heart. "'And will be again,' said Tom. "'No, never more. No, never, never more.' "'If you should talk with old Mr. Chuzzlewit at any time,' she added, looking hurriedly into his face, "'I sometimes thought he liked you, but suppressed it. "'Will you promise me to tell him that you saw me here, "'and that I said I bore in mind the time we talked together in the churchyard?' "'Tom promised that he would. "'Many times since then, when I have wished I had been carried there before that day, "'I have recalled his words.' I wish that he should know how true they were, although the least acknowledgment to that effect has never passed my lips and never will. Tom promised this, conditionally, too. He did not tell her how improbable it was that he and the old man would ever meet again, because he thought it might disturb her more. "'If he should ever know this through your means, dear Mr. Pinch,' said Mercy, "'tell him that I sent the message, not for myself, but that he might be more forbearing and more patient.' and more trustful to some other person in some other time of need. Tell him that if he could know how my heart trembled in the balance that day, and what a very little would have turned the scale, his own would bleed with pity for me. Yes, yes, said Tom, I will. When I appeared to him the most unworthy of his help, I was, I know I was, for I have often, often thought about it since, the most inclined to yield to what he showed me. Oh, if he had relented but a little more, if he had thrown himself in my way for but one other quarter of an hour, if he had extended his compassion for a vain, unthinking, miserable girl in but the least degree, he might, and I believe he would, have saved her. Tell him that I don't blame him, but am grateful for the effort that he made. But ask him, for the love of God and youth, and in merciful consideration for the struggle which an ill-advised and unwakened nature makes to hide the strength that thinks its weakness, ask him never, never to forget this when he deals with one again. Although Tom did not hold the clue to her full meaning, he could guess it pretty nearly. Touched to the quick, he took her hand and said, or meant to say, some words of consolation. She felt and understood them, whether they were spoken or no. He was not quite certain afterwards, but that she had tried to kneel down at his feet and bless him. He found that he was not alone in the room when she had left it, 
Mrs. Todgers was there, shaking her head. Tom had never seen Mrs. Todgers, it is needless to say, but he had a perception of her being the lady of the house, and he saw some genuine compassion in her eyes that won his good opinion. "'Ah, sir, you are an old friend, I see,' said Mrs. Todgers. "'Yes,' said Tom. "'And yet,' quoth Mrs. Todgers, shutting the door softly, "'she hasn't told you what her troubles are, I'm certain.' Tom was struck by these words, for they were quite true. Indeed, he said, she has not. And never would, said Mrs. Todgers, if you saw her daily. She never makes the least complaint to me or utters a single word of explanation or reproach. But I know, said Mrs. Todgers, drawing in her breath, I know. Tom nodded sorrowfully. So do I. I fully believe, said Mrs. Todgers, taking her pocket handkerchief from the flat reticule, that nobody can tell one half of what that poor young creature has to undergo. But though she comes here constantly to ease her poor full heart without his knowing it, and saying, Mrs. Todgers, I am very low today, I think that I shall soon be dead, sits crying in my room until the fit is past. I know no more from her, and I believe, said Mrs. Todgers, putting back her handkerchief again, that she considers me a good friend, too. Mrs. Todgers might have said her best friend. Commercial gentlemen and gravy had tried Mrs. Todgers's temper. The main chance, it was such a very small one in her case, that she might have been excused for looking sharp after it, lest it should entirely vanish from her sight, had taken a firm hold on Mrs. Todgers's attention. But in some odd nook in Mrs. Todgers's breast, up a great many steps, and in a corner easy to be overlooked, there was a secret door with woman written on the spring, which, at a touch from Mercy's hand, had flown wide open and admitted her for shelter. When boarding-house accounts are balanced with all other ledgers, and the books of the recording angel are made up for ever, perhaps there may be seen an entry to thy credit, lean Mrs. Todgers, which shall make thee beautiful. She was growing beautiful so rapidly in Tom's eyes, for he saw that she was poor, and that this good had sprung up in her from among the sordid strivings of her life, that she might have been a very Venus in a minute more, if Miss Pecksniff had not entered with her friend. "'Mr. Thomas Pinch,' said Charity, performing the ceremony of introduction with evident pride. "'Mr. Model. Where's my sister?' "'Gone, Miss Pecksniff,' Mrs. Todgers answered. "'She had appointed to be home.' "'Ah,' said Charity, looking at Tom. "'Oh, dear me.' "'She's greatly altered since she's been another— "'Since she's been married, Mrs. Todgers,' observed Model. "'My dear Augustus,' said Miss Pecksniff, in a low voice, "'I verily believe you have said that fifty thousand times in my hearing. "'What a prose you are!' This was succeeded by some trifling love passages, which appeared to originate with, if not to be wholly carried on, by Miss Pecksniff. At any rate, Mr. Model was much slower in his responses than is customary with young lovers, and exhibited a lowness of spirits which was quite oppressive. He did not improve at all when Tom and he were in the streets, but sighed so dismally that it was dreadful to hear him. As a means of cheering him up, Tom told him that he wished him joy. Joy? cried Model. Ha, ha! What an extraordinary young man, thought Tom. The scorner has not set his seal upon you. You care what becomes of you, said Model. Tom admitted that it was a subject in which he certainly felt some interest. I don't, said Mr. Model. The elements may have me when they please. I'm ready. Tom inferred from these and other expressions of the same nature that he was jealous. Therefore he allowed him to take his own course, which was such a gloomy one that he felt a load removed from his mind when they parted company at the gate of Furnival's Inn. It was now a couple of hours past John Westlock's dinner-time, and he was walking up and down the room quite anxious for Tom's safety. The table was spread, the wine was carefully decanted, and the dinner smelt delicious. "'Why, Tom, old boy, where on earth have you been?' "'Your box is here. Get your boots off instantly and sit down.' "'I am sorry to say I can't stay, John,' replied Tom Pinch, who was breathless with the haste he had made in running up the stairs. "'Can't stay?' "'If you'll go on with your dinner,' said Tom, "'I'll tell you my reason the while. 
I mustn't eat myself, or I shall have no appetite for the chops. There are no chops here, my good fellow. No, but there are at Islington, said Tom. John Westlock was perfectly confounded by this reply, and vowed he would not touch a morsel until Tom had explained himself fully. So Tom sat down and told him all, to which he listened with the greatest interest. He knew Tom too well, and respected his delicacy too much, to ask him why he had taken these measures without communicating with him first. He quite concurred in the expediency of Tom's immediately returning to his sister, as he knew so little of the place in which he had left her, and good-humouredly proposed to ride back with him in a cab in which he might convey his box. Tom's proposition that he should sup with them that night he flatly rejected, but made an appointment with him for the morrow. "'And now, Tom,' he said, as they rode along, "'I have a question to ask you, to which I expect a manly and straightforward answer. "'Do you want any money? I am pretty sure you do.' "'I don't indeed,' said Tom. "'I believe you are deceiving me.' "'No. With many thanks to you, I am quite in earnest,' Tom replied. "'My sister has some money, and so have I. "'If I had nothing else, John, I have a five-pound note "'which that good creature, Mrs. Lupin, of the Dragon, "'handed up to me outside the coach, "'in a letter begging me to borrow it, "'and then drove off as hard as she could go. "'And a blessing on every dimple in her handsome face, say I,' cried John, "'though why you should give her the preference over me, I don't know. "'Never mind, I bide my time, Tom. "'And I hope you'll continue to bide it,' returned Tom gaily, "'for I owe you more already in a hundred other ways than I can ever hope to pay.' "'They parted at the door of Tom's new residence, "'John Westlock sitting in the cab and catching a glimpse of a blooming little busy creature "'darting out to kiss Tom and to help him with his box, "'would not have had the least objection to change places with him. "'Well, she was a cheerful little thing, and had a quaint, bright quietness about her that was infinitely pleasant.' Surely she was the best sauce for chops ever invented. The potatoes seemed to take a pleasure in sending up their grateful steam before her. The froth upon the pint of porter pouted to attract her notice. But it was all in vain. She saw nothing but Tom. Tom was the first and last thing in the world. As she sat opposite to Tom at supper, fingering one of Tom's pet tunes upon the tablecloth, and smiling in his face, he had never been so happy in his life. End of chapter 37「Chapter 38 of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens Chapter 38 Secret Service In walking from the city with his sentimental friend, Tom Pinch had looked into the face and brushed against the threadbare sleeve of Mr. Nadgett, man of mystery to the Anglo-Bengali Disinterested Loan and Life Assurance Company. Mr. Nadgett naturally passed away from Tom's remembrance as he passed out of his view, for he didn't know him and had never heard his name. As there are a vast number of people in the huge metropolis of England who rise up every morning not knowing where their heads will rest at night, so there are a multitude who, shooting arrows over houses as their daily business, never know on whom they fall. Mr. Nadgett might have passed Tom Pinch ten thousand times, might even have been quite familiar with his face, his name, pursuits, and character, yet never once have dreamed that Tom had any interest in any act or mystery of his. Tom might have done the like by him, of course, but the same private man, out of all the men alive, was in the mind of each at the same moment, was prominently connected, though in a different manner, with the day's adventures of both, and formed, when they passed each other in the street, the one absorbing topic of their thoughts. Why Tom had Jonas Chuzzlewit in his mind requires no explanation. Why Mr. Nadgett should have had Jonas Chuzzlewit in his is quite another thing. 
but somehow or other that amiable and worthy orphan had become a part of the mystery of Mr. Nadgett's existence. Mr. Nadgett took an interest in his lightest proceedings, and it never flagged or wavered. He watched him in and out of the assurance office, where he was now formally installed as a director. He dogged his footsteps in the streets. He stood listening when he talked. He sat in coffee-rooms, entering his name in the great pocket-book over and over again. He wrote letters to himself about him constantly, and when he found them in his pocket put them in the fire, with such distrust and caution that he would bend down to watch the crumpled tinder while it floated upwards, as if his mind misgave him, that the mystery it had contained might come out at the chimney-pot. And yet all this was quite a secret. Mr. Nadgett kept it to himself, and kept it close. Jonas had no more idea that Mr. Nadgett's eyes were fixed on him than he had that he was living under the daily inspection and report of a whole order of Jesuits. Indeed, Mr. Nadgett's eyes were seldom fixed on any other objects than the ground, the clock, or the fire. But every button on his coat might have been an eye. He saw so much. The secret manner of the man disarmed suspicion in this wise, suggesting not that he was watching any one, but that he thought some other man was watching him. He went about so stealthily, and kept himself so wrapped up in himself, that the whole object of his life appeared to be to avoid notice and preserve his own mystery. Jonas sometimes saw him in the street, hovering in the outer office, waiting at the door for the man who never came, or slinking off with his immovable face and drooping head, and the one beaver glove dangling before him. But he would as soon have thought of the cross upon the top of St. Paul's Cathedral taking note of what he did, or slowly winding a great net about his feet, as of Nadgett's being engaged in such an occupation. Mr. Nadgett made a mysterious change about this time in his mysterious life, for whereas he had until now been first seen every morning coming down Cornhill, so exactly like the Nadgett of the day before, as to occasion a popular belief that he never went to bed or took his clothes off, he was now first seen in Holborn, coming out of Kingsgate Street, and it was soon discovered that he actually went every morning to a barber's shop in that street to get shaved, and that the barber's name was Sweetlepipe. He seemed to make appointments with the man who never came to meet him at this barber's, for he would frequently take long spells of waiting in the shop, and would ask for pen and ink, and pull out his pocket-book, and be very busy over it for an hour at a time. Mrs. Gamp and Mr. Sweetlepipe had many deep discoursings on the subject of this mysterious customer, but they usually agreed that he had speculated too much and was keeping out of the way. He must have appointed the man, who never kept his word, to meet him at another new place, too, for one day he was found, for the first time, by the waiter at the morning coach house, the house of call for undertakers down in the city there, making figures with a pipe stem in the sawdust of a clean spittoon, and declining to call for anything on the ground of expecting a gentleman presently. As the gentleman was not honourable enough to keep his engagement, he came again next day, with his pocket-book in such a state of distension, that he was regarded in the bar as a man of large property. After that he repeated his visits every day, and had so much writing to do that he made nothing of emptying a capacious leaden inkstand in two sittings. Although he never talked much, still by being there among the regular customers he made their acquaintance and in course of time became quite intimate with Mr. Tacker, Mr. Mould's foreman, and even with Mr. Mould himself, who openly said he was a long-headed man, a dry one, a salt fish, a deep file, a rasper, and made him the subject of many other flattering encomiums. At the same time, too, he told the people at the assurance office, in his own mysterious way, that there was something wrong, secretly wrong, of course, in his liver, and that he feared he must put himself under the doctor's hands. He was delivered over to Jobling upon this representation, and though Jobling could not find out where his liver was wrong, wrong, Mr. Nadgett said it was, observing that it was his own liver, and he hoped he ought to know. Accordingly, he became Mr. Jobling's patient, and detailing his symptoms in his slow and secret way, was in and out of that gentleman's room a dozen times a day. As he pursued all these occupations at once, and all steadily, 
and all secretly, and never slackened in his watchfulness of everything that Mr. Jonas said and did, and left unsaid and undone, it is not improbable that they were, secretly, essential parts of some great scheme which Mr. Nadgett had on foot. It was on the morning of this very day on which so much had happened to Tom Pinch that Nadgett suddenly appeared before Mr. Montague's house in Pall Mall. He always made his appearance as if he had at that moment come up a trap when the clocks were striking nine. He rang the bell in a covert, underhanded way as though it were a treasonable act and passed in at the door the moment it was opened wide enough to receive his body. That done, he shut it immediately with his own hands. Mr. Bailey, taking up his name without delay, returned with a request that he would follow him into his master's chamber. The chairman of the Anglo-Bengali Disinterested Loan and Life Assurance Board was dressing, and received him as a business person who was often backwards and forwards, and was received at all times for his business sake. "'Well, Mr. Nadgett?' Mr. Nadgett put his hat upon the ground and coughed. The boy, having withdrawn and shut the door, he went to it softly, examined the handle, and returned to within a pace or two of the chair in which Mr. Montague sat. "'Any news, Mr. Nadgett?' "'I think we have some news at last, sir.' "'I am happy to hear it. I began to fear you were off the scent, Mr. Nadgett.' "'No, sir. It grows cold occasionally. It will sometimes. We can't help that. "'You are truth itself, Mr. Nadgett. Do you report a great success?' "'That depends upon your judgment and construction of it,' was his answer, as he put on his spectacles. "'What do you think of it yourself? Have you pleased yourself?' Mr. Nadgett rubbed his hands slowly, stroked his chin, looked round the room, and said, "'Yes, yes, I think it's a good case. I am disposed to think it's a good case. Will you go into it at once?' "'By all means.' Mr. Nadgett picked out a certain chair from among the rest— and having planted it in a particular spot as carefully as if he had been going to vault over it, placed another chair in front of it, leaving room for his own legs between them. He then sat down in chair number two, and laid his pocket-book very carefully on chair number one. He then untied the pocket-book, and hung the string over the back of chair number one. He then drew both the chairs a little nearer Mr. Montague, and opening the pocket-book spread out its contents. Finally, he selected a certain memorandum from the rest, and held it out to his employer, who during the whole of these preliminary ceremonies had been making violent efforts to conceal his impatience. "'I wish you wouldn't be so fond of making notes, my excellent friend,' said Tig Montague, with a ghastly smile. "'I wish you would consent to give me their purport by word of mouth.' "'I don't like word of mouth,' said Mr. Nadgett gravely. "'We never know who's listening.' Mr. Montague was going to retort, when Nadgett handed him the paper, and said, with quiet exultation in his tone, "'We'll begin at the beginning, and take that one first, if you please, sir.' The chairman cast his eyes upon it coldly, and with a smile which did not render any great homage to the slow and methodical habits of his spy. But he had not read half a dozen lines, when the expression of his face began to change— and before he had finished a perusal of the paper, it was full of grave and serious attention. "'Number two, said Mr. Nadgett, handing him another, and receiving back the first. "'Read number two, sir, if you please. There is more interest as you go on.' Tig Montague leaned backward in his chair, and cast upon his emissary such a look of vacant wonder, not unmingled with alarm, that Mr. Nadgett considered it necessary to repeat the request he had already twice preferred, with a view to recalling his attention to the point in hand. Profiting by the hint, Mr. Montague went on with number two, and afterwards with numbers three and four and five, and so on. These documents were all in Mr. Nadgett's writing, and were apparently a series of memoranda, jotted down from time to time upon the backs of old letters or any scrap of paper that came first to hand. Loose, straggling scrawls they were, and a very uninviting exterior, but they had weighty purpose in them, if the chairman's face were any index to the character of their contents. The progress of Mr. Nadgett's secret satisfaction, arising out of the effect they made, kept pace with the emotions of the reader. 
At first Mr. Nadgett sat with his spectacles low down upon his nose, looking over them at his employer and nervously rubbing his hands. After a little while he changed his posture in his chair for one of greater ease, and leisurely perused the next document he held ready, as if an occasional glance at his employer's face were now enough, and all occasion for anxiety or doubt were gone. And finally he rose and looked out of the window, where he stood with a triumphant air, until Tig Montague had finished. "'And this is the last, Mr. Nadgett?' said that gentleman, drawing a long breath. "'That, sir, is the last.' "'You are a wonderful man, Mr. Nadgett. "'I think it is a pretty good case,' he returned, as he gathered up his papers. "'It costs some trouble, sir. "'The trouble shall be well rewarded, Mr. Nadgett. "'Nadgett bowed. "'There is a deeper impression of somebody's hoof here than I had expected, Mr. Nadgett. "'I may congratulate myself upon your being such a good hand at a secret. "'Oh, nothing has an interest to me that's not a secret.' "'replied Nadgett, as he tied the string about his pocket-book and put it up. "'It always takes away any pleasure I may have had in this inquiry, "'even to make it known to you.' "'A most invaluable constitution,' Tig retorted. "'A great gift for a gentleman employed as you are, Mr. Nadgett. "'Much better than discretion, "'though you possess that quality also in an eminent degree. "'I think I heard a double knock. "'Will you put your head out of window and tell me whether there is anybody at the door?' Mr. Nadgett softly raised the sash and peered out from the very corner, as a man might who was looking down into a street from whence a brisk discharge of musketry might be expected at any moment. Drawing in his head with equal caution, he observed, not altering his voice or manner, Mr. Jonas Chuzzlewit. "'I thought so,' Tig retorted. "'Shall I go? I think you had better. Stay, though, no, remain here, Mr. Nadgett, if you please.' It was remarkable how pale and flurried he had become in an instant. There was nothing to account for it. His eye had fallen on his razors, but what of them? Mr. Chuzzlewit was announced. Show him up directly. Nadgett, don't you leave us alone together. Mind you don't now. By the Lord, he added in a whisper to himself, we don't know what may happen. Saying this, he hurriedly took up a couple of hairbrushes and began to exercise them on his own head, as if his toilet had not been interrupted. Mr. Nadgett withdrew to the stove, in which there was a small fire for the convenience of heating curling irons, and taking advantage of so favorable an opportunity for drying his pocket-handkerchief, produced it without loss of time. There he stood during the whole interview, holding it before the bars, and sometimes, but not often, glancing over his shoulder. "'My dear Chuzzlewit,' cried Montague, as Jonas entered, "'you rise with the lark. "'Though you go to bed with the nightingale, you rise with the lark. "'You have superhuman energy, my dear Chuzzlewit.' "'Ecod!' said Jonas, with an air of languor and ill-humour, as he took a chair. "'I should be very glad not to get up with the lark, if I could help it, "'but I am a light sleeper, and it's better to be up than lying awake, "'counting the dismal old church clocks in bed.' "'A light sleeper!' cried his friend. "'Now what is a light sleeper? "'I often hear the expression, "'but upon my life I have not the least conception "'what a light sleeper is.' "'Hello!' said Jonas. "'Who's that?' "'Oh, old what's-his-name, looking, as usual, "'as if he wanted to skulk up the chimney. "'Ha, <laughs> ha! "'I have no doubt he does. "'Well, he's not wanted here, I suppose,' said Jonas. "'He may go, mayn't he?' "'Oh, let him stay, let him stay,' said Tig. "'He's a mere piece of furniture. "'He has been making his report and is waiting for further orders. "'He has been told,' said Tig, raising his voice, "'not to lose sight of certain friends of ours, "'or to think that he has done with them by any means. "'He understands his business.' "'He need,' replied Jonas. "'For of all the precious old dummies in appearance that I ever saw, "'he's about the worst. "'He's afraid of me, I think.' "'It's my belief,' said Tig, "'that you are poison to him.' "'Nadgett, give me that towel.' He had as little occasion for a towel as Jonas had for a start, but Nadgett brought it quickly, and having lingered for a moment, fell back upon his old post by the fire. "'You see, my dear fellow,' resumed Tig, "'you are too—what's the matter with your lips? How white they are!' "'I took some vinegar just now,' said Jonas. "'I had oysters for my breakfast.' 
"'Where are they white?' he added, muttering an oath and rubbing them upon his handkerchief. "'I don't believe they are white.' "'Now I look again, they are not,' replied his friend. "'They are coming right again.' "'Say what you were going to say,' cried Jonas angrily, "'and let my face be. "'As long as I can show my teeth when I want to, "'and I can do that pretty well, "'the colour of my lips is not material.' "'Quite true,' said Tigg. "'I was only going to say that you are too quick and active for our friend. "'He is too shy to cope with such a man as you, "'but does his duty well. "'Oh, very well. "'But what is a light sleeper?' "'Hang a light sleeper!' exclaimed Jonas pettishly. "'No, no,' interrupted Tig. "'No, we'll not do that.' "'A light sleeper ain't a heavy one,' said Jonas, in his sulky way. "'Don't sleep much, and don't sleep well, and don't sleep sound.' "'And dreams,' said Tig, "'and cries out in an ugly manner, "'and when the candle burns down in the night is in an agony, "'and all that sort of thing. I see.' "'They were silent for a little time. "'Then Jonas spoke.' "'Now we've done with child's talk. I want to have a word with you. "'I want to have a word with you before we meet up yonder to-day. "'I am not satisfied with the state of affairs.' "'Not satisfied?' cried Tigg. "'The money comes in well.' "'The money comes in well enough,' retorted Jonas. "'But it don't come out well enough. "'It can't be got at easily enough. "'I haven't sufficient power. It is all in your hands.' "'Ecod, what with one of your by-laws, and another of your by-laws, "'and your votes in this capacity, and your votes in that capacity, "'and your official rights, and your individual rights, "'and other people's rights, who are only you again, "'there are no rights left for me. "'Everybody else's rights are my wrongs. "'What's the use of my having a voice if it's always drowned? "'I might as well be dumb, and it would be much less aggravating. "'I'm not a-going to stand that, you know.' "'No.' "'said Tig, in an insinuating tone. "'No,' returned Jonas, "'I'm not indeed. "'I'll play old Gooseberry with the office "'and make you glad to buy me out at a good high figure "'if you try any of your tricks with me.' "'I give you my honour. Montague began. "'Oh, confound your honour! interrupted Jonas, "'who became more coarse and quarrelsome as the other remonstrated, "'which may have been a part of Mr. Montague's intention. "'I want a little more control over the money.' "'You may have all the honour, if you like. "'I'll never bring you to book for that. "'But I'm not a-going to stand it as it is now. "'If you should take it into your honourable head "'to go abroad with the bank, "'I don't see much to prevent you. "'Well, that won't do. "'I've had some very good dinners here, "'but they'd come too dear on such terms, "'and therefore that won't do. "'I am unfortunate to find you in this humour, said Tig, "'with a remarkable kind of smile. "'For I was going to propose to you, for your own advantage, "'solely for your own advantage, that you should venture a little more with us.' "'Was you by G? said Jonas, with a short laugh. "'Yes, and to suggest,' pursued Montague, "'that surely you have friends, indeed I know you have, "'who would answer our purpose admirably, and whom we should be delighted to receive.' "'How kind of you!' "'You'd be delighted to receive him, would you?' said Jonas, bantering. "'I give you my sacred honour, quite transported, as your friends observe.' "'Exactly,' said Jonas, "'as my friends, of course. "'You'll be very much delighted when you get him, I have no doubt. "'And it'll be all to my advantage, won't it?' "'It will be very much to your advantage,' answered Montague, "'poising a brush in each hand and looking steadily upon him. "'It will be very much to your advantage, I assure you.' "'And you can tell me how?' said Jonas. "'Can't you?' "'Shall I tell you how?' returned the other. "'I think you had better,' said Jonas. "'Strange things have been done in the assurance way before now, "'by strange sorts of men, and I mean to take care of myself.' "'Chuzzlewit,' replied Montague, "'leaning forward with his arms upon his knees "'and looking full into his face. "'Strange things have been done and are done every day, "'not only in our way, but in a variety of other ways.' "'and no one suspects them. "'But ours, as you say, my good friend, is a strange way, "'and we strangely happen sometimes to come into the knowledge of very strange events.' "'He beckoned to Jonas to bring his chair nearer, "'and looking slightly round, as if to remind him of the presence of Nadget, "'whispered in his ear, "'From red to white, from white to red again, from red to yellow, "'then to a cold, dull, awful, sweat-bedabbled blue.' In that short whisper all these changes fell upon the face of Jonas Chuzzlewit, and when at last he lay his hand upon the whisperer's mouth, appalled, 
lest any syllable of what he said should reach the ears of the third person present, it was as bloodless and as heavy as the hand of death. He drew his chair away and sat, a spectacle of terror, misery, and rage. He was afraid to speak, or look, or move, or sit still. Abject, crouching, and miserable, he was a greater degradation to the form he bore than if he had been a loathsome wound from head to heel. His companion leisurely resumed his dressing and completed it, glancing sometimes with a smile at the transformation he had effected, but never speaking once. "'You'll not object,' he said, when he was quite equipped, "'to venture further with us, Chuzzlewit, my friend?' His pale lips faintly stammered out a no. "'Well said. That's like yourself. Do you know I was thinking yesterday that your father-in-law, relying on your advice as a man of great sagacity and money manners, as no doubt you are, would join us if the thing were well presented to him? He has money. Yes, he has money. "'Shall I leave Mr. Pecksniff to you? Will you undertake for Mr. Pecksniff?' "'I'll try. I'll do my best.' "'A thousand thanks,' replied the other, clapping him upon the shoulder. "'Shall we walk downstairs? Mr. Nadgett, follow us, if you please.' They went down in that order. Whatever Jonas felt in reference to Montague, whatever sense he had of being caged and barred and trapped, and having fallen down into a pit of deepest ruin, whatever thoughts came crowding on his mind even at that early time, of one terrible chance of escape— of one red glimmer in the sky of blackness, he no more thought that the slinking figure half a dozen stairs behind him was his pursuing fate than that the other figure at his side was his good angel. End of chapter 38《Chapter Thirty Nine Part One of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Nine Containing Some Further Particulars of the Domestic Economy of the Pinches, with Strange News from the City. Narrowly concerning Tom. Part One. Pleasant little Ruth, cheerful, tidy, bustling, quiet little Ruth. No doll's house ever yielded greater delight to its young mistress than little Ruth derived from her glorious dominion over the triangular parlor and the two small bedrooms. To be Tom's housekeeper, what dignity! Housekeeping, upon the commonest terms, associated itself with elevated responsibilities of all sorts and kinds, but housekeeping for Tom implied the utmost complication of grave trusts and mighty charges. Well might she take the keys out of the little chiffonier which held the tea and sugar, and out of the two little damp cupboards down by the fireplace, where the very black beetles got mouldy, and had the shine taken out of their backs by envious mildew, and jingle them upon a ring before Tom's eyes when he came down to breakfast. Well might she, laughing musically, put them up in that blessed little pocket of hers with a merry pride, for it was such a grand novelty to be mistress of anything, that if she had been the most relentless and despotic of all little housekeepers, she might have pleaded just that much for her excuse, and have been honorably acquitted. So far from being despotic, however, there was a coyness about her very way of pouring out the tea, which Tom quite reveled in, and when she asked him what he would like to have for dinner, and faltered out chops as a reasonably good suggestion after their last night's successful supper, Tom grew quite facetious and rallied her desperately. "'I don't know, Tom,' said his sister, blushing. I am not quite confident, but I think I could make a beefsteak pudding if I tried, Tom. In the whole catalogue of cookery there is nothing I should like so much as a beefsteak pudding, cried Tom, slapping his leg to give the greater force to this reply. Yes, dear, that's excellent. But if it should happen not to come quite right the first time, his sister faltered, if it should happen not to be a pudding exactly, but should turn out a stew or a soup or something of that sort— "'You'll not be vexed, Tom, will you?' "'The serious way in which she looked at Tom, "'the way in which Tom looked at her, 
and the way in which she gradually broke into a merry laugh at her own expense would have enchanted you. Why, said Tom, this is capital. It gives us a new and quite an uncommon interest in the dinner. We put into a lottery for a beefsteak pudding, and it is impossible to say what we may get. We may make some wonderful discovery, perhaps, and produce such a dish as never was known before. "'I shall not be at all surprised if we do, Tom,' returned his sister, still laughing merrily, "'or if it should prove to be such a dish as we shall not feel very anxious to produce again. "'But the meat must come out of the saucepan at last, somehow or other, you know. "'We can't cook it into nothing at all. That's a great comfort. "'So if you like to venture, I will.' "'I have not the least doubt,' rejoined Tom, "'that it will come out an excellent pudding, "'or at all events I am sure that I shall think it so.' "'There is naturally something so handy and brisk about you, Ruth, "'that if you said you could make a bowl of faultless turtle soup, I should believe you.' "'And Tom was right. She was precisely that sort of person. "'Nobody ought to have been able to resist her coaxing manner, "'and nobody had any business to try. "'Yet she never seemed to know it was her manner at all. "'That was the best of it.' "'Well, she washed up the breakfast cups, chatting away the whole time, "'and telling Tom all sorts of anecdotes about the brass and copper founder, "'put everything in its place, made the room as neat as herself. "'You must not suppose its shape was half as neat as hers, though, "'or anything like it. "'And brushed Tom's old hat round and round and round again "'until it was as sleek as Mr. Pecksniff. "'Then she discovered all in a moment "'that Tom's shirt-collar was frayed at the edge, "'and flying upstairs for a needle and thread "'came flying down again with her thimble on, "'and set it right with wonderful expertness, "'never once sticking the needle into his face,' "'although she was humming his pet tune from first to last "'and beating time with the fingers of her left hand upon his neckcloth. "'She had no sooner done this than off she was again, "'and there she stood once more, as brisk and busy as a bee, "'tying that compact little chin of hers into an equally compact little bonnet, "'intent on bustling out to the butcher's without a minute's loss of time, "'and inviting Tom to come and see the steak cut with his own eyes. "'As to Tom, he was ready to go anywhere.' So off they trotted, arm in arm, as nimbly as you please, saying to each other what a quiet street it was to lodge in, and how very cheap, and what an airy situation. To see the butcher slap the steak before he laid it on the block, and give his knife a sharpening, was to forget breakfast instantly. It was agreeable, too, it really was, to see him cut it off, so smooth and juicy. There was nothing savage in the act, although the knife was large and keen. It was a piece of art, high art. There was delicacy of touch, clearness of tone, skillful handling of the subject, fine shading. It was the triumph of mind over matter, quite. Perhaps the greenest cabbage leaf ever grown in a garden was wrapped about this steak before it was delivered over to Tom, but the butcher had a sentiment for his business and knew how to refine upon it. When he saw Tom putting the cabbage leaf into his pocket awkwardly, he begged to be allowed to do it for him. For meat, he said with some emotion, must be humoured, not drove. Back they went to the lodgings again, after they had bought some eggs and flour and such small matters, and Tom sat gravely down to write at one end of the parlour table, while Ruth prepared to make the pudding at the other end. For there was nobody in the house but an old woman— the landlord being a mysterious sort of man who went out early in the morning and was scarcely ever seen, and saving in mere household drudgery, they waited on themselves. "'What are you writing, Tom?' inquired his sister, laying her hand upon his shoulder. "'Why, you see, my dear,' said Tom, leaning back in his chair and looking up in her face, "'I am very anxious, of course, to obtain some suitable employment.' "'and before Mr. Westlock comes this afternoon, "'I think I may as well prepare a little description of myself and my qualifications, "'such as he could show to any friend of his. "'You had better do the same for me, Tom, also,' said his sister, casting down her eyes. "'I should dearly like to keep house for you and take care of you always, Tom, "'but we are not rich enough for that.' "'We are not rich,' returned Tom, certainly, "'and we may be much poorer, but we will not part if we can help it. "'No, no.' "'We will make up our minds, Ruth, that unless we are so very unfortunate "'as to render me quite sure that you would be better off away from me than with me, "'we will battle it out together. "'I am certain we shall be happier if we can battle it out together. "'Don't you think we shall?' "'Think, Tom. Oh, tut, tut! 
interposed Tom tenderly. "'You mustn't cry.' "'No, no, I won't, Tom. But you can't afford it, dear. You can't, indeed.' "'We don't know that,' said Tom. "'How are we to know that, yet a while, and without trying? "'Lord bless my soul!' Tom's energy became quite grand. "'There is no knowing what may happen if we try hard, "'and I am sure we can live contentedly upon a very little, "'if we can only get it. "'Yes, that I am sure we can, Tom.' "'Why, then,' said Tom, "'we must try for it. "'My friend John Westlock is a capital fellow, "'and very shrewd and intelligent. "'I'll take his advice.' "'We'll talk it over with him, both of us together. "'You'll like John very much when you come to know him, I am certain. "'Don't cry, don't cry. "'You make a beefsteak pudding indeed,' said Tom, giving her a gentle push. "'Well, you haven't boldness enough for a dumpling. "'You will call it a pudding, Tom. Mind, I told you not. "'I may as well call it that, till it proves to be something else,' said Tom. "'Oh, you are going to work in earnest, are you?' Ay, ay, that she was, and in such pleasant earnest, moreover, that Tom's attention wandered from his writing every moment. First she tripped downstairs into the kitchen for the flour, then for the pie-board, then for the eggs, then for the butter, then for a jug of water, then for the rolling-pin, then for a pudding-basin, then for the pepper, then for the salt, making a separate journey for everything and laughing every time she started off afresh. When all the materials were collected, she was horrified to find she had no apron on, and so ran upstairs, by way of variety, to fetch it. She didn't put it on upstairs, but came dancing down with it in her hand, and being one of those little women to whom an apron is a most becoming little vanity, it took an immense time to arrange, having to be carefully smoothed down beneath, oh, heavens, what a wicked little stomacher, and to be gathered up into little plates by the strings before it could be tied, and to be tapped, rebuked, and wheedled at the pockets before it would set right. Which at last it did, and when it did, but never mind, this is a sober chronicle. And then there were her cuffs to be tucked up, for fear of flour, and she had a little ring to pull off her finger, which wouldn't come off, foolish little ring. And during the whole of these preparations she looked demurely every now and then at Tom from under her dark eyelashes, as if they were all a part of the pudding and indispensable to its composition. For the life and soul of him Tom could get no further in his writing than a respectable young man aged thirty-five, and this, notwithstanding the show she made of being supernaturally quiet and going about on tiptoe lest she should disturb him, which only served as an additional means of distracting his attention and keeping it upon her. "'Tom,' she said at last, in high glee, "'Tom!' "'What now?' said Tom, repeating to himself, aged thirty-five. "'Will you look here a moment, please?' "'As if he hadn't been looking all the time. "'I am going to begin, Tom. "'Don't you wonder why I butter the inside of the basin?' said his busy little sister. "'Not more than you do, I dare say,' replied Tom, laughing, "'for I believe you don't know anything about it. "'What an infidel you are, Tom! "'How else do you think it would turn out easily when it was done?' "'for a civil engineer and land surveyor not to know that. "'My goodness, Tom!' "'It was wholly out of the question to try to write. "'Tom lined out, respectable young man, aged thirty-five, "'and sat looking on, pen in hand, "'with one of the most loving smiles imaginable. "'Such a busy little woman as she was, "'so full of self-importance and trying so hard not to smile "'or seem uncertain about anything.' It was a perfect treat to Tom to see her with her brows knit and her rosy lips pursed up, kneading away at the crust, rolling it out, cutting it up into strips, lining the basin with it, shaving it off fine round the rim, chopping up the steak into small pieces, raining down pepper and salt upon them, packing them into the basin, pouring in cold water for gravy, and never venturing to steal a look in his direction lest her gravity should be disturbed. Until at last the basin, being quite full and only wanting the top crust, she clapped her hands, all covered with paste and flour, at Tom, and burst out heartily into such a charming little laugh of triumph that the pudding need have had no other seasoning to commend it to the taste of any reasonable man on earth. "'Where's the pudding?' said Tom, for he was cutting his jokes, Tom was. "'Where?' she answered, holding it up with both hands. "'Look at it.' "'That a pudding?' said Tom." 
"'It will be, you stupid fellow, when it's covered in,' returned his sister, Tom still pretending to look incredulous. She gave him a tap on the head with the rolling-pin, and still laughing merrily had returned to the composition of the top crust, when she started and turned very red. Tom started, too, for following her eyes he saw John Westlock in the room. "'Why, oh, my goodness, John, how did you come in?' "'I beg pardon,' said John, "'your sister's pardon especially. "'But I met an old lady at the street door who requested me to enter here, "'and as you didn't hear me knock and the door was open, I made bold to do so.' "'I hardly know,' said John, with a smile, "'why any of us should be disconcerted at my having accidentally intruded upon such an agreeable domestic occupation, "'so very agreeably and skilfully pursued. "'But I must confess that I am, Tom. "'Will you kindly come to my relief?' "'Mr. John Westlock,' said Tom, "'my sister.' "'I hope that as the sister of so old a friend,' said John, laughing, "'you will have the goodness to detach your first impressions of me from my unfortunate entrance. "'My sister is not indisposed, perhaps, to say the same to you on her own behalf,' retorted Tom. "'John said, of course, that this was quite unnecessary, for he had been transfixed in silent admiration, "'and he held out his hand to Miss Pinch.' who couldn't take it, however, by reason of the flour and paste upon her own. This, which might seem calculated to increase the general confusion and render matters worse, had, in reality, the best effect in the world, for neither of them could help laughing, and so they both found themselves on easy terms immediately. "'I am delighted to see you,' said Tom. "'Sit down.' "'I can only think of sitting down on one condition,' returned his friend, "'and that is that your sister goes on with the pudding, as if you were still alone.' "'That I am sure she will,' said Tom, "'on one other condition, and that is that you stay and help us to eat it.' Poor little Ruth was seized with a palpitation of the heart when Tom committed this appalling indiscretion, for she felt that if the dish turned out a failure she never would be able to hold up her head before John Westlock again. Quite unconscious of her state of mind, John accepted the invitation with all imaginable heartiness, and after a little more pleasantry concerning this same pudding and the tremendous expectations he made believe to entertain of it, she blushingly resumed her occupation, and he took a chair. "'I am here much earlier than I intended, Tom, but I will tell you what brings me, and I think I can answer for your being glad to hear it. Is that anything you wish to show me?' "'Oh, dear, no!' cried Tom, who had forgotten the blotted scrap of paper in his hand, until this inquiry brought it to his recollection. "'A respectable young man, aged thirty-five. The beginning of a description of myself, that's all.' "'I don't think you will have occasion to finish it, Tom. But how is it you never told me you had friends in London?' Tom looked at his sister with all his might, and certainly his sister looked with all her might at him. "'Friends in London?' echoed Tom. "'Ah!' said Westlock, to be sure. "'Have you any friends in London, Ruth, my dear?' asked Tom. "'No, Tom. "'I am very happy to hear that I have,' said Tom, "'but it's news to me. I never knew it. "'They must be capital people to keep a secret, John.' "'You shall judge for yourself,' returned the other. "'Seriously, Tom, here is the plain state of the case. "'As I was sitting at breakfast this morning, "'there comes a knock at my door.' "'on which you cried out very loud, "'Come in!' suggested Tom. "'So I did, and the person who knocked, "'not being a respectable young man aged thirty-five from the country, "'came in when he was invited, "'instead of standing gaping and staring about him on the landing. "'Well, when he came in, I found he was a stranger, "'a grave, business-like, sedate-looking stranger. "'Mr. Westlock,' said he. "'That is my name,' said I. "'The favour of a few words with you,' said he. "'Pray be seated, sir,' said I. Here John stopped for an instant to glance towards the table, where Tom's sister, listening attentively, was still busy with the basin, which by this time made a noble appearance. Then he resumed. "'The pudding having taken a chair, Tom—' "'What?' cried Tom. "'Having taken a chair, you said a pudding.' "'No, no,' replied John, colouring rather. "'A chair. "'The idea of a stranger coming into my rooms at half-past eight o'clock in the morning and taking a pudding. "'Having taken a chair, Tom, a chair, amazed me by opening the conversation thus. "'I believe you are acquainted, sir, with Mr. Thomas Pinch.' "'No!' cried Tom. 
His very words, I assure you. I told him I was. Did I know where you were at present residing? Yes. In London? Yes. He had casually heard, in a roundabout way, that you had left your situation with Mr. Pecksniff. Was that the fact? Yes, it was. Did you want another? Yes, you did. Certainly, said Tom, nodding his head. Just what I impressed upon him. You may rest assured that I set that point beyond the possibility of any mistake, and gave him distinctly to understand that he might make up his mind about it. Very well. Then, said he, I think I can accommodate him. Tom's sister stopped short. Lord bless me, cried Tom. Ruth, my dear, think I can accommodate him. Of course, I begged him, pursued John Westlock, glancing at Tom's sister, who was not less eager in her interest than Tom himself, to proceed, and said that I would undertake to see you immediately. He replied that he had very little to say, being a man of few words, but such as it was, it was to the purpose, and so, indeed, it turned out, for he immediately went on to tell me that a friend of his was in want of a kind of secretary and librarian, and that although the salary was small, being only a hundred pounds a year, with neither board nor lodging, still the duties were not heavy, and there the post was, vacant and ready for your acceptance. "'Good gracious me!' cried Tom. "'A hundred pounds a year! My dear John! Ruth, my love, a hundred pounds a year!' "'But the strangest part of the story,' resumed John Westlock, laying his hand on Tom's wrist, to bespeak his attention and repress his ecstasies for the moment, "'the strangest part of the story, Miss Pinch, is this. I don't know this man from Adam. Neither does this man know Tom.' "'He can't,' said Tom, in great perplexity. "'If he's a Londoner, I don't know anyone in London.' "'And on my observing,' John resumed, still keeping his hand upon Tom's wrist, "'that I had no doubt he would excuse the freedom I took in inquiring who directed him to me, "'how he came to know of the change which had taken place in my friend's position, "'and how he came to be acquainted with my friend's peculiar fitness for such an office as he had described,' He dryly said that he was not at liberty to enter into any explanations. "'Not at liberty to enter into any explanations,' repeated Tom, drawing a long breath. "'I must be perfectly aware,' he said, John added, "'that to any person who had ever been in Mr. Pecksniff's neighbourhood, Mr. Thomas Pinch and his acquirements were as well known as the church steeple or the blue dragon.' "'The blue dragon,' repeated Tom, staring alternately at his friend and his sister." "'Aye, think of that. He spoke as familiarly of the Blue Dragon, I give you my word, as if he had been Mark Tapley. I opened my eyes, I can tell you, when he did so, but I could not fancy I had ever seen the man before, although he said with a smile, "'You know the Blue Dragon, Mr. Westlock. You kept it up there once or twice yourself.' "'Kept it up there. So I did. You remember, Tom?' Tom nodded with great significance, and, falling into a state of deeper perplexity than before, observed that this was the most unaccountable and extraordinary circumstance he had ever heard of in his life. Unaccountable, his friend repeated. I became afraid of the man. Though it was broad day and bright sunshine, I was positively afraid of him. I declare I half suspected him to be a supernatural visitor and not a mortal, until he took out a commonplace description of pocket-book and handed me this card. "'Mr. Phipps,' said Tom, reading it aloud. "'Austin Friars.' "'Austin Friars sounds ghostly, John.' "'Phipps don't, I think,' was John's reply. "'But there he lives, Tom, and there he expects us to call this morning. "'And now you know as much of this strange incident as I do, upon my honour. "'Tom's face, between his exultation in the hundred pounds a year "'and his wonder at this narration, was only to be equalled by the face of his sister, on which there sat the very best expression of blooming surprise that any painter could have wished to see. What the beefsteak pudding would have come to, if it had not been by this time finished, astrology itself could hardly determine. "'Tom,' said Ruth, after a little hesitation, "'perhaps Mr. Westlock, in his friendship for you, knows more of this than he chooses to tell.' "'No, indeed,' cried John eagerly. "'It is not so, I assure you. I wish it were. "'I cannot take credit to myself, Miss Pinch, for any such thing. "'All that I know, or so far as I can judge am likely to know, I have told you.' "'Couldn't you know more if you thought proper?' said Ruth, "'scraping the pie-board industriously. 
"'No,' retorted John. "'Indeed, no. "'It is very ungenerous in you to be so suspicious of me "'when I repose implicit faith in you. "'I have unbounded confidence in the pudding, Miss Pinch.' "'She laughed at this, but they soon got back into a serious vein "'and discussed the subject with profound gravity. "'Whatever else was obscure in the business, "'it appeared to be quite plain "'that Tom was offered a salary of one hundred pounds a year, "'and this, being the main point, "'the surrounding obscurity rather set it off than otherwise. "'End of chapter 39, part 1「Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit」by Charles Dickens Chapter 39, Part 2 Tom, being in a great flutter, wished to start for Austin Friars instantly but they waited nearly an hour, by John's advice, before they departed. Tom made himself as spruce as he could before leaving home, and when John Westlock, through the half-opened parlour door, had glimpses of that brave little sister brushing the collar of his coat in the passage, taking up loose stitches in his gloves, and hovering lightly about and about him, touching him up here and there in the height of her quaint little old-fashioned tidiness, he called to mind the fancy portraits of her on the wall of the Pecksniffian workroom, and decided with uncommon indignation that they were gross libels, and not half pretty enough, though, as hath been mentioned in its place, the artists always made those sketches beautiful, and he had drawn at least a score of them with his own hands. "'Tom,' he said as they were walking along, "'I begin to think you must be somebody's son.' "'I suppose I am.' "'Tom answered in his quiet way. "'But I mean somebody's of consequence.' "'Bless your heart,' replied Tom. "'My poor father was of no consequence, nor my mother either. "'You remember them perfectly, then?' "'Remember them? Oh, dear, yes. "'My poor mother was the last. "'She died when Ruth was a mere baby, "'and then we both became a charge upon the savings "'of that good old grandmother I used to tell you of. "'You remember?' "'Oh, there's nothing romantic in our history, John.' "'Very well,' said John, in quiet despair. "'Then there is no way of accounting for my visitor of this morning, "'so we'll not try, Tom.' "'They did try, notwithstanding, "'and never left off trying until they got to Austin Friars, "'where, in a very dark passage on the first floor, "'oddly situated at the back of a house across some leads,' They found a little blear-eyed glass door up in one corner, with Mr. Phipps painted on it, in characters which were meant to be transparent. There was also a wicked old sideboard hiding in the gloom hard by, meditating designs upon the ribs of visitors, and an old mat worn into lattice-work, which, being useless as a mat, even if anybody could have seen it, which was impossible, had for many years directed its industry into another channel, and regularly tripped up every one of Mr. Phipps's clients. Mr. Phipps, hearing a violent concussion between a human hat and his office door, was apprised, by the usual means of communication, that somebody had come to call upon him, and giving that somebody admission, observed that it was rather dark. "'Dark, indeed,' John whispered in Tom Pinch's ear. "'Not a bad place to dispose of a countryman in, I should think, Tom.' Tom had been already turning over in his mind the possibility of their having been tempted into that region to furnish forth a pie, but the sight of Mr. Phipps, who was small and spare and looked peaceable, and wore black shorts and powder, dispelled his doubts. "'Walk in,' said Mr. Phipps. They walked in. In a mighty yellow jaundiced little office Mr. Phipps had of it, with a great black sprawling splash upon the floor in one corner, as if some old clerk had cut his throat there years ago, and had let out ink instead of blood. "'I have brought my friend Mr. Pinch, sir,' said John Westlock. "'Be pleased to sit,' said Mr. Phipps. They occupied the two chairs, and Mr. Phipps took the office stool from the stuffing whereof he drew forth a piece of horsehair of immense length, 
which he put into his mouth with a great appearance of appetite. He looked at Tom Pinch curiously, but with an entire freedom from any such expression as could be reasonably construed into an unusual display of interest. After a short silence, during which Mr. Phipps was so perfectly unembarrassed as to render it manifest that he could have broken it sooner without hesitation if he had felt inclined to do so, he asked if Mr. Westlock had made his offer fully known to Mr. Pinch. John answered in the affirmative. "'And do you think it worth your while, sir, do you?' Mr. Phipps inquired of Tom. "'I think it a piece of great good fortune, sir,' said Tom. "'I am exceedingly obliged to you for the offer.' "'Not to me,' said Mr. Phipps. "'I act upon instructions.' "'To your friend, sir, then,' said Tom, "'to the gentleman with whom I am to engage, "'and whose confidence I shall endeavour to deserve. "'When he knows me better, sir, "'I hope he will not lose his good opinion of me. "'He will find me punctual and vigilant, "'and anxious to do what is right. "'That I think I can answer for, "'and so, looking towards him, can Mr. Westlock.' "'Most assuredly,' said John.' Mr. Phipps appeared to have some little difficulty in resuming the conversation. To relieve himself, he took up the wafer stamp and began stamping capital F's all over his legs. "'The fact is,' said Mr. Phipps, "'that my friend is not, at this present moment, in town.' Tom's countenance fell, for he thought this equivalent to telling him that his appearance did not answer, and that Phipps must look out for somebody else.' "'When do you think he will be in town, sir?' he asked. "'I can't say. It's impossible to tell. I really have no idea. "'But,' said Phipps, taking off a very deep impression of the wafer stamp upon the calf of his left leg, and looking steadily at Tom, "'I don't know that it's a matter of much consequence.' Poor Tom inclined his head deferentially, but appeared to doubt that. "'I say,' repeated Mr. Phipps, "'that I don't know it's a matter of much consequence.' The business lies entirely between yourself and me, Mr. Pinch. With reference to your duties, I can set you going, and with reference to your salary, I can pay it. Weekly, said Mr. Phipps, putting down the wafer stamp and looking at John Westlock and Tom Pinch by turns. Weekly in this office at any time between the hours of four and five o'clock in the afternoon. As Mr. Phipps said this, he made up his face as if he were going to whistle, but he didn't. "'You are very good,' said Tom, whose countenance was now suffused with pleasure, "'and nothing can be more satisfactory or straightforward. "'My attendance will be required from half-past nine to four o'clock or so, I should say,' "'interrupted Mr. Phipps, about that. "'I did not mean the hours of attendance,' retorted Tom, "'which are light and easy, I am sure, but the place. "'Oh, the place! The place is in the temple.' "'Tom was delighted.' "'Perhaps,' said Mr. Phipps, "'you would like to see the place.' "'Oh, dear!' cried Tom. "'I shall be only too glad to consider myself engaged, "'if you will allow me, "'without any further reference to the place.' "'You may consider yourself engaged, by all means,' said Mr. Phipps. "'You couldn't meet me at the Temple Gate in Fleet Street "'in an hour from this time, I suppose, could you?' "'Certainly Tom could.' "'Good,' said Mr. Phipps, rising. "'Then I will show you the place, "'and you can begin your attendance tomorrow morning.' "'In an hour, therefore, I shall see you. "'You too, Mr. Westlock? Very good. "'Take care how you go. It's rather dark.' "'With this remark, which seemed superfluous, "'he shut them out upon the staircase, "'and they groped their way into the street again. "'The interview had done so little to remove the mystery "'in which Tom's new engagement was involved, "'and had done so much to thicken it, "'that neither could help smiling at the puzzled looks of the other.' They agreed, however, that the introduction of Tom to his new office and office companions could hardly fail to throw a light upon the subject, and therefore postponed its further consideration until after the fulfillment of the appointment they had made with Mr. Phipps. After looking at John Westlock's chambers and devoting a few spare minutes to the boar's head, they issued forth again to the place of meeting. The time agreed upon had not quite come, but Mr. Phipps was already at the temple gate, and expressed his satisfaction at their punctuality. He led the way through sundry lanes and courts, into one more quiet and more gloomy than the rest, and, singling out a certain house, ascended a common staircase, taking from his pocket as he went a bunch of rusty keys. Stopping before a door upon an upper story, which had nothing but a yellow smear of paint, 
where custom would have placed the tenant's name, he began to beat the dust out of one of these keys very deliberately upon the great broad handrail of the balustrade. "'You had better have a little plug made,' he said, looking round at Tom, after blowing a shrill whistle into the barrel of the key. "'It's the only way of preventing them from getting stopped up. You'll find the lock go the better, too, I dare say, for a little oil.' Tom thanked him, but was too much occupied with his own speculations and John Westlock's looks to be very talkative. In the meantime, Mr. Phipps opened the door, which yielded to his hand very unwillingly and with a horribly discordant sound. He took the key out when he had done so and gave it to Tom. "'Aye, aye,' said Mr. Phipps, "'the dust lies rather thick here.' Truly it did. Mr. Phipps might have gone so far as to say very thick. It had accumulated everywhere, lay deep on everything, and in one part, where a ray of sun shone through a crevice in the shutter and struck upon the opposite wall, it went twirling round and round like a gigantic squirrel cage. Dust was the only thing in the place that had any motion about it. When their conductor admitted the light freely, and lifting up the heavy window sash let in the summer air, he showed the mouldering furniture, discoloured wainscoting and ceiling, rusty stove and ashy hearth, in all their inert neglect. Close to the door there stood a candlestick with an extinguisher upon it, as if the last man who had been there had paused, after securing a retreat, to take a parting look at the dreariness he left behind, and then had shut out light and life together, and closed the place up like a tomb. There were two rooms on that floor, and in the first or outer one a narrow staircase, leading to two more above. These last were fitted up as bedchambers. Neither in them nor in the rooms below was any scarcity of convenient furniture observable, although the fittings were of a bygone fashion, but solitude and want of use seemed to have rendered it unfit for any purposes of comfort, and to have given it a grisly haunted air. Movables of every kind lay strewn about, without the least attempt of order, and were intermixed with boxes, hampers, and all sorts of lumber. On all the floors were piles of books, to the amount, perhaps, of some thousands of volumes. These, still in bales, those wrapped in paper as they had been purchased, others scattered singly or in heaps, not one upon the shelves which lined the walls. To these Mr. Phipps called Tom's attention. Before anything else can be done, we must have them put in order, catalogued, and ranged upon the bookshelves, Mr. Pinch. That will do to begin with, I think, sir. Tom rubbed his hands in the pleasant anticipation of a task so congenial to his taste, and said, An occupation full of interest for me, I assure you. It will occupy me, perhaps, until Mr. Until Mr. repeated Phipps, as much as to ask Tom what he was stopping for. "'I forgot that you had not mentioned the gentleman's name,' said Tom. "'Oh,' cried Mr. Phipps, pulling on his glove, "'didn't I? "'No, by the by, I don't think I did. "'Ah, I dare say he'll be here soon. "'You will get on very well together, I have no doubt. "'I wish you success, I am sure. "'You won't forget to shut the door. "'It'll lock of itself if you slam it. "'Half-past nine, you know, let us say from half-past nine to four, or half-past four, or thereabouts, one day perhaps a little earlier, another day perhaps a little later, according as you feel disposed, and as you arrange your work. Mr. Phipps, Austin Friars, of course, you'll remember, and you won't forget to slam the door, if you please. He said all this in such a comfortable, easy manner that Tom could only rub his hands and nod his head, and smile in acquiescence, which he was still doing when Mr. Phipps walked coolly out. "'Why, he's gone!' cried Tom. "'And what's more, Tom,' said John Westlock, seating himself upon a pile of books, and looking up at his astonished friend, "'he is evidently not coming back again, so here you are, installed, under rather singular circumstances, Tom.' It was such an odd affair throughout, and Tom, standing there among the books, with his hat in one hand and the key in the other, looked so prodigiously confounded that his friend could not help laughing heartily. Tom himself was tickled, no less by the hilarity of his friend than by the recollection of the sudden manner in which he had been brought to a stop, in the very height of his urbane conference with Mr. Phipps. 
So, by degrees, Tom burst out laughing, too, and each making the other laugh more, they fairly roared. When they had had their laugh out, which did not happen very soon, forgive John an inch that way, and he was sure to take several L's, being a jovial, good-tempered fellow, they looked about them more closely, groping among the lumber for any stray means of enlightenment that might turn up. But no scrap or shred of information could they find. The books were marked with a variety of owners' names, having, no doubt, been bought at sales and collected here and there at different times. But whether any one of these names belonged to Tom's employer, and if so, which of them, they had no means whatever of determining. It occurred to John, as a very bright thought, to make inquiry at the steward's office to whom the chambers belonged, or by whom they were held. But he came back no wiser than he went, the answer being Mr. Phipps of Austin Friars. "'After all, Tom, I begin to think it lies no deeper than this. Phipps is an eccentric man, has some knowledge of Pecksniff, despises him, of course, has heard or seen enough of you to know that you are the man he wants, and engages you in his own whimsical manner.' "'But why in his own whimsical manner?' asked Tom. "'Oh, why does any man entertain his own whimsical taste?' Why does Mr. Phipps wear shorts and powder, and Mr. Phipps's next-door neighbor boots and a wig? Tom, being in that state of mind in which any explanation is a great relief, adopted this last one, which indeed was quite as feasible as any other, readily, and said he had no doubt of it. Nor was his faith at all shaken by his having said exactly the same thing to each suggestion of his friends in turn, and being perfectly ready to say it again if he had any new solution to propose. As he had not, Tom drew down the window-sash and folded the shutter, and they left the rooms. He closed the door heavily, as Mr. Phipps had desired him, tried it, found it all safe, and put the key in his pocket. They made a pretty wide circuit in going back to Islington, as they had time to spare, and Tom was never tired of looking about him. It was well he had John Westlock for his companion— for most people would have been weary of his perpetual stoppages at shop windows and his frequent dashes into the crowded carriageway at the peril of his life to get the better view of church steeples and other public buildings. But John was charmed to see him so much interested, and every time Tom came back with a beaming face from among the wheels of carts and hackney coaches, wholly unconscious of the personal congratulations addressed to him by the drivers, John seemed to like him better than before. There was no flower on Ruth's hands when she received them in the triangular parlour, but there were pleasant smiles upon her face, and a crowd of welcomes shining out of every smile, and gleaming in her bright eyes. By the by, how bright they were! Looking into them for but a moment, when you took her hand, you saw, in each, such a capital miniature of yourself, representing you as such a restless, flashing, eager, brilliant little fellow. Ah! if you could only have kept them for your own miniature. But wicked, roving, restless, too impartial eyes, it was enough for any one to stand before them, and straightway there he danced and sparkled quite as merrily as you. The table was already spread for dinner, and though it was spread with nothing very choice in the way of glass or linen, and with green-handled knives and very mountebanks of two-pronged forks, which seemed to be trying how far asunder they could possibly stretch their legs, without converting themselves into double the number of iron toothpicks, it wanted neither damask, silver, gold, nor china, no, nor any other garniture at all. There it was, and being there, nothing else would have done as well. The success of that initiative dish, that first experiment of hers in cookery, was so entire, so unalloyed and perfect, that John Westlock and Tom agreed she must have been studying the art in secret for a long time past and urged her to make a full confession of the fact. They were exceedingly merry over this jest, and many smart things were said concerning it. But John was not as fair in his behavior as might have been expected, for after luring Tom Pinch on for a long time, he suddenly went over to the enemy and swore to everything his sister said. However, as Tom observed the same night before going to bed, it was only in joke, and John had always been famous for being polite to ladies, even when he was quite a boy. Ruth said, "'Oh, indeed!' She didn't say anything else. It is astonishing how much three people may find to talk about. They scarcely left off talking once, 
and it was not all lively chat which occupied them, for when Tom related how he had seen Mr. Pecksniff's daughters, and what a change had fallen on the younger, they were very serious. John Westlock became quite absorbed in her fortunes, asking many questions of Tom Pinch about her marriage, inquiring whether her husband was the gentleman whom Tom had brought to dine with him at Salisbury, in what degree of relationship they stood towards each other, being different persons, and taking, in short, the greatest interest in the subject. Tom then went into it at full length. He told how Martin had gone abroad, and had not been heard of for a long time. How Dragon Mark had borne him company, how Mr. Pecksniff had got the poor old doting grandfather into his power, and how he basely sought the hand of Mary Graham. But not a word, said Tom, of what lay hidden in his heart. His heart, so deep and true and full of honour, and yet with so much room for every gentle and unselfish thought, not a word. Tom, Tom, the man in all this world most confident in his sagacity and shrewdness, the man in all this world most proud of his distrust of other men, and having most to show in gold and silver as the gains belonging to his creed, the meekest favourer of that wise doctrine, every man for himself and God for us all, there being high wisdom in the thought that the eternal majesty of heaven ever was, or can be, on the side of selfish lust and love, shall never find, oh, never find, be sure of that, the time come home to him when all his wisdom is an idiot's folly, weighed against a simple heart." Well, well, Tom, it was simple, too, though simple in a different way, to be so eager touching that same theatre, of which John said, when tea was done, he had the absolute command, so far as taking parties in without the payment of a sixpence was concerned, and simpler yet, perhaps, never to suspect that when he went in first, alone, he paid the money. Simple in thee, dear Tom, to laugh and cry so heartily at such a sorry show, so poorly shown, Simple to be so happy and loquacious, trudging home with Ruth. Simple to be so surprised to find that merry present of a cookery book awaiting her in the parlour next morning, with the beefsteak pudding leaf turned down and blotted out. There, let the record stand. Thy quality of soul was simple, simple, quite contemptible, Tom Pinch. End of chapter 39《Chapter Forty of Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit by Charles Dickens》Chapter Forty The Pinches Make a New Acquaintance and Have Fresh Occasion for Surprise and Wonder. There was a ghostly air about these uninhabited chambers in the temple, and attending every circumstance of Tom's employment there, which had a strange charm in it. Every morning, when he shut his door at Islington, he turned his face towards an atmosphere of unaccountable fascination, as surely as he turned it to the London smoke, and from that moment it thickened round and round him all day long, until the time arrived for going home again, and leaving it like a motionless cloud behind. It seemed to Tom every morning that he approached this ghostly mist and became enveloped in it by the easiest succession of degrees imaginable. Passing from the roar and rattle of the streets into the quiet courtyards of the temple was the first preparation. Every echo of his footsteps sounded to him like a sound from the old walls and pavements, wanting language to relate the histories of the dim, dismal rooms— to tell him what lost documents were decaying in forgotten corners of the shut-up cellars, from whose lattices such mouldy sighs came breathing forth as he went past, to whisper of dark bins of rare old wine bricked up in vaults among the old foundations of the halls, or mutter in a lower tone yet darker legends of the cross-legged knights whose marble effigies were in the church. With the first planting of his foot upon the staircase of his dusty office, all these mysteries increased, until, ascending step by step, as Tom ascended, they attained their full growth in the solitary labours of the day. Every day brought one recurring, never-failing source of speculation. 
this employer, would he come to-day, and what would he be like? For Tom could not stop short at Mr. Phipps. He quite believed that Mr. Phipps had spoken truly when he said he acted for another. And what manner of man that other was became a full-blown flower of wonder in the garden of Tom's fancy, which never faded or got trodden down. At one time he conceived that Mr. Pecksniff, repenting of his falsehood, might, by exertion of his influence with some third person, have devised these means of giving him employment. He found this idea so insupportable, after what had taken place between that good man and himself, that he confided it to John Westlock on the very same day, informing John that he would rather ply for hire as a porter than fall so low in his own esteem as to accept the smallest obligation from the hands of Mr. Pecksniff. But John assured him that he, Tom Pinch, was far from doing justice to the character of Mr. Pecksniff yet, if he supposed that gentleman capable of performing a generous action and that he might make his mind quite easy on that head until he saw the sun turn green and the moon black, and at the same time distinctly perceived with the naked eye twelve first-rate comets careering round those planets. In which unusual state of things, he said, and not before, it might become not absolutely lunatic to suspect Mr. Pecksniff of anything so monstrous. In short, he laughed the idea down completely— and Tom, abandoning it, was thrown upon his beam-ends again for some other solution. In the meantime, Tom attended to his duties daily, and made considerable progress with the books, which were already reduced to some sort of order, and made a great appearance in his fairly written catalogue. During his business hours he indulged himself occasionally with snatches of reading, which were often, indeed, a necessary part of his pursuit, and as he usually made bold to carry one of these goblin volumes home at night, always bringing it back again next morning in case his strange employer should appear and ask what had become of it, he led a happy, quiet, studious kind of life after his own heart. But though the books were never so interesting and never so full of novelty to Tom, they could not so enchain him in those mysterious chambers as to render him unconscious for a moment of the lightest sound. Any footstep on the flags without set him listening attentively, and when it turned into that house and came up, up, up the stairs, he always thought with a beating heart, Now I am coming face to face with him at last. But no footstep ever passed the floor immediately below, except his own. This mystery and loneliness engendered fancies in Tom's mind, the folly of which his common sense could readily discover, but which his common sense was quite unable to keep away, notwithstanding. That quality being with most of us in such a case, like the old French police, quick at detection, but very weak as a preventive power. Misgivings, undefined, absurd, inexplicable, that there was some one hiding in the inner room, walking softly overhead, peeping in through the door-chink, doing something stealthy, anywhere where he was not, came over him a hundred times a day, making it pleasant to throw up the sash, and hold communication even with the sparrows who had built in the roof and water-spout, and were twittering about the windows all day long. He sat with the outer door wide open at all times, that he might hear the footsteps as they entered, and turned off into the chambers on the lower floor. He formed odd prepossessions, too, regarding strangers in the streets, and would say within himself of such or such a man who struck him as having anything uncommon in his dress or aspect, I shouldn't wonder now if that were he. But it never was, and though he actually turned back and followed more than one of these suspected individuals, in a singular belief that they were going to the place he was then upon his way from, he never got any other satisfaction by it than the satisfaction of knowing it was not the case. Mr. Phipps, of Austin Friars, rather deepened than illumined the obscurity of his position, for on the first occasion of Tom's waiting on him to receive his weekly pay, he said, "'Oh, by the by, Mr. Pinch, you needn't mention it, if you please.' Tom thought he was going to tell him a secret, so he said that he wouldn't on any account, and that Mr. Phipps might entirely depend upon him. But as Mr. Phipps said, "'Very good,' in reply, and nothing more, Tom prompted him. "'Not on any account,' repeated Tom. Mr. Phipps repeated, "'Very good.' "'You were going to say?' Tom hinted. "'Oh, dear, no,' cried Phipps. "'Not at all.' However, seeing Tom confused, he added, 
I mean that you needn't mention any particulars about your place of employment to people generally. You'll find it better not. I have not had the pleasure of seeing my employer yet, sir, observed Tom, putting his week's salary in his pocket. Haven't you? said Phipps. No, I don't suppose you have, though. I should like to thank him, and to know that what I have done so far is done to his satisfaction, faltered Tom. Quite right, said Mr. Phipps, with a yawn. Highly creditable, very proper. Tom hastily resolved to try him on another tack. I shall soon have finished with the books, he said. I hope that will not terminate my engagement, sir, or render me useless. Oh, dear, no, retorted Phipps. Plenty to do, plenty to do. Be careful how you go. It's rather dark. This was the very utmost extent of information Tom could ever get out of him, so it was dark enough in all conscience, and if Mr. Phipps expressed himself with a double meaning, he had good reason for doing so. But now a circumstance occurred which helped to divert Tom's thoughts from even this mystery, and to divide them between it and a new channel which was a very Nile in itself. The way it came about was this. Having always been an early riser, and having now no organ to engage him in sweet converse every morning, it was his habit to take a long walk before going to the temple, and naturally inclining, as a stranger, towards those parts of the town which were conspicuous for the life and animation pervading them, he became a great frequenter of the market-places, bridges, quays, and especially the steamboat wharves, for it was very lively and fresh to see the people hurrying away upon their many schemes of business or pleasure, and it made Tom glad to think that there was that much change and freedom in the monotonous routine of city lives. In most of these morning excursions Ruth accompanied him. As their landlord was always up and away at his business, whatever that might be, no one seemed to know, at a very early hour, the habits of the people of the house in which they lodged corresponded with their own. Thus they had often finished their breakfast, and were out in the summer air by seven o'clock. After a two hours' stroll they parted at some convenient point, Tom going to the temple, and his sister returning home as methodically as you please. Many and many a pleasant stroll they had in Covent Garden Market, snuffing up the perfume of the fruits and flowers, wondering at the magnificence of the pineapples and melons, "'catching glimpses down side avenues of rows and rows of old women "'seated on inverted baskets, shelling peas, "'looking unutterable things at the fat bundles of asparagus "'with which the dainty shops were fortified as with a breastwork, "'and at the herbalist doors, gratefully inhaling scents "'as of veal stuffing yet uncooked, "'dreamily mixed up with capsicums, brown paper, seeds, "'even with hints of lusty snails and fine young curly leeches.' Many and many a pleasant stroll they had among the poultry markets, where ducks and fowls, with necks unnaturally long, lay stretched out in pairs, ready for cooking, where there were speckled eggs in mossy baskets, white country sausages beyond impeachment by surviving cat or dog or horse or donkey, new cheeses to any wild extent, live birds in coops and cages, looking much too big to be natural, in consequence of those receptacles being much too little, rabbits, alive and dead, innumerable, many a pleasant stroll they had among the cool, refreshing, silvery fish-stalls, with a kind of moonlight effect about their stock in trade, excepting always for the ruddy lobsters, many a pleasant stroll among the wagon-loads of fragrant hay, beneath which dogs and tired wagoners lay fast asleep, oblivious of the pie-men and the public-house, but never half so good a stroll as down among the steamboats on a bright morning. There they lay, alongside of each other, hard and fast for ever, to all appearance, but designing to get out somehow, and quite confident of doing it. And in that faith shoals of passengers and heaps of luggage were proceeding hurriedly on board. Little steamboats dashed up and down the stream incessantly, tiers upon tiers of vessels, scores of masts, labyrinths of tackle, idle sails, splashing oars, gliding rowboats, lumbering barges, sunken piles with ugly lodgings for the water-rat within their mud-discoloured nooks, church steeples, warehouses, house-roofs, arches, bridges, men and women, children, casks, cranes, boxes, horses, coaches, idlers, and hard labourers. There they were, all jumbled up together any summer morning, 
far beyond Tom's power of separation. In the midst of all this turmoil there was an incessant roar from every packet's funnel, which quite expressed and carried out the uppermost emotion of the scene. They all appeared to be perspiring and bothering themselves, exactly as their passengers did. They never left off fretting and chafing, in their own hoarse manner, once, but were always panting out without any stops. "'Come along! Do make haste! I'm very nervous! Come along! Oh, good gracious! We shall never get there! How late you are! Do make haste! I'm off directly! Come along!' Even when they had left off, and had got safely out into the current, on the smallest provocation they began again, for the bravest packet of them all, being stopped by some entanglement in the river, would immediately begin to fume and pant afresh. "'Oh, here's a stoppage. What's the matter? Do go on there. I'm in a hurry. It's done on purpose. Did you ever? Oh, my goodness! Do go on here!' And so, in a state of mind bordering on distraction, would be last seen drifting slowly through the mist, into the summer light beyond that made it red. Tom's ship, however, or at least the packet-boat in which Tom and his sister took the greatest interest on one particular occasion, was not off yet by any means, but was at the height of its disorder. The press of passengers was very great. Another steamboat lay on each side of her. The gangways were choked up, distracted women obviously bound for Gravesend, but turning a deaf ear to all representations that this particular vessel was about to sail for Antwerp, persisted in secreting baskets of refreshments behind bulkheads and water-casts and under seats, and very great confusion prevailed. It was so amusing that Tom, with Ruth upon his arm, stood looking down from the wharf, as nearly regardless as it was in the nature of flesh and blood to be, of an elderly lady behind him, who had brought a large umbrella with her, and didn't know what to do with it. This tremendous instrument had a hooked handle, and its vicinity was first made known to him by a painful pressure on the windpipe, consequent upon its having caught him round the throat. Soon after disengaging himself with perfect good humour, he had a sensation of the ferrule in his back, immediately afterwards of the hook entangling his ankles then of the umbrella generally wandering about his hat and flapping at it like a great bird, and lastly of a poke or thrust below the ribs, which gave him such exceeding anguish that he could not refrain from turning round to offer a mild remonstrance. Upon his turning round he found the owner of the umbrella struggling on tiptoe, with a countenance expressive of violent animosity, to look down upon the steamboats from which he inferred that she had attacked him, standing in the front row, by design and as her natural enemy. "'What a very ill-natured person you must be,' said Tom. The lady cried out fiercely, "'Where's the police?' meaning the constabulary, and went on to say, shaking the handle of the umbrella at Tom, that but for them fellers never being in the way when they was wanted, she'd have given him in charge, she would." "'If they greased their whiskers less and minded the duties which they're paid so heavy for a little more,' she observed, "'no one needn't be drove mad by scrouting so.' She had been grievously knocked about, no doubt, for her bonnet was bent into the shape of a cocked hat. Being a fat little woman, too, she was in a state of great exhaustion and intense heat. Instead of pursuing the altercation, therefore, Tom civilly inquired what boat she wanted to go on board of. "'I suppose,' returned the lady, "'as nobody but yourself can want to look at a steam package "'without wanting to go aboarding of it, can they, booby?' "'Which one do you want to look at, then?' said Tom. "'We'll make room for you, if we can. Don't be so ill-tempered.' "'No blessed creature as ever I was with in trying times,' returned the lady, somewhat softened. "'And there are many in their numbers, ever brought it as a charge again myself "'that I was anything but mild and equal in my spirits.' "'Never mind a contradicting of me, if you seem to feel it does you good, ma'am. "'I often says, for well you know that Sarry may be trusted not to give it back again. "'But I will not deny that I am worted and wexed this day, and with good region, Lord forbid.' "'By this time Mrs. Gamp, for it was no other than that experienced practitioner, "'had, with Tom's assistance, squeezed and worked herself into a small corner between Ruth and the rail.' where, after breathing very hard for some little time, and performing a short series of dangerous evolutions with her umbrella, she managed to establish herself pretty comfortably. 
"'And which of all them smoking monsters is the Antwerp's boat, I wonder? "'Goodness me!' cried Mrs. Gamp. "'What boat did you want?' asked Ruth. "'The Antwerp's package,' Mrs. Gamp replied. "'I will not deceive you, my sweet. Why should I?' "'That is the Antwerp package in the middle,' said Ruth. "'And I wish it was in Jonage's belly, I do,' cried Mrs. Gamp, "'appearing to confound the prophet with the whale in this miraculous aspiration.' Ruth said nothing in reply, but, as Mrs. Gamp, laying her chin against the cool iron of the rail, continued to look intently at the Antwerp boat, and every now and then to give a little groan, she inquired whether any child of hers was going aboard that morning, or perhaps her husband, she said kindly. "'Which shows,' said Mrs. Gamp, casting up her eyes, "'what a little way you've travelled into this whale of life, my dear young creeter. As a good friend of mine has frequent made remark to me, which her name, my love, is Harris, Mrs. Harris through the square and up the steps, a turnin' round by the tobacco shop. Oh, Sary, Sary, little do we know what lies afore us. Mrs. Harris, ma'am, I says, not much, it's true, but more than you suppose. Our calculations, ma'am, I says, respectin' what the number of a family will be, comes most times within one, and oftener than you would suppose exact. Sary says Mrs. Harris, in an awful way, tell me, what is my individual number? No, Mrs. Harris, I says to her, excuse me if you please. My own, I says, has fallen out of three pair backs, and had damp doorsteps settled on their lungs, and one was turned up smiling in a bedstead unbeknown. Therefore, ma'am, I says, seek not to participate, but take them as they come and as they go. Mine, says Mrs. Gamp, mine is all gone, my dear young chick. "'and as to husbands, there's a wooden leg gone likewise home to its account, "'which in its constancy of walking into wine vaults "'and never coming out again till fetched by force, "'was quite as weak as flesh, if not weaker. "'When she had delivered this oration, "'Mrs. Gamp leaned her chin upon the cool iron again, "'and looking intently at the Antwerp packet, "'shook her head and groaned. "'I wouldn't,' said Mrs. Gamp, "'I wouldn't be a man and have such a think upon my mind.' "'but nobody has owned the name of man could do it.' "'Tom and his sister glanced at each other, "'and Ruth, after a moment's hesitation, "'asked Mrs. Gamp what troubled her so much. "'My dear,' returned that lady, dropping her voice, "'you are single, ain't you?' "'Ruth laughed, blushed, and said yes. "'Worse luck,' proceeded Mrs. Gamp, for all parties. "'But others is married, and in the marriage state.' "'and there is a dear young creetur coming down this morning to that very package "'which is no more fit to trust herself to see than nothing is.' "'She paused here to look over the deck of the packet in question, "'and on the steps leading down to it and on the gangways, "'seeming to have thus assured herself that the object of her commiseration had not yet arrived. "'She raised her eyes gradually up to the top of the escape pipe "'and indignantly apostrophized the vessel.' "'Oh, drat you!' said Mrs. Gamp, shaking her umbrella at it. "'You're a nice, spluttering, nisey monster for a delicate young creetur to go and be a passenger by, ain't you? "'You never do no harm in that way, do you? "'With your hammering and roaring and hissing and lamp-iling, you brute! "'Them confusion steamers,' said Mrs. Gamp, shaking her umbrella again, "'has done more to throw us out of our regular work and bring a wentz on at times when nobody counted on em especially them screeching railroad ones, than all the other frights that ever was took. I have heard of one young man, a guard upon a railway, only three years opened, well does Mrs. Harris know him, which indeed he is her own relation by her sister's marriage with the Master Sawyer, as his godfather at this present time to six and twenty blessed little strangers, equally unexpected, and all in them named after the Injuns as was the cause. "'Ugh!' said Mrs. Gamp, resuming her apostrophe. "'One might easy know you was a man's invention "'from your disregardlessness of the weakness of our natures. "'So one might, you brute.' "'It would not have been unnatural to suppose "'from the first part of Mrs. Gamp's lamentations "'that she was connected with the stage-coaching "'or post-horsing trade. "'She had no means of judging of the effect "'of her concluding remarks upon her young companion, "'for she interrupted herself at this point and exclaimed, "'There she identically goes!' "'Poor, sweet young creetur, there she goes, like a lamb to the sacrifice. "'If there's any illness when that wessel gets to sea,' said Mrs. Gamp prophetically, "'it's murder, and I'm the witness for the persecution.' "'She was so very earnest on the subject that Tom's sister, "'being as kind as Tom himself, could not help saying something to her in reply. 
"'Pray, which is the lady?' she inquired, "'in whom you are so much interested?' "'There,' groaned Mrs. Gamp, "'there she goes, across on the little wooden bridge at this minute. "'She's a-slippin' on a bit of orange peel,' tightly clutching her umbrella. "'What a turn it gave me!' "'Do you mean the lady who is with that man, "'wrapped up from head to foot in a large cloak, "'so that his face is almost hidden?' "'Well, he may hide it,' Mrs. Gamp replied. "'He's good call to be ashamed of himself. "'Did you see him a-jerking of her wrist, then?' "'He seems to be hasty with her, indeed. "'Now he's a-taking of her down into the close cabin,' "'said Mrs. Gamp impatiently. "'What's the man about? "'The deuce is in him, I think. "'Why can't he leave her in the open air?' He did not, whatever his reason was, but led her quickly down and disappeared himself, without loosening his cloak or pausing on the crowded deck one moment longer than was necessary to clear their way to that part of the vessel. Tom had not heard this little dialogue, for his attention had been engaged in an unexpected manner. A hand upon his sleeve had caused him to look round, just when Mrs. Gamp concluded her apostrophe to the steam-engine, and on his right arm, Ruth being on his left, he found their landlord, to his great surprise. He was not so much surprised at the man's being there, as at his having got close to him so quietly and swiftly, for another person had been at his elbow one instant before, and he had not, in the meantime, been conscious of any change or pressure in the knot of people among whom he stood. He and Ruth had frequently remarked how noiselessly this landlord of theirs came into and went out of his own house, but Tom was not the less amazed to see him at his elbow now. "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Pinch,' he said in his ear. "'I am rather infirm and out of breath, and my eyes are not very good. I am not as young as I was, sir. You don't see a gentleman in a large cloak down yonder, with a lady on his arm, a lady in a veil and a black shawl, do you?' If he did not, it was curious that in speaking he should have singled out from all the crowd the very people whom he described, and should have glanced hastily from them to Tom, as if he were burning to direct his wandering eyes. "'A gentleman in a large cloak?' said Tom. "'And a lady in a black shawl? Let me see.' "'Yes, yes,' replied the other, with keen impatience. "'A gentleman muffled up from head to foot, strangely muffled up for such a morning as this.' "'like an invalid, with his hand to his face at this minute, perhaps. "'No, no, no, not there,' he added, following Tom's gaze. "'The other way, in that direction, down yonder.' "'Again he indicated, but this time, in his hurry, with his outstretched finger, "'the very spot on which the progress of these persons was checked at that moment. "'There are so many people, and so much motion, and so many objects,' said Tom, "'that I find it difficult to—' "'No, I really don't see a gentleman in a large cloak and a lady in a black shawl. "'There's a lady in a red shawl over there.' "'No, no, no!' cried his landlord, pointing eagerly again. "'Not there! The other way! The other way! Look at the cabin steps! To the left! "'They must be near the cabin steps. Do you see the cabin steps? "'There's the bell ringing already. Do you see the steps?' "'Stay,' said Tom. "'You're right. Look. There they go now. Is that the gentleman you mean?' "'descending at this minute with the folds of a great cloak trailing down after him?' "'The very man,' returned the other, not looking at what Tom pointed out, however, but at Tom's own face. "'Will you do me a kindness, sir, a great kindness? Will you put that letter in his hand? Only give him that. He expects it. I am charged to do it by my employers, but I am late in finding him, and not being as young as I have been, should never be able to make my way on board and off the deck again in time.' "'Will you pardon my boldness, and do me that great kindness?' His hands shook, and his face bespoke the utmost interest and agitation, as he pressed the letter upon Tom, and pointed to its destination like the tempter in some grim old carving. To hesitate in the performance of a good-natured or compassionate office was not in Tom's way. He took the letter, whispered Ruth to wait till he returned, which would be immediately, and ran down the steps with all the expedition he could make. There were so many people going down, so many others coming up, such heavy goods in course of transit to and fro, such a ringing of bell, blowing off of steam, and shouting of men's voices, that he had much ado to force his way, or keep in mind to which boat he was going. But he reached the right one with good speed, and going down the cabin stairs immediately, described the object of his search standing at the upper end of the saloon with his back towards him reading some notice which was hung against the wall 
As Tom advanced to give him the letter, he started, hearing footsteps, and turned round. What was Tom's astonishment to find in him the man with whom he had had the conflict in the field, poor Mercy's husband, Jonas? Tom understood him to say, what the devil did he want, but it was not easy to make out what he said. He spoke so indistinctly. "'I want nothing with you for myself,' said Tom. "'I was asked a moment since to give you this letter. You were pointed out to me.' "'but I didn't know you in your strange dress. Take it.' "'He did so, opened it, and read the writing on the inside. "'The contents were evidently very brief, not more, perhaps, than one line, "'but they struck upon him like a stone from a sling. "'He reeled back as he read. "'His emotion was so different from any Tom had ever seen before "'that he stopped involuntarily. "'Momentary as his state of indecision was, the bell ceased while he stood there, and a hoarse voice calling down the steps inquired if there was any to go ashore. Yes, cried Jonas. I, I am coming. Give me time. Where is that woman? Come back. Come back here. He threw open another door as he spoke, and dragged rather than led her forth. She was pale and frightened, and amazed to see her old acquaintance, but had no time to speak, for they were making a great stir above, and Jonas drew her rapidly towards the deck. Where are we going? What is the matter? "'We are going back,' said Jonas. "'I have changed my mind. I can't go. "'Don't question me, or I shall be the death of you, or someone else. "'Stop there. Stop. We're for the shore. Do you hear? We're for the shore.' "'He turned, even in the madness of his hurry, "'and scowling darkly back at Tom, shook his clenched hand at him. "'There are not many human faces capable of the expression "'with which he accompanied that gesture. "'He dragged her up, and Tom followed them, Across the deck, over the side, along the crazy plank, and up the steps, he dragged her fiercely, not bestowing any look on her, but gazing upwards all the while among the faces on the wharf. Suddenly he turned again and said to Tom, with a tremendous oath, "'Where is he?' Before Tom, in his indignation and amazement, could return an answer to a question he so little understood, a gentleman approached Tom behind and saluted Jonas Chuzzlewit by name. He was a gentleman of foreign appearance, with a black moustache and whiskers, and addressed him with a polite composure, strangely different from his own distracted and desperate manner. "'Chuzzlewit, my good fellow,' said the gentleman, raising his hat in compliment to Mrs. Chuzzlewit. "'I ask your pardon twenty thousand times. I am most unwilling to interfere between you and a domestic trip of this nature, always so very charming and refreshing, I know, "'although I have not the happiness to be a domestic man myself, "'which is the great infelicity of my existence. "'But the beehive, my dear friend, the beehive, will you introduce me?' "'This is Mr. Montague,' said Jonas, whom the words appeared to choke. "'The most unhappy and most penitent of men, Mrs. Chuzzlewit, "'pursued that gentleman, for having been the means of spoiling this excursion. "'But as I tell my friend, the beehive, the beehive, "'You projected a short little continental trip, my dear friend, of course?' "'Jonas maintained a dogged silence. "'May I die,' cried Montague, "'but I am shocked. "'Upon my soul I am shocked. "'But that confounded beehive of ours in the city "'must be paramount to every other consideration "'when there is honey to be made, "'and that is my best excuse. "'Here is a very singular old female "'dropping curtsies on my right,' said Montague, "'breaking off in his discourse and looking at Mrs. Gamp. "'who is not a friend of mine. Does anybody know her?' "'Ah, well, they knows me, bless their precious hearts,' said Mrs. Gamp. "'Not forgetting your own merry one, sir, and long may it be so. "'Wishing as every one,' she delivered this in the form of a toast or sentiment, "'was as merry and as handsome-looking as a little bird has whispered me a certain gent is, "'which I will not name, for fear I give offence where none is due. "'My precious lady,' Here she stopped short in her merriment, for she had, until now, affected to be vastly entertained. "'You're too pale by half.' "'You are here, too, are you?' muttered Jonas. "'Ecod, there are enough of you.' "'I hope, sir,' returned Mrs. Gamp, dropping an indignant curtsy, "'as no bones is broke by me and Mrs. Harris a-walking down upon a public wharf, "'which was the very words she says to me, although there was the last I ever had to speak, was these.' "'Sary, she says, is it a public wharf? "'Mrs. Harris, I makes answer, can you doubt it? "'You have knowed me now, ma'am, eight and thirty year, "'and did you ever know me go or wish to go "'where I was not made welcome? "'Say the words.' 
"'No, Sarry, Mrs. Harris says, contrary quite. "'And well she knows it, too. "'I am but a poor woman, but I've been sought after, sir, "'though you may not think it. "'I've been knocked up at all hours of the night, "'and warned out by a many landlords, "'in consequence of being mistook for fire. "'I goes out working for my bread, tis true, "'but I maintains my independency, with your kind leave, "'and which I will till death. "'I has my feelings as a woman, sir, "'and I have been a mother likewise.' "'but touch a pipkin as belongs to me, "'or make the least remarks on what I eats or drinks, "'and though you was the favouritest young forehead hussy "'of a servant gal as ever come into a house, "'either you leaves the place or me. "'My earnings is not great, sir, "'but I will not be imposed upon. "'Bless the babe and save the mother is my mortar, sir, "'but I make so free as add to that. "'Don't try no imposition with the nuss, "'for she will not abear it.' "'Mrs. Gamp concluded by drawing her shawl "'tightly over herself with both hands,' and, as usual, referring to Mrs. Harris for full corroboration of these particulars. She had that peculiar trembling of the head, which, in ladies of her excitable nature, may be taken as a sure indication of their breaking out again very shortly, when Jonas made a timely interposition. "'As you are here,' he said, "'you had better see to her and take her home. I am otherwise engaged.' He said nothing more, but looked at Montague as if to give him notice that he was ready to attend him. "'I am sorry to take you away,' said Montague. Jonas gave him a sinister look which long lived in Tom's memory, and which he often recalled afterwards. "'I am, upon my life,' said Montague. "'Why did you make it necessary?' With the same dark glance as before, Jonas replied, after a moment's silence, "'The necessity is none of my making. You have brought it about yourself.' He said nothing more. He said even this as if he were bound and in the other's power, but had a sullen and suppressed devil within him which he could not quite resist. His very gait, as they walked away together, was like that of a fettered man, but striving to work out at his clenched hands, knitted brows, and fast-set lips was the same imprisoned devil still. They got into a handsome cabriolet which was waiting for them and drove away. The whole of this extraordinary scene had passed so rapidly and the tumult which prevailed around as so unconscious of any impression from it, that although Tom had been one of the chief actors, it was like a dream. No one had noticed him after they had left the packet. He had stood behind Jonas, and so near him, that he could not help hearing all that passed. He had stood there with his sister on his arm, expecting and hoping to have an opportunity of explaining his strange share in this yet stranger business. But Jonas had not raised his eyes from the ground— no one else had even looked towards him, and before he could resolve on any course of action, they were all gone. He gazed round for his landlord, but he had done that more than once already, and no such man was to be seen. He was still pursuing this search with his eyes, when he saw a hand beckoning to him from a hackney coach, and hurrying towards it found it was Mary's. She addressed him hurriedly, but bent out of the window that she might not be overheard by her companion, Mrs. Gamp. "'What is it?' she said. "'Good heaven, what is it? "'Why did he tell me last night to prepare for a long journey? "'And why have you brought us back like criminals, dear Mr. Pinch?' "'She clasped her hands distractedly. "'Be merciful to us. "'Whatever this dreadful secret is, be merciful, and God will bless you.' "'If any power of mercy lay with me,' cried Tom, "'trust me, you shouldn't ask in vain. "'But I am far more ignorant and weak than you.' She withdrew into the coach again, and he saw the hand waving towards him for a moment. But whether in reproachfulness, or incredulity, or misery, or grief, or sad ado, or what else, he could not, being so hurried, understand. She was gone now, and Ruth and he were left to walk away in wonder. Had Mr. Nadgett appointed the man who never came to meet him upon London Bridge that morning? He was certainly looking over the parapet, and down upon the steamboat wharf at that moment. It could not have been for pleasure. He never took pleasure. No, he must have had some business there. End of chapter 40